Part 2, Chapter 6 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 6 Phantasmion joins Irene on the lake. Phantasmion continued to gaze on Irene, unperceived by her father, whose face was turned in an opposite direction, till he heard a key turn in the lock and the voice of Mondra speaking to Albinet. Then he quitted the tower as he had entered it, and roamed about the island, pondering how he might obtain another interview with the princess. That day he poured out wine for a noble company, but Glendreth was absent, and Mondra's glances fell upon his empty chair, while Irene seemed afraid to raise her downcast eyes, lest they should meet those of a present lover. The banquet being ended, Phantasmion repaired to the lakeside, and, looking out for Glandreth or Caradan, beheld only the light skiffs of the castle guests lying at anchor in the bay, their gay streamers rustling in a gentle breeze. Albinet sate and looked at them with tearful eyes. It seemed as if he loved to hear the varied intonations of his childish grief. So long drawn out was his sobbing and sighing. I wish that breeze would rise to a tempest ere tomorrow's dawn, he murmured. My sister is to be upon the lake when the sun rises, and woe is me, I am not to be with her. Phantasmion's heart beat high with the thought of a scheme which these words suggested. He dreamed of it, sleeping and waking through the night, and by daybreak the next morning he was hovering over the lake. There all was solitary and silent. Irene was not come. He flew back again to listen at her chamber window, and at last was so far carried away that he softly entered and hung over her like a guardian spirit while she yet slept. Then he tasked himself to examine the separate charms which made up that sum of beauty, the graceful flowing line in which the whole was contained, the full eye gently slanting at the outer side like a dove's, the soft gradation of color from locks of golden brown to the dark thread-like eyebrow and still blacker lashes which parting from fair white lids appeared like foliage of a yew branch laden with a pile of snow it seemed as if the hand that streaks the tulip and the iris and traces the jetty lines down many a milk-white petal had just finished painting that exquisite picture and left it with every tint bright and fresh as new-blown flowers. But hush, those eyes will quickly open, and the prince dares not wait to see them unclosed. He repassed the window, and, soaring upward, went and placed himself beside the pinnacles of the castle. From the top of the highest tower, he watched Irene as she went leisurely across the lawn, till she disappeared in a grove between the castle and the lake, and, full of impatience, he still waited with outspread wings, till the prow of her light shallop darted forth from the dark green alders that clustered on the shore. Then, plying his ready sails, he launched into the air, swept over the lawn and grove, and, wheeling round the boat, alighted just in front of the beautiful damsel, who dropped the oars and sate motionless when she saw him arriving. "'Ah, oh, leave me!' she cried. "'I must needs be alone. The queen bade me go unaccompanied to meet a messenger,' and receive some token or message for her. And wilt thou be the blind servant of her wicked will, rather than reign in my fair land? replied Phantasmion. My sweet princess, thou shalt go with me, and never return to give an account of thy embassy. Then he seized the oars, and, turning the boat, made it fly over the waters, like a swallow traversing the sky. Irene sought in vain to arrest his movements, Gaily the youth smiled when her hand was laid on his strong arm, as if the snow should seek to impede the course of the torrent on which it falls. My father, she cried, alas, my father, thou hast taken his infant child, and wilt thou rob him of me also? I took that child to place him in safety, answered the young monarch, and I will place thee in more than safety. Thou shalt be a queen, and reign over all my subjects as now thou dost over my heart. Caradan has promised to aid my father against Glendreth, said Irene. What is his aid compared to mine, 
exclaimed the youth. And what his love compared to that I bear thee? He, he is my mother's kinsman, replied the maid. My father loves him as he never will love thee, and for his sake I must shun thee and seek to love him. Would it be less difficult to love me than him? cried the prince. Must thou shun me ere thou canst love him? Oh, if this be true, a thousand enemies and rivals shall never prevail against me. Abandoning the oar, he seized Irene's hand, but with the one still left at liberty, she pointed to the sky. See what clouds, she said, have gathered on the mountain top, how threatening they are, how rapidly they are overspreading the heavens. She had scarce finished speaking when the hills, the shores, and the island were shrouded in vapor, while the lurid waters glimmered in a flickering twilight. Lightning rent the clouds on the mountain head and disclosed the black rocks beneath them. Instantly they closed again, but, at that signal flash, thunder and a boisterous wind raised their loud voices together, one like sullen threats rising louder and louder into fury, the other like the prolonged scream of maniac rage. A skiff which tossed at a distance, its white sails fluttering as the wings of a tempest-beaten dove, was the last object visible on the dusky horizon. Phantasmian surveyed the sky, in the center of which he seemed to discern one cloud blacker than all the rest, and round it a faint edge of lighter hue. On that dark mass the youth could not help gazing. It seemed so like the shroud of a winged form. Here and here might be the outstretched pinions, and above these the head and floating hair. While his face was upturned, a sheet of lightning overspread the cope of heaven. Dizzy and half-blinded, he cast down his eyes upon the lake, and there beheld the glistering face of Sishelma, upraised by the side of the boat, while her hands were extended to catch Irene. Phantasmion seized the oar, and, driving it betwixt the water which and the vessel, he thrust her away then uplifted it again to strike her with all his force. But, like an otter, she darted under the waves, and soon her bubbling laugh was heard at a little distance, amid the voices of the storm. Still the boat goes onward, riding up and down the waves, at each descent seeming about to enter the deep, yet again mounting to the summit of the billow. It drives toward the foot of the lake, and soon approaches the skiff, which has been seen on the horizon. Caradan is standing at the prow. Vainly does he stretch out his arms and call upon Sishelma. She cannot bring about that meeting which her arts contrived, for a mightier power than hers presides over the storm. The dark youth beholds Irene and Phantasmion together. He may not look upon them long. The skiff is going down. It sinks. Oh, save him! exclaims the maid and Phantasmion leaps into the tumbling element. It is a desperate enterprise. Those wings, not made for the water, now only encumber him, and Caradan clings round his body with the clasp of a drowning man. Long did he struggle, but in vain. He and his rival were nigh sinking together, when a vessel, conducted by the old fisherman from the lower end of the lake, arrived in time to save them from death. In a little while they were rescued from the waves, and laid at the bottom of the wide bark, where the crew surrounded them, intent on their restoration, and none, save the aged husband of Telza, bestowed a thought on the damsel in the narrow boat. But the storm now abated, and Irene, waving her hand to the fisherman, in token that she needed no help, slowly pursued her way homewards. On the horizon of the plain, beyond the foot of the lake, a border of pale brightness was visible. It seemed to show that there was a silver firmament behind those tumultuous volumes of clouds which had remained unmoved throughout the chaos of the storm. The maid was alone, but for herself she felt no fear. She thought not of Caradan, or of Glandreth, or of the water witch, or of an angry stepdame. She was thinking only of Phantasmion. Her love had hitherto been as a distant strain of music, scarce noted by one that is busily occupied, 
but now the harmony sounds fuller and more distinct. It will be heard, and the hum of many voices falls into an undersong. With reluctance, she recedes from the vessel where she lately saw him taken in, dripping and senseless. That bark was filled with servants of Manyart, who had been dispatched from Polyanthida in search of their master's son. Learning from the old fisherman that he had gone upon the lake, they ventured through the storm, guided by the old man in the direction of the island, whither they supposed he might have taken his course. Phantasmion recovered wholly while Caradan was just beginning to revive, and while the men in the boat were still bending around the dark youth, he took flight from the stern and hastened to rejoin Irene. Black clouds were yet rolled round the body of the hills, while the head of the lake and one side of the island were still thickly veiled with mist, but the sun began to gild the peaks of the mountains, and a vivid rainbow spanned the waters, which now lay motionless and inky black, as if a trance had succeeded to violent agitation. Again, Phantasmion stood by the side of Irene. With moist wings, he hovered over the boat, while the maid looked up and continued to ply the oars without speaking. But there was a smile on her face, and the youth entered the narrow vessel. Ere that splendid phantom which bent around them had faded away, Irene and Phantasmion were bound to each other by the strongest ties which words can form. Clouds or sunshine might reign without, but their faith was to remain like the dial which stands fixed and changeless, while day and night roll on and can but brighten or darken its face as they are passing over it. Now the youth feels that perfect satisfaction in the present hour which lulls in its tranquil ecstasy all hope, all effort, all reflection, all forecast, even the certain knowledge that the dream must dissolve cannot lessen its charm, that joyfulness of feeling which thought has no power to shake. He took from beneath his girdle the chaplet which had been worn by Zalia and on which was inscribed the Queen of Palmland. He showed her the ruby flowers with their leaves of emerald, and the lady smiled, but turned away and again pointed to the heavens. How strange it is, she said, that those wreaths of vapor are yet lying on the lake when every cloud has left the mountain, and almost all have melted from the sky. Phantasmion cast his eyes around and saw that the welkin was clear, except above the vapory mass to which Irene pointed. There he descried the same noticeable cloud which he had gazed upon in the beginning of the tempest. It was in the form of a cross, and the shape was more conspicuous now than it was alone in the sky. Let us fear nothing, cried the youth. These clouds, too, will disperse like the rest, and we shall have perfect sunshine. Scarce had he spoken thus, and placed a chaplet on Irene's brow, when a boat shot forth from the dark mist. Glandreth was standing at the prow, and that vessel was followed by a train of others which, at his command, surrounded Phantasmion and Irene. In a few moments the youth was bound with cords which fastened his arms and delicate pinions to his body, and, while Glandreth's armed men were dragging him away to the castle, he beheld the chieftain conducting Irene to the shore, then Modra, hidden among the trees, jealously watching his actions, then the drooping Albinian with his lame child on their way to the lakeside. Albinet pulled his father's arm as Phantasmion passed him. Look at his shoulders, he said. Now see his wings by daylight. The cross-formed cloud had disappeared, and the sky seemed an endless depth of sunny blue when Phantasmion was hidden from daylight in a subterranean vault of the castle. End of Part 2, Chapter 6「2 Chapter 7 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 Chapter 7 Phantasmion escapes from prison and presents himself to Irene in disguise. Dark and cold was the place in which Phantasmion was confined, 
and such as might have chilled a less ardent temper than his. But he paced the stone floor, like a leopard in a cage, devising plans of escape and nursing hopes of vengeance. He had now leisure to review the events of the morning, and now he surmised that Modra had sent Irene to meet Caradan at the suggestion of her wily counsellor, because she desired at any cost to remove her from the eyes of Glandreth, that the dark youth had planned to carry her away, and that their schemes and his own had been frustrated by the intervention of Olula. The spirit of the storm cannot conquer the heart of Irene, cried he. Other things may change for the better, and that will never change for the worse. Thus he hoped and triumphed, but no food was given him, and his limbs were painfully pinioned, so that after a certain length of time he sank on the floor, exhausted and spiritless. His eyes were fixed in anguish on the massy door at the top of the stone steps by which he had descended into the dungeon. When he heard the bolts withdrawn and, in a few moments, Glandreth stood before him, sumptuously attired, and with a flaming lamp in his hand. King of Palmland, said he, with a smile, why hast thou chosen to conceal from a brother chief thy rank and dignity? A brother chief? ejaculated the captive in high disdain. I know thee now, pursued Glendreth, and can offer terms suitable to thy rank. Deign to read that scroll. I may not tarry to hear thy reply, for I must visit my fair mistress Irene, who will brook delay on my part worse than thou wilt. Early to-morrow thou shalt see me again, and the light of the sun also, if thou approvest the conditions. So saying, he placed the lamp and the scroll on the ground beside the prisoner, and without loosing his bands, or giving him a morsel of food, quitted the dungeon. Phantasmion began to peruse the writing laid before him by his adversary, and found only such proposals as roused his indignation. No, he exclaimed aloud, rather than yield half my kingdom and what I value more than the whole of it, my claim on the hand of Irene, let the floor of this dungeon be my deathbed. Here, let me perish, since Potentilla does not come to my aid. Just as he has spoken thus, Phantasmion beheld a multitude of sawflies with yellow bodies and black heads flitting toward the light of the lamp. Along with them came numbers of wasps, and the youth shrank as he beheld the mingled swarm approaching himself. He had little cause for fear. They alighted on the cords that bound his arms and wings, and setting resolutely to work, the wasps with their jaws, the flies with their rasping instruments, they severed the tough threads, till the prisoner by single effort snapped the weakened bands. At that moment his arms were stretched at full length, and his wings broke forth, like the tender leaves of a tree when released from their gummy sheath. Away flew the whole company of wasps and flies, and while they were disappearing by the narrow space between the bottom of the door and the top of the stairs, Phantasmion perceived a host of bees entering on the opposite side. They flew to a corner of the roof, and holding up the lamp, he saw that waxen combs were suspended above his head, and that the bees were there depositing the honey which they had just collected in the gardens of the island. Phantasmion now acknowledged that he had not been neglected by Potentilla, who had been employed in his service ever since he entered the dungeon. He soon gained possession of the luscious store which the bees abandoned at his approach, and having feasted on the honey, found his strength and his hopes returned together, nay, felt as jocund as one that has drunk new wine. In this mood, he passed the remainder of the night, and when a few faint rays of the dawn found their way beneath the door into his gloomy abode, he ascended the steps to examine a painted roll which Glandreth had let fall as he left the dungeon. It was all emblazoned with gay devices, in the midst of which Phantasmion read these lines. False love, too long thou hast delayed, too late I make my choice, yet win for me that precious maid, and bid my heart rejoice. Then shall mine eyes shoot youthful fire, my cheek with triumph glow, and other maids that glance desire, 
which I on one bestow. Make her with smile divinely bland, beam sunshine o'er my face, and time shall touch with gentlest hand what she hath deigned to grace. O'er scanty locks full wreaths I'll wear, no wrinkled brow to shade, for joy will smooth the furrows there which earlier griefs had made. Though sports of youth be tedious toil, when youth has passed away, I'll cast aside the martial spoil with her light locks to play. Yes, turn, sweet maid, from tented field, to rove where dewdrops shine, nor care what hand the scepter wield, so thou wilt grant me thine. Before the lamp expired, Phantasmion fed its flame with this testimony of his rival's passion, then reascended the steps and stationed himself beside the door. Hearing a key thrust into the lock, he hovered above it on balanced wings, face downward, and, while Glandreth was beginning to descend, rushed past him out of the dungeon. The fugitive played his fans faster and faster till he had cleared the island. Then away over the lake he floated through clear fields of air as if borne along by a breeze, without a movement of his outspread pinions. He alighted in the midst of that thicket where he had formerly spent the night and looked about with momentary dread to see that no snake yet lurked there. Scarcely had he finished hiding his wings when the fisherman's ancient dame came in sight and, being startled at his unexpected appearance, let her bundle of sticks fall to the ground. The youth accosted her kindly and began to collect her scattered burden while she seized the opportunity of chatting and asking questions. Thou hast travelled far since we saw thee last, she cried. But there is no city in Almaterra so well worth going to see as the capital of this country, the Amantha. How knowest thou that I have not gone to see it? said the prince with a smile. I think thou wouldst hardly come away, said Telza, just as the court are going thither. Are they going thither? inquired the prince. Ah, uh, methinks I heard tell of this. And when will they set out? This very day, replied the dame. Come to my cottage, and thou wilt see them pass. By the time that Phantasmion reached a rising ground, just beyond that lowly cot, the royal train might be seen winding along the vale, and long after they were out of sight, he stood looking after them wrapped in thought. Telza marked his countenance. The last time thou wert here, said she, our lovely princess passed by. Truly, till thou hast seen her, thou hast not set eyes on the fairest thing in Rockland. Phantasmion partook once more of Telza's hospitality, and learned from the fisherman, her husband, that Glandreth was not travelling with the king and queen, but was still at the island. Forthwith, he resolved to follow Irene, and taking leave of the aged pair, pursued his journey alone. But presently, fearing that he might stray out of the right course, he looked about for someone to guide or direct him. So doing, he espied a number of tall peasant girls with baskets on their heads, and saw them sit down by the wayside to eat their provisions. "'Who are these lofty maidens?' inquired the youth. A passing countryman to whom he had spoken made answer, "'They come from a certain glen, and are bound for a neighboring town, where they expect to sell the fruit in their baskets. Some of them will not need to go so far, for this evening they will overtake the royal household, who are already encamped at no great distance. Phantasmion approached one of the damsels. Are all the women of your valley as tall as thou and thy comrades, fair maiden? He said. No women are so tall as those of our glen, she replied, and no fruit is so fine as that, which we gather at the tops of our hills. Prithee, taste and buy. I will buy the whole basket, answered he, if I may purchase thy cloak and headgear too. And how might I procure the secrecy of thy comrades, were I to go along with them thus disguised? That affair was quickly dispatched by the mountain maiden, who dighted the prince in her upper vest and muffling headdress, placed her basket on his head, and departed to a cottage hard by, with more gold in her hand 
and the baskets of all the company were like to gain. The prince went on with the rest of the band, and about evening espied a number of tents erected at the entrance of a wood. The women were soon dispersed among them, eager to gain purchasers for their fruit, and Phantasmion, having learnt that the princess was wandering in the forest, hastily went in search of her, followed by some of his new associates. Soon he hears a rustling amid the leaves, a bird falls from its lofty perch, and young Albinet shouts for joy. Sister, he cried, my little bow and arrows will shoot as well as the longest and strongest in the land. I pray thee aim not at me, young archer, cried a voice from amid the trees, nor take me for a white heron or a long-necked crane. Phantasmion hastened on. The voice was at some distance, but believing it to be that of Irene, he wondered at such lively tones. Soon he entered a glade where three white-robed damsels were standing beside a rivulet. The first, who was looking toward the wood, was Zelneth. Irene and Lukoya were talking together at a little distance. The youth drew his headdress, which he had begun to push aside, close over his face, while his comrades offered their fruit to the lady. "'Here are the tall mountaineers,' cried she, "'with their pleasant cloud berries. Let us sit beside that elder tree,' and eat the dainty fruit. Phantasmion was, by this time, kneeling before Irene, and vainly endeavoring to catch her eye, unperceived by Lukoya. But Zelneth called him away to place the fruit in his basket, on broad leaves, which grew near the brook. And while this repast was eaten, the maiden's talk went on. I have little doubt, said Irene, that we shall find Caradan at Diamantha, near the northern palace. Arzine's heart may soon be set at ease. Nay, cried Zelneth, it is more likely that we shall find him about the Black Lake, for it was there that he escaped again from those who were sent to bring him home. Was he imprisoned in the dark vault of the tower or in the castle? asked Lukoya. Caradan imprisoned, said Irene. I meant that other youth, of whom thou and Zelneth were speaking, replied her cousin. He was confined in the tower, answered Irene with tears, and perhaps he is a prisoner still. And thou didst nothing to set him free, exclaimed Zelneth. I would have died, here the damsel checked her hasty speech, struck by an eager countenance, which reminded her of Semiro. But Phantasmion turned away and the startling likeness was forgotten when Irene offered her a key, and in earnest tone rejoined, Then go thou to the island and open his prison door. I am ready to attend thee, Zelneth, cried Lukoya, quickly rising from her seat. Why didst thou not release the captive thyself? said Zelneth as she took the key. I was prevented by the queen, Irene replied. She met me as I descended the steps of the tower, where I had discovered it beneath the tapestry, and, full of misplaced suspicion, angrily sent me to my chamber. And thou wilt seek for Caradan, said Zelneth, while we perform this charitable errand? Oh, hasten to perform it this very hour, exclaimed the lovely princess. Yon cloud above the wood is yet full of radiance, and even when the sun declines, it is pleasant traveling by the softer beams of the moon. Which will not rise this night, sweet cousin, Zelneth made reply. For that favoring countenance, we may vainly pray, as luckless Caradan does for thine. Then the three slender damsels and the man-like mountaineers with their princely companion quitted the lawn and pursued their way through the wood. Come, Albinet, we are returning, cried Irene. But the boy, with a laugh, went and hid himself among the underwood. Phantasmion kept by the side of Irene, and when Zelneth and Lukoya stepped forward, he pulled her robe. The princess looked up in surprise, but at that moment the dark-eyed maiden turned back to address her cousin. "'What will our mother think of this journey?' she cried. "'And after all, what thanks shall I earn?' "'A thousand thanks,' said Irene, blushing deeply. From thee, but not from him, murmured Zelneth. 
I will never repine, Irene answered, whatever guerdon he offers thee. Zelna smiled and again stepped forward with Lukoya. Phantasmion once more touched Irene's robe and whispered, I am here and subject to no will but thine. Joy now animated her trembling frame, and when Zelneth addressed her once more, she wondered at the glow of happiness that mantled on her cheek. Unhappy Caradan, sighed the maiden. Hush, cried Irene, my father is approaching. Then Lukoya impatiently beckoned to Zelneth. Come, sister, she cried, if thou art resolved on this journey, we must mount our steeds without delay. The daughters of Magnart now departed after taking leave of their kinswoman, who remained within the wood, and beheld the sun's crimson orb half sunk below the distant plain, betwixt bare shafts of trees, which looked like pillars of ebony. Over their rugged roots, Albinian was slowly advancing, his thin white locks just tinged with red by the sunbeams. Glandreth and his armed band were close behind, their casks glittering brightly, while their shadows blackened the ground. The chief strode on before them, passing Zelneth and Lukoya without a glance, for he had discerned Irene in the wood. With firm step and lofty port he came, while the tottering Albinian hurried on when he perceived his approach, and went to lean upon the lady's arm. "'Give me the hand of the fair princess, thy daughter,' said Glandreth, "'and thou shalt have a firmer support than she alone can give.' The old man's face appeared convulsed with inward passion. He strove to speak, but words failing him, shook his head and waved the chief away. Glandreth, incensed by the refusal of Albinian, impetuously took the lady's hand from his, and the feeble man, overthrown by that sudden movement, fell to the earth. Irene turned her indignant eye upon the proud usurper, and would have knelt by the side of Albinian, but the chief detained her hand till Phantasmion, leaning forward from the group of damsels, forced him to release it, seizing his arm with no friendly grasp. Astonished that a woman could assault him thus, he turned about and was wounded at that moment in the cheek by a small arrow which flew from the underwood. Then, believing himself surrounded by concealed enemies, he shouted to his armed men, who were still in the background. They hastened into the wood, but scarcely had they entered it, when a cloud descended from on high and hung like a canopy over the tops of the tall trees. That canopy was composed of innumerable winged insects. Every moment it grew thicker and thicker, and the soldiers groped about in total darkness, unable to find their chief. He, meantime, was battling with armies of moths, which, as fast as he cut them away with his sword, continued to swarm around him undiminished, and soon his men-at-arms were engaged in a like manner. They ran against the trees and strangled in all directions into the wood, trying to escape from their countless antagonists. Phantasmion seized by mistake the robe of Albinian, who was clinging to Irene, and whispered in his ear, My fairest, dost thou still love the stranger from Palmland? A low groan was the only answer to his fond inquiry. The youth let go his hold and rushed away to a little distance. There the cloud of insects dispersed right above his head, and, looking up into the clear space, he beheld Potentilla, cloaked in white moth wings hovering aloft. She beckoned to Phantasmion. He dropped his feminine garb and, soaring upwards, floated by the side of his guardian fairy through the dim grey sky. By the time that both were out of sight, the wood was free from insects, the sun's flaming ball had sunk, and no moon had arisen, but one large star was shooting its diamond rays just over the top of a sable fir tree. End of Part 2 Chapter 7「Potentilla weaves a wondrous web for Phantasmion. Potentilla guided Phantasmion to the chief palace of Rockland, situated between the sea and Diamantha, after he had procured the dress of a peasant by the way. 
The travelers rested in an orange grove, and when the prince besought Potentilla to deliver Irene from the power of Glandreth and Modra, she made answer, Tomorrow the courtly company will arrive at this place. I cannot give thee troops of horse and men in armor to meet them, but I will exhibit a strange spectacle, and while the crowd are gazing at it, thou mayest carry off the princess to the seashore. There the son of Manyarth hath a skiff in readiness, for he still hopes to win Irene and carry her to a secret bower in Nemorosa. This vessel, if thou art beforehand with him, may transport thy fair one and thee to Palmland. The heart of Phantasmion bounded with joyful expectation when he heard the fairy speak thus. He donned his rustic disguise, took a pruning hook in his hand, and, when he saw anyone approach, seemed to be busy among the shrubs. He fed on the fruits of the garden, and at night lay down to sleep in a clump of trees close by the principal entrance to the royal domain. Right in front of that gate, at the top of a gentle ascent, over which the road led to the Diamanthine Palace, was a triumphal arch of light architecture, erected to commemorate the conquest of Tigridia, but now overgrown with climbing plants and decked with their gay blossoms. Phantasmion had not reposed long when he was awakened by an eager dream. He thought he saw the royal procession enter the great gate and advance toward the archway. One by one the company seemed to be pacing along. Irene passes, but still he is chained to the turf where he lies. The damsel floats on. She gains the arch, but, just as she is about to disappear, Phantasmion starts up. The dream has vanished, but the scene remains, and by the pale light of the midnight sky, he discerns a strange object under the festive fabric. A spider, as big as a wolf, is wheeling round and round within the circuit of the lofty arch, spinning and weaving as she goes. The framework of her giant web is formed, the warp is laid out, and now she is traveling round and round to fill in the gummy woof. Not long afterwards, Phantasmion beheld the fairy artisan depart in the manner of spiders, shooting long lines into the air and seeming to fly without wings. Upwards she travels, and now she darts across the moon's bow, and now she is a black spot in the midst of a twinkling constellation. Phantasmion slept again and the first object that struck his newly opened eyes was a magic web, looking like a wheel of fire in the rosy light of morning. Anon those flames expired. Every spoke and cross thread appeared to be a shining icicle, and the whole might have been taken for a crystal net, but soon the elastic substance began to undulate beneath a gentle breeze, and all the scarlet blossoms which flaunted over it were softly heaved up and down. Phantasmion feared that the delicate apparition would melt away before the travelers arrived, but the sun, as it grew stronger and stronger, had no power to dissolve that fabric, and while a crowd was advancing from the palace to view it close at hand, the courtly train, being suddenly arrested on entering the great gate by this unexpected sight, and utterly forgetful of every other object, stood gazing in wonder at the magic web. Phantasmion easily recognized Irene amid a bevy of damsels. Though she and all of them were veiled from head to foot, he shaded his brow with his peasant's cap, and approaching the princess, eagerly whispered, Come with me, and I will explain this wonder. The lady started, threw down her veil, which she had partly drawn aside to survey the spectacle, and after a few moments' hesitation, stole away into the wide plain beyond the precincts of the palace. Phantasmion followed, full of hope and joy, and beheld Irene, fleet as an antelope, speeding across the moor. She had gained some ground at first, and so swiftly did she bound along, that the youth came not up with her, till she had sunk down among the trees of a shady copse. Great was his surprise when he arrived here, to find the princess, her veil thrown off, clad in the habit of a shepherdess, with a crook in her hand. "'Wherefore is this disguise?' he cried. "'And why hast thou fled hither?' 
on the sea coast, we shall find a vessel wherein we may sail to Palmland, and thence up the great river to my very palace gates. Irene replied, My heart is thine, and yet I may not go with thee. I am bound by a vow to make a pilgrimage elsewhere. The strongest proof of love which thou canst give will be to let me instantly depart, and ask not whither I am going. Phantasmion felt like one who has dreamt of golden fruit, and waking, sees what he had dreamt of glowing nigh, but finds his arms fettered, his feet fastened to the ground. This device of thine, she said, has enabled me to escape, just as I had begun to despair of what I so anxiously desired. If my enterprise succeeds, I shall owe that happiness to thee. Cheerily the maiden spoke, yet could not choose but weep, while Phantasmion remained speechless and tearful, looking in her face with imploring eyes, as if he hoped by the mute eloquence of his grief to melt away her resolution. Irene cut off one of her long ringlets, tied it round the arm of the sorrowful youth, and smiling playfully yet tenderly, bound him with that silken fetter to the branch of a shrub. Farewell, she said, when next we meet, thou mayest fasten the chain on me, and if it binds me to thyself, believe that I will gladly wear it, even to my life's end. Then she took up her shepherd's crook and hastened away, nor turned her head till her motions were scarce to be discerned by him she left behind through the dimness of distance. Phantasmion sought not to follow her, but, long after she was out of sight, he stood in the same attitude as when she disappeared, clasping the glossy ringlet in unconscious hands. At length he moved away, and, wandering along with uncertain steps, found himself once more beside the archway. It was now past noonday, and all the gazers had dispersed, but still the magic web remained, and, while he was looking at it with sorrowful eyes, he saw a beautiful bird, called a chinquis, fly into it, and become entangled in its meshes. While it fluttered there, he recognized it as one which he had been wont to caress and feed in palmland, and which had gained the name of the moon bird from the sky-blue moons or mirrors which adorned its wings and train. Poor bird, said the prince, thou hast followed me hither out of love. Thou shalt not perish in these toils, if I can set thee at liberty. He threw off his upper vest, fanned the air lightly with his pinions, and, forgetting the supernatural strength and tenacity of Patentila's work, labored to free the bird till he himself became entangled, and struggling to disengage his wings was only the more firmly glued to the web. Thus he hung, suspended in the center of the arch, with a moon bird by his side, while a set of rustics who beheld him from the open gate believed him to be some deity that presided over the feathered tribes, and gazed at his wings in silent wonder. All his struggles to escape were vain, till a large eagle, rushing upon the moonbird, became likewise entangled in the toils. He, with his strong pinions, shook the net so violently that at last it was rent asunder. Aloft he flew with a great part of the web clinging to his back, and Phantasmion was dashed upon the ground. For some moments he lay under the triumphal arch with his eyes closed and his senses gone, but coming to himself, he beheld the pretty moonbird hovering affectionately over him. Then he arose, drew on his cloak, and hastened out of the royal precincts. Having gained a lonely place, he tried his wings, but, finding they were too much injured to sustain him aloft, except during very short flights, full of sorrow and perplexity, he took his way to the seashore. Caradan had gone thither before him. Caradan stood on the rocky beach, and raising to his lips a trumpet-formed shell, produced a sound in which the tones of the wind, as it whistles through a crevice, were combined with a deep, full, swelling voice of many waters. That blast was borne over the liquid plain, and soon a woman's form arose from the ocean. The setting sun threw its orange glow on the bloodless visage of Seshelma, as onward she came, cleaving the amber flood. A smile widened her flat face and glittered in her yellow eyes, 
unshaded by lashes, and, thus illumined, her countenance looked like that of a demon, brightened by surrounding flames. "'Where is Irene?' exclaimed Caradan. "'Hath my rival carried her away, and have thy promises come to this?' "'Irene is gone to Nemorosa,' replied the sorceress, "'and he to whom she has given her heart is not far off.' At these words, Sashelma smiled maliciously upon Caradan, and the youth uttered a deep groan. "'Accursed be the day,' he cried, "'when I entered into a league with thee. "'Irene loves my rival, "'and what fruit have I of this wicked bond?' "'Do my bidding as heretofore,' said the woman fish, "'and thou shalt banish thy rival from the maiden's heart.' "'Away!' cried Caradan impatiently. "'Thy promises are but vain lures.' "'What?' was the reply. Have I not put into thy hands the silver pitcher? That is true, cried the youth. What hast thou to propose? The king of Palmland, she answered, hath Irene's infant brother secreted in his palace. Place that child in my power, and I will cause the maiden to believe that Phantasmion has delivered him to me. Agree to this, and I will transport thee to his royal domain long before he can return to it. Thou shalt travel swiftly by the sea and up the large river which flows past the palace of Palmland to enter the ocean. Cold drops stood on Caradan's brow while he debated within himself on this proposal. At last he exclaimed, Oh, never will I betray the child that Irene loves to this monster. One sacrifice... I have promised. To gain that heavenly maid, I have made a vow which renders me unworthy to possess her. Surely, I have never loved the right. Seshelma laughed, and that long-drawn jeering laugh blended with the bubble and hiss of the waters, and died into the piping of the wind. But no angry emotion ruffled the glazed surface of her face as she fronted the youth's agitated countenance. Do as thou wilt, she replied. Perchance thou art wise to cease contending in this cause, for who can alter the fixed purposes of fate? There are spirits of the flood that can see into futurity. Did they tell thee of her I love? interrupted Caradan with vehemence. Shall the maid be mine? Never, answered Seshelma, and again she laughed, while it seemed as if her laugh was re-echoed by a lurking train under the waters, till it passed off into the noises of the ocean. Treacherous fiend, Caradan shrieked aloud. Shall Phantasmion possess Irene? Dost thou answer yes? And say that word, and I will come and dwell with thee, all hideous as thou art, in dark and breathless caves forever. Furiously he rushed forward and seized her extended arm, whereat, a lightning flash of electricity shot through his frame. His impotent grasp relaxed. He stood motionless, cramped in every muscle, and with anguish-stricken eyes, bent in fixed stare upon the deep, beheld the enchantress, holding up her hands in mockery, while she retreated backward through the ocean, leisurely rocking up and down with the waves, as if she resigned herself like a drifting vessel to their guidance. End of Part 2, Chapter 8。Part 2, Chapter 9 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Part 2, Chapter 9 。Phantasmion returns to Palmland by sea。Meantime, Phantasmion approached the seashore by a thickly wooded gorge, the lovely Chinquis flying by his side or before him, then rushing up among the trees to play hide-and-seek with her master, as she had been wont to do in the groves of Palmland. From between the last rocks of the valley appeared a small portion of the sea, in the midst of which a little skiff moved on the dark waves with white sails gleaming in the twilight. 
The moon bird paused not with Phantasmion to note that object, but skimming on, now hither, now thither, with careless waste of motion, flew unawares against the face of Caradan as he turned an angle of the winding road. The youth, being suddenly startled in his miserable mood, lifted an angry hand and smote the bird with such force that it fell to the ground, whereupon Phantasmion sprang forward, and the two princely rivals stood face to face. "'Well met!' cried the young king of Palmland. "'I have not come hither in vain, since I have encountered thee. Let us fight now for that pitcher which hangs to thy girdle.' "'So be it!' cried Caradan, hastily and fastening the vessel. "'I will show thee a good place, smooth and light.' He hurried on till, coming within a stone's throw of a chasm amid the rocks, he raised his hand to fling the pitcher down that dark abyss, hoping thus to prevent its falling to the lot of his rival, let the event of the conflict be what it might. But Phantasmion springing forward stayed his arm, the pitcher fell at his feet. Caradan, in desperation, drew his dagger and was rushing on his unguarded adversary when the moonbird, which had risen from the ground unobserved, flew upon him and darted her beak into his eye. A stream of blood gushed down his cheek. He was still feeble from the effects of Sishelma's touch, and overpowered by this second blow, he fell fainting on the ground. Phantasmion resolved to secure the pitcher and fight with Caradan on some future opportunity. He began to draw it from under the body of the youth, who opened his eyes and groaned deeply, but had not strength to stir. The prince saw that his lips moved, but no articulate sounds reached the listener's ear. He desisted for a moment, then renewed his attempt, and, pulling out the pitcher, sought to place it under his cloak but the handle slipped out of his fingers. He took it up again, but the same thing happened. Then he would have seized the vessel by the lip, but like those insects which elude the grasp with their finely polished cases or pliant hair, it still glided away. He might as well have tried to hold Quicksilver, and, after many vain attempts, he began to suspect that he was foiled by some invisible being. Can Sashelma prevail here, he cried, among rocks and trees and flowery banks? Phantasmion cast his eyes around him on all sides. At a little distance from the place where he stood grew a tall branching plant sheeted with blossoms, which at this evening hour were newly opened, when other plants had closed their dewy cups and bells. At midday the hue of those flowers would have looked wan and spiritless, but now that the sky was sobered, now that scarlet and crimson began to blacken, while blue, lilac, and green were glowing all alike, the silver-yellow gleam of the broad disk, which gathered in the light like eyes of nightbirds, had a noticeable luster, and they seemed to be the beautiful spectres of blossoms that had perished in the day. Just above that luminous plant appeared another spectre, yet more softly resplendent. It was the fairy, Fadeline, with warning hand outstretched toward the youth of Palmland. Phantasmion, she whispered, the tears of Arzine have prevailed, and even against thee I must guard her truant son. Go hence, I beseech thee, and trouble him no more. The young monarch obeyed. He proceeded down the glen, and looking back, ere the path turned away, beheld the delicate fairy pouring balm from a chalice on the eyes of Caradan. And now Phantasmion has entered the little skiff, and is about to leave those hostile shores, when on the summit of the cliff, high overhead, he beholds two figures, the indistinct lineaments of which, seen through the dusk, fill his soul with apprehension. That stony outline of an armed form, sharp as a rugged rock, and that soft, quivering plume, belong to none but Glandreth, while, on the other side, vast wings upraised, and moveless bespeak the presence of Olula. She points to an eagle that flies overhead with threads of network hanging from its feathers. It is the one that rents Potentilla's web. Glandreth looks after the bird, then eagerly renews his discourse. 
What words he uttered were inaudible to Phantasmion, but the gale brought to his ear Olula's resonant reply. Phantasmion has not carried her away. She is gone to seek a spring of healing waters. For the sake of Albinian and of Albinet, she roams afar. The youth listened eagerly. Glandreth's discourse was a dull murmur, but Olula spake again, and her words appeared to have been blown through a trumpet. While Phantasmion goes in search of Irene, Glandreth shall conquer the land of palms. Then Glandreth shouted for joy, till all the rocks re-echoed, and Phantasmion saw that Olula had disappeared from the cliff. He was still watching Glandreth and listening to the uproar which his voice raised along the shore, when the little vessel in which he stood was suddenly lifted up and whirled about in the air, while the sea dashed and roared and eddied underneath as if a waterspout had fallen on the spot. The moonbird, having no power to resist that blast, eddied round and round without the vessel, but gradually the wind fell, the sea grew smooth, and the fragile bark settled on the water, as a falcon sinks to her nest after wheeling about restlessly in the air. Meantime, Phantasmion heard a voice on high, and it sent these words to his ear. I swore to serve him till Anthemina's dying day. The moon is up, and two large stars, bright spots of light, appear as if they had dropped out of her beaming crescent. Phantasmion admires not the moon, nor fancies an invisible chain by which those pendant gems may be linked to her golden bow. The chinquis rests upon the mast and sleeps in the moonlight, her splendid train, with all its mirrors, reflecting the mild rays of night. But the prince of Palmland gazes not on her. In thought he is following the lovely pilgrim through dangerous woods and wilds. Thus he coasted along coming to land now and then for provisions, till he reached Palmland and sailed up the principal river to his own abode. Weary and dispirited, he reached his palace gates, and scarce had arrived at the pomegranate tree, when the faithful Chinquis, which had never wholly recovered Caradan's blow, fell dead at his feet. Phantasmion sate upon the ground and shed tears over the lifeless bird, but Potentilla came behind him and cheerily exclaimed, Weep no more for the dead, but take thought for the living. The prince looked up. I have gained the heart of Irene, said he, but I cannot make her my wife because of Glandreth and Caradan. Potentilla replied, Surely my aid has availed thee somewhat. Perchance it may enable thee to gain still more. End of Part 2, Chapter 9 Part 3, Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 1 Irene visits the house of Mulderil in company with Penzelimer. While Phantasmion sailed homeward, Irene was wandering through the wilds of Tigridia, at every hut where she obtained food and shelter inquiring as if by chance concerning the situation of Mulderil's mansion, but telling no one that she was thither bound. Could the sweet feelings and glad thoughts which she excited wherever she went among the pastoral people of the land have sprung up into visible flowers, it would have been seen that she left a blooming track behind her, and, like the sun, drew virtue from the coldest soil. One evening she entered a green dell between woods, where a shepherd was conducting his sheep to the fold. A youth who accompanied her knew this old man, and having commended her to his care departed, to the great distress of the maiden, who feared lest wild beasts should attack him on his way home, as the shades of night came on. The shepherd tried to lessen her fears by relating how Eulander of Nemorosa had thinned the tiger inhabitants of the land. 
In these woods, said he, I doubt if a brindled goat remains. For here it was that the huntsman chief and his comrades procured a band of tigerlings for Queen Modra. I wish this country paid no other tribute to the barren land of rocks than that. Here the parents were murdered, and the young preserved to flesh their teeth on the subjects of King Phantasmion. While the old man stood talking to Irene, describing with lively gestures the battle of the tigers, the braying of horns, the crashing of bows, and yelling of wounded beasts, many of his sheep, as if glad to steal away from the oft-told tale, had struggled into the woody glen, which was full of soft herbage, and Irene offered to guard the main body of his flock while he went in search of the truants. So thanking her for that courtesy, taking a weapon of defense from his girdle, and placing his crook in her hand, he hastened away. The lovely princess led the flock slowly onward, till she arrived at a stream which crossed the dell and had been swollen by sudden rains to a torrent. Here she paused, waiting for the shepherd, and, while the sheep eyed the water, thinking perchance of a ford lower down, where they had crossed in the morning, Irene's mind traveled back to her father and Albinet, thence to her baby brother, and all the time was not wholly absent from Phantasmion. At last she began to think that the old man was long away, and looked up with pleasure when she heard footsteps advancing. But he who now stood before her was more like a king than a rustic swain. His attire, though black, was costly, his countenance abstracted and grave. He stopped to look at Irene as she lifted up a dripping lamp which had slipped into the water, and, seeing that she eyed him anxiously as if desirous yet afraid to speak, for indeed she wished to inquire whether he had seen the shepherd, his eye lit up with expectation and in an eager tone he exclaimed, Hast thou ought to tell me of the silver pitcher? Surely thou art akin to Anthemina, for there is something in thy face like hers. Irene was startled at being accosted thus, but in a few minutes felt assured that she must be in company with Penzelmer of Almatera. I know not what has become of the silver pitcher, she said. Would that I could hear tidings of it. But meantime, I feel anxious, lest the shepherd, whose flock I am guarding, may have met some accident in yonder wood. I trust he has not fallen in with a tiger, said the king. Such a fell beast as lately carried off my horse at noonday. Then, taking a javelin from his belt, he hastened in the direction which Irene pointed out, and soon the maiden saw him return, followed by the truant sheep, and bearing in his arms the old shepherd, who had fallen down the ravine, formed by a recent flood, and so disabled himself. He directed Irene to a shallower part of the stream, where her fleecy charge were able to pass over. She penned the sheep in the fold, while Penzelimer carried their owner to his cottage. Then, repairing to that rustic abode, she assisted the shepherd's daughter to tend his wounds and prepare the evening meal. Penzelimer sate beside the hearth, seeing forms in the fire which appeared to no one but himself, for, as soon as he had placed the old man in safety, his thoughts had all flown back to the silver pitcher. When Irene's employment was over, and she too sat down, he offered, out of courtesy, to guard her during the rest of her journey, and, hearing in what direction she must proceed, declared that he should lose no time in attending her, as the way she spoke of would bring him to the house of Maldoril, whither he desired to go. 
There was a damsel in the cottage who had bashfully drawn back when the strangers entered. While Irene was helping the shepherd lass, she took the maiden's wheel into a corner and span. But, hearing Penzelimer speak in a low voice of Maldoril, she stayed both hand and foot and leaned forward to catch the words of his discourse. Irene, then first beholding her countenance by the firelight, felt a sudden glow of alarm. So much did it resemble that of Caradan. The passionate black eye, the brow, the dark skin, all seemed his, and just such a green and crimson roll as he commonly wore concealed her locks. The shy damsel, seeing herself noted, resumed her spinning, and Irene smiled at her own suspicion when she saw her thus quietly employed. Early the next morning, the princess went forth again in company with Penzelimer, who related the story of his unfortunate love for Anthemina. Then at length she understood how her own fate depended on the silver pitcher, and saw that Caradan had told no feigned tale when he showed it her upon the island. Penzelimer did not observe her sorrowful countenance, but continued talking of himself. It is strange, said he, with the smiling face of a child that wears his newest finest suit, that I, who am the most unhappy among men, should be the envy of beings who dwell on high. The truth is, they hate me on account of Anthemina, for seeing that I shall regain her love if I can but find the pitcher. Therefore they watch me with their bright eyes incessantly, and even at this hour, though I cannot see them, I well know that they are keenly observing me. Irene cast up her blue eyes to the sky with a look of pity and wonder. Their unheard-of persecutions, added he, excited the compassion of the veiled Lady Melodine, who bade me repair to her sister Maldoril, and gave me good hope that, through her, I should regain what I had lost. The maiden rejoiced on hearing Melodine's name, and surmised that Penzalimer was to recover his lost senses by means of the blessed spring of which she herself was in search. The travellers rested at noon beside a stream, and Irene sought to persuade her companion that the notions which he dwelt upon were shadows of no substance, echoes of no sound, like those sights and voices which the disordered eye and ear create within themselves, unmoved by any outward thing. But Penzelimer calmly replied, Sweet lady, for it is plain to me that thou art no shepherdess, if the mirror of my mind did indeed play false, as thy speech infers, how vain it were to lay the truth before me. For I must either be incapable of seeing it at all, or must see it distorted and discolored through the flaws and stains of the glass. That Anthemina dwells in yonder sky seems to me as plain as that I view thy beauteous face and heard thee just now declare that she lies under the wave. But this is one of the tricks of my persecutors. Go where I may, a report has still preceded me that I am mad. Just as Penzelimer spoke thus, a fawn gambolled past Irene. The damsel was tempted to pursue it a little way down the stream, and, running by a leafy covert, she caught a glimpse of the brown girl, who span at the cottage, but passing that way again she saw no one there. The travellers went on their way, and Irene, finding that all the thoughts which a sane mind can suggest to one that is diseased will take the hue of the receptacle, as colourless waters turn blue or green when poured into certain channels, rather sought by gentle ingenuity to make him conceive happy imaginations than presented them to him and no longer combated errors which were as invulnerable as they were easy to hit. Both rested at a goatherd's cottage that night, and in passing through the little orchard attached to it, when she set forth early the next day, 
Irene beheld the dark maiden, wrapped in a cloak and sleeping under a tree. The swarthy cheek and black eyebrow again fixed her attention, but as she gazed, the girl awoke, and beholding Irene, covered her face with her garment. Panzelimer now joined his fair comrade, and the maiden, in some perplexity, pursued her way. At noon she beheld the house of Molderil, situated on the lowest ridge of a conical mountain, which towered alone upon the plain, and showed from its rugged brow on one side pastoral plains, interspersed with woods and hollow glades, full of giant reeds and tree-like ferns. On the other, the endless forest of Nemorosa, which Glendreth had never subdued. The mansion itself and the wall around it were hewn out of a rock. "'Whither shall I conduct to thee?' said Penzelimer to his companion when they reached the foot of the hill. "'I must go whither thou art going,' she said. "'Even to the house of Motheril, for I to seek the presence of the ancient queen,' but was bound not to speak of this till I approached her threshold. Penzelimer blew a horn which hung at the outer gate of the mansion as soon as he reached it and started at the loud sound which ensued and which all the rocks above and below re-echoed. A raven flew from the beetling crag overhead just as a rugged churl admitted the strangers. Other domestics then appeared and conducted them to the apartment where their mistress sat at the summit of a tower. Mulderil was seated in a carved chair, the brown arms and upright back of which resembled her own figure, dried and stiffened, but not enfeebled by age. Her face appeared of bronze, all but the rapid eye, like lambent flame shining and restless, her heart was dead as the leathern girdle that covered it, her brain ever in motion like the sands of the hourglass that stood before her on the table. She was clad in robes of purple and scarlet, and wore upon her head a crown of golden spikes. Irene felt appalled when Molderil desired that Penzelimer would wait in the anteroom while she conferred with the maiden but summoning courage, presented an ivory tablet on which her name was inscribed, with curious ciphers underneath. Mulderil, after a glance at the writing, told her that she must go alone to the spring and impart the secret to no one. The maiden having agreed to this condition, she placed in her hand a light bucket and chain with a leathern bottle at the same time giving her certain directions, and Irene took her leave with many thanks, delighted to think how much of the precious water the skin would contain. No sooner was she out of hearing than Maldoril turned her keen eyes on the melancholy king, who had entered at one door as Irene disappeared by another. Panzelimer, she said, he who robs thee of thy right is Phantasmion, king of Palmland. The son of Dorimont, he exclaimed with kindling eye. On each side of the queen's footstool, a dwarfish figure was crouching. Irene had scarcely observed them, and by Penzelimer they had been taken for appendages to the grotesque imagery of her wooden chair. But when the queen touched one of them with her foot, up he sprang, and fixed upon Penzelimer a pair of toad's eyes ringed with scarlet. At the same instant, the other dwarf raised his pointed face, in which the eye holes were mere points, laid out his broad flat hands, and put forward the side of his head, as if to hear, rather than see, what was going on? While Penzelimer viewed these objects with surprise, Maldoril began to mutter, and soon both they and the whole apartment were obscured, clouds creeping over the vaulted roof and veiling the wide crystal windows. A fiery light then rose up on the opposite wall, and Penzelimer beheld in many colored flame a picture of Phantasmion standing over Caradan and striving to secure the enchanted vessel. 
When the king beheld that image of Anthemina's pitcher in the silvery light, he rushed forward and would have clutched it from the wall, but lo, it was impalpable as fires that hover over a marsh, and a loud puffing noise arose from below that seemed to be an expression either of pain or mockery. Thereat Penzelimer, looking down, espied the toad-like dwarf whose body he had squeezed against the wall with his great mouth wide open and a slimy liquid oozing from every pore of his wrinkled skin. A hollow laugh echoed from the chair of Mulderil, who was wrapped in darkness, and the crystal windows of the tower tinkled with her mirth. Is it thus thou rewardest those that serve thee, noble monarch? she said. Swartho has shown thee thine enemy by the power of his art, and in return thou art trampling him under foot. Penzelimer drew back and was incensed when he recognized the face of Phantasmion to find that the youth to whom he had related his story was King Dorimont's son, not doubting that he had visited him solely to obtain an account of the silver pitcher. Transport me to Pomland, exclaimed the king, and furnish me with armor. Nay, answered the crafty witch, if thou goest now to Pomland, thou wilt miss thine enemy, and in case of meeting him on the road wouldst fail to know him, for he is disguised by the fairy Potentilla. Show me his likeness, rejoined the king, as he appears at this moment. The sorceress bade Swartho comply with that request, and straightway he brought so strange a phantom before the eyes of Penzelimer, so all unlike any adversary which he had ever dreamt of, that for a moment he stood aghast. But, ere the grim figure faded away, and light once more succeeded to darkness, his courage returned, and, kneeling before the ancient queen, he besought her to arm him, so that he might fitly encounter such a formidable foe. "'What guerdon shall I have from thee for such service?' inquired Maldaril. "'What wouldst thou have?' the king replied. "'If thou conquerest Phantasmion,' said the queen, "'thou shalt bestow half of Palmland on my young kinsman, Ulander. The king willingly acceded to this proposal, and also agreed that if he died without issue, Ulander should inherit Almaterra. In a little time afterwards, Mulderil had provided him with a horse and armor and a plumed cask, as like as possible to those of Glandreth, whose stature was scarce loftier than his own, and bade him repair to the mansion of that aspiring chief, on the confines of Rockland, Tigridia and Almaterra. By the time that thou arrivest there, said she, Phantasmion will have reached the same place under a feigned character for the sake of encountering the great enemy of his kingdom in single combat. Thou shalt bear a letter from me to Glandreth. He will easily be persuaded to let thee accept the challenge in his name when he knows that thou, being furnished with enchanted armor, in addition to thy own great skill and might, art more certain to defeat the king of Palmland, even than his valiant self. Thus forewarned, Penzelimer departed, full of joy and confidence, expecting soon to have the disposal of Phantasmion's life and kingdom, and to obtain the more valuable pitcher for himself. End of Part 3, Chapter 1《パート3》チャプター2オフファンタスミオン by Sarah Coleridge。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。パート3》チャプター2 Irene has a fearful adventure on the mountain。モルリル was sitting under the outer wall of her abode, looking after the king of Almaterra, 
as he rode down the hill, when the dark damsel kneeled at her feet and placed in her hand a withered branch. Thou comest from Melodine, said Maldaril. Who art thou, and what has passed betwixt thee and the veiled lady? I am Zelneth, daughter of Magnart, said the damsel, taking the roll from her head and letting her jetty ringlets fall down to her waist. This is not my natural color, added she, putting up her white hand to her swarthy cheek. I stained my face, that no one might know me as I traveled to thy house. Melodine I met with on the king's island, and she sent me to thee. Wherefore, said Maldaril, feigning ignorance of what she knew full well. To find my sister Lukoya, replied Zelneth, while a bright blush glowed through her tawny mask. Then return to thy home, said Maldaril, for there thou wilt be more likely to learn tidings of Lukoya than here. Zelneth cast her eyes on the ground, as she replied in a whisper, where can I learn tidings of Phantasmion, son of Dorimont? I do confess that for his sake also I am come to thee. Maldaril's searching glance was now exchanged for a look which encouraged Zelneth to proceed in her disclosure. She told the story of her love for Phantasmion, and how she had set forth to free him from prison. It was midnight, she said when we reached the island, and straight away repairing to the darksome vault and putting the key into the lock, I found the bolts already withdrawn. I descended and sought in all the subterranean chambers, but found no trace of him whom I hoped to meet. Just as I emerged from the vault, my lamp threw its light on a lady covered with a veil which gleamed in the darkness. Dost thou seek Phantasmion of Palmland? she said. This morning his prison door was unlocked by the king's daughter. Then I knew that Irene had deceived me, and recollecting the lofty mountaineer who kept by her side in the wood, I clearly saw for what reason she had sent me away. While I was weeping on my pillow that night, the veiled lady entered my room and offered me a cup, one draught from which, as she averred, would make me cease to love and cease to feel such sorrow. But starting up, I promptly answered, Ask me not to drown the remembrance of either of those I love or those I hate. Rather, Offer me a charm by which I may gain the heart of Phantasmion and triumph over my false rival. Then she bade me repair to thee in secret, bearing a token from her, and, placing a withered branch in my hand, she left me to repose. Early the next day I sought Lukoya, but she was nowhere to be found and I could not doubt that she drank of the forgetful cup and followed Melodine. In all haste, I crossed the mountains and traveled on to the house of a shepherd in Tigridia. There I dismissed all my attendants, bidding them repair to Arzine and tell her that I had hoped soon to return home with my brother and sister. I had not long been under the shepherd's roof when King Penzelimer and the Princess Irene arrived at the same cottage. Alas, even here perhaps the daughter of Anthemina has forestalled me, and I cannot weep with sweet Lukoya, for she has been carried away. Tears flowed down the face of Zelneth, streaking the stains that hid her lovely skin. Maldoril smiled. Have no fear, she said. Touching Irene and Lukoya, neither shall cross thy path. But is Lukoya safe and happy? said Zelneth tenderly. Safer than a pearl, five fathom deep, said Maldaril, and happy enough, though not so blessed as thou shalt be ere long. Come with me to my cavern in the forest, 
and if I do not quickly bring Phantasmion to thy feet, in that secret dwelling I will hide my head there for the remainder of my life. Zelneth trod on air when she heard Mulderil speak thus. She washed herself white in a pure fountain, and joyfully accompanied the sorceress queen to her cave in the woods. Irene, meantime, wound along the mountain, scarce pausing for a moment to survey the sylvan prospect before her, but going steadily on till she found the well in a hollow betwixt two rocky ridges. This dale was clothed with herbage, converted into stone by the overflowings of the spring, and the breeze, when it swept the valley, stirred not a leaf that grew there. Joyfully the maiden smiled when she saw these manifest signs of the water's potency, and imagined that it would brace and strengthen her father's quivering frame, even as it had enabled the tremulous reeds and blades of grass to stand firm against the wind. With a fragment of rock in her hand, she ascended the petrified mound that encased the spring, and, having flung her burden into the well, kneeled down and listened for the noise described by Motheril, who had told her that the waters were commonly out of reach, that she must throw a heavy stone into the pit, whereupon they would gradually rise higher and higher till at last they might be taken up by the bucket, that when she heard a noise like a stifled thunder, she must listen carefully till it changed to that of bubbling and hissing. Then, regardless of the fumes which would pour from the mouth of the pit, she must let down her bucket and fill quickly, ere the water again sank out of reach. And now Irene has caught the sound, and with a beating heart she applies her ear close to the opening, in spite of the hot vapors with which she begins to be enveloped. Such indeed was the effect upon her frame that she felt as if she must quickly dissolve and trickle into the well or float away to the sky in subtle steam. Yet still she listened, holding her breath, lest she should fail to hear the sign and miss the right moment. But, just as the hissing noise commenced, just as she was about to raise her head and lower the bucket, a youth leaped forward, caught her suddenly in his arms, and rushed away to a distance from the shining mound, and scarce had he placed the maiden on her feet, when the volumes of steam sent forth from the pit were succeeded by a column of boiling water which rose higher than the dark rocks behind it, and, falling in foaming curves, quickly deluged the surrounding vale. The fountain continued to play before Irene, mounting higher and higher, as if it would sweep down the clouds, a pile of rainbow splendor, with a crest of a thousand feathers as white as snow, and while she watched it in speechless amazement, the young huntsman gazed upon her face in equal wonder and almost equal agitation. "'What didst thou at the boiling well?' at length he inquired. I have been cruelly deceived, the maid replied, and then began to relate how she had been beguiled into undertaking her pilgrimage. One night, she said, I was working for my stepmother in a lonely tower. The evening shades came on. I dropped my needle, being unable to distinguish the colors of the embroidery, and, hearing my silver pheasant tap at the window, I hastened to let her in. But when I rose, the bird was not at the casement, and, looking out, I saw that she had fallen to the ground with an arrow in her breast. Then I hastened down the steps of the tower and bent over my favorite. Oh, surely she revived, replied the youth, fixing his eyes full of tenderest rapture upon Irene, as if to say that looks of pity from her face were enough to heal any wound. Nay, replied the maiden, my bird seemed stone dead, but, raising my tearful eyes, I saw a lady wrapped in a shining veil, with a vial in her hand. Pure water from this tiny vessel she poured on the face of the bird, 
when suddenly I saw the glazed eye relume within its scarlet rim, the ruffled feathers expand and show their finest gloss like silken streamers swollen with the wind, and, rising from the ground, my graceful favorite took her highest flight, clearing the tower and sinking down into the grove beyond. I turned to thank the lady in the shining veil, but she was gone, and never again did I behold her till one night when I sallied forth to free a prisoner from the lonely tower. A prisoner, said the youth, and thou wast going to set him free. Irene blushed as she pursued her story. On that night I met the same veiled lady in the grove, betwixt the castle and the tower. Wilt thou serve strangers, she said, and do nothing for those that are near to thee, for poor Albinian and his sickly son? Then I besought her to tell me how I might serve them, and she bade me seek the fountainhead of that water with which she had restored the dying bird. How shall I find it? I eagerly replied. Go to Queen Maldoril, she answered, bearing this token from me, but tell no one whither thou art bound, or on what errand, unless thou goest in secret, she will not reveal the salutary spring. Then, placing an ivory tablet in my hand, again she disappeared. And didst thou free the prisoner? The young huntsman anxiously inquired. Irene paused, then answered. I trust he is now at liberty, though not through me. And thou hast taken this long pilgrimage, cried the enamored youth, all for thy father's and thy brother's sake. And the cruel queen gave thee that bucket, and would have sent thee to destruction. Oh, for a swift steed, cried Irene, to travel day and night till I reached the diamantine palace. Come with me, exclaimed the youth, seizing her hand. Even here we are not in safety. The maiden now perceived volumes of smoke far above the watery column. They rose from a high peak and soon were changed to spiral flames which occupied the vault of heaven just over the foaming fountain. Irene kept pace with the speed of her conductor. Soon they reached the grove below the hill where the young huntsman had left his horse to follow a goat among the rocks. He placed the princess hastily on his steed and, mounting before her, never ceased urging him forward till he was in the very bosom of the forest. "'We are going farther from Rockland!' exclaimed the maid in sorrow. "'Trust to me,' the youth replied. This way will sooner bring thee home than to retrace thy steps. Irene was bewildered by the ocean of trees into which they were launched, but hoped that she should emerge from it in time and find herself in some territory not far distant from Rockland. It was almost dark in the shady track through which the young huntsman threaded his way. He had left his bow near the boiling fountain, so that the quiver at his shoulder would have been of little avail had one of the panthers, whose bright eyes glared from under the dark branches, felt courage for an attack. But at his approach they bounded away, leaping from tree to tree. At last Irene began to catch bright gleams and moving objects through the foliage, and soon her conductor came upon the skirts of a wide pleasure ground, on the slope of a hill crowned by a goodly palace, which, from glittering spires and gay animaled windows, reflected the rays of the sun, just then about to sink on the opposite woody horizon. Below the mansion were hanging gardens of rich flowers, intersected with rivulets which ran among the beds of roses, like tears down a bright blushing face. On a lawn at the foot of the hill, a band of youths and maidens were dancing. 
these had no sooner espied the noble huntsman than they came forward in a body to cast their wreaths at his feet and by their festive cries and salutations irene learned that her companion was yolander chief of nemorosa the maiden entered his dwelling still beguiled by hopes that she was on the way to rockland but soon discovered that her being restored to the arms of her father depended on a condition which even love for him could never strengthen her to fulfill as yolander's bride she might revisit her native country but else was doomed to brook the fruitless penance of distasteful courtship in a foreign land day after day she complied with every request of her adorer save that alone to which all his petitions tended she flew by his side on the light steed pierced the pard or lynx or savage deer and while the forest rang with praises of the graceful huntress and yolander kneeling declared that she excelled in skill and courage even as in loveliness the gentle maiden longed to fly with those she pursued and either escape or perish from her chamber in yolander's palace she looked out over the undulating forest of nemorosa which appeared like a wavy ocean fixed in stillness by an enchanter's wand for gold or silver gleams when the sun shone there was a gilded verdure and when the breezes blew for ocean's purple frown a ripple of green leaves but care darkened the shadows of the scene for her and sickening hope tinted the mellow foliage now she thought of phantasmion of him she had so resolutely quitted whose pursuit she had almost feared now she repined at that multitude of trees which seemed to interpose an endless barrier betwixt them and gazed for hours on the woodland prospect still faintly hoping deeply longing to see him rise with the morning star from the skirts of the forest or sail from the golden east with brightened wings over the green expanse on a tufted knoll behind the palace yolander was carving irene's name upon a cypress with a spear's point when hearing her soft voice among the trees beyond he dropped the implement and resting his head against the bough listened with grieved heart to these numbers he came unlooked for undesired a sunrise in the northern sky more than the brightest dawn admired to shine and then for ever fly his love conferred without a claim perchance was like the fitful blaze which lives to light a steadier flame and while that strengthens fast decays glad fawn along the forest springing gay birds that breeze like stir the leaves why hither haste no message bringing to solace one that deeply grieves thou star that dost the skies adorn so brightly heralding the day bring one more welcome than the morn or still in night's dark prison stay end of part three chapter two Part three, chapter three of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three, chapter three. Phantasmion goes to fight Glandreth and encounters Penzelimer. While Phantasmion seeks Irene, Glandreth shall conquer the land of palms surely thought the young monarch olula is secretly on my side and those words which were blown to my ear as with the blast of a trumpet were meant to give me warning not only this kingdom but irene herself will never be securely mine while my enemy lives and triumphs after a conference with potentilla he informed his council that as glandreth alone 
endangered the safety of the realm, and to conquer him would be to extinguish the war at once, he had resolved on defying him to single combat, and purposed to announce himself in the challenge as a puissant warrior sent by the king of Palmland to encounter the mighty general of Albinian. He had already given orders for raising an army and guarding the sea coast with a numerous fleet. There were hosts of brave men at his disposal, but the want of metal armor was one which no ingenuity could supply, and rendered his subjects ill-fitted to contend with the men of Rockland who had iron without as well as firm sinews within. This consideration only heightened Phantasmion's desire to encounter Glandreth, and seeking the pomegranate tree, at the first peep of dawn, he besought Potentilla to produce that powerful armor with which she had offered to furnish him. She struck the earth, and brought before the eyes of Phantasmion a pair of warrior ants which fought ferociously till both were exhausted. How sayest thou, said Potentilla, wilt thou be armed like these pugnacious insects? The youth, having readily consented, she laid her wand upon his head, then bade him strike it with his dagger. He did so, and found it perfectly impenetrable, but looking with eager curiosity into a clear pool hard by, he stared at the portentous shadow of his insect helmet. It displayed a movable crest in the shape of jagged, all-shaped jaws, with which, if other weapons failed, a terrible wound might be inflicted, while the face and breast of the wearer appeared to be cased in a substance as tough as horn, yet hard as brass. The youth was still surveying his figure, not without dismay, little thinking that the picture of it was at the same moment before the eyes of Penzelimer in the house of Maldoril, when Potentilla placed in his hand the sting of a scorpion increased to the size of the largest scimitar and taught him how the fearful weapon was to be used. But thou wilt rid me of this disguise as soon as the fight is over, said Phantasmion. Potentilla smiling replied, It might stand thee in good stead whither thou art going. Maldaril has a young kinsman who pursues fair damsels more earnestly than the bright-eyed antelope and silver-coated hind. The constancy of thy mistress may be strongly assailed in the country of Yolander. How sayest thou? exclaimed Phantasmion. But the fairy disappeared, leaving him wrapped in thought and gazing on vacancy, till the sting of an ant upon his right foot admonished him to set off without delay. Forthwith he concealed his face and the upper part of his body with a mask and a cloak, which, at the fairy's suggestion, he had brought to the interview, mounted his horse, and, through rugged passes among the black mountains, travelled toward the house of Glandreth. His adversary, meantime, had been pondering over the defiance from Palmland, when Penzelimer arrived, bearing the letter of Maldoril. On perusing this crafty epistle, Glandreth was well content that the king of Almaterra should stand in his place and fight his enemy with charmed weapons, resolving in the meanwhile to lead his well-trained forces into the realm he so much desired to invade. He would not even await the event of the conflict, but stole away, after pompously accepting the challenge, and while Phantasmion was traversing Rockland, Glandreth was on his way to the land of palms. The combatants met on a wide plain before Glandreth's castle in the presence of a large assembly. Phantasmion looked at the sky and satisfied himself that it was perfectly clear. Then he cast his eyes on his adversary and thought that Glandreth, though of noble port and stature, was by no means so broad-built a man 
as he had formerly imagined. The king of Almaterra, meantime, could scarce turn his attention from Phantasmion's woolen cloak, which lay on the ground, for though it was only wrapped about the serpent wand and a silver cup, he imagined that it concealed nothing less than Antimina's pitcher. But now the trumpet sounded, and great was the astonishment both of Phantasmion and an amphitheatre of spectators to see Penzelimer's panoply drip all over, then fall into furrows, and lastly trickle away in many a bubbling stream, as if he were but a waxen warrior and melted at the very breath of his antagonist. Such was the effect of Mulderil's treachery, such the power of her muttered charm, that Penzelimer quickly stood bare in the sight of all men, his helmet with its visor and his uplifted blade alone remaining for a season firm. When drops began to fall from the end of that weapon, also he indignantly rushed upon Phantasmion. But no sooner had he felt the point of the scorpion's sword than, uttering a loud cry, he sank senseless on the ground, with the magic weapon sticking fast in his side. At the same moment that he fell, Phantasmion's fairy accoutrements vanished. And when with loud shouts Penzelimer was removed from the field, he procured fresh armor, and challenged every warrior present to stand in Glandres' place, but all declining the combat, he forthwith departed to Rome in search of Irene. And now that deeds of arms no more engaged his thoughts, they centered wholly in that fair and pious maid whose image beamed on all sides of his solitary path. And this was one of many strains with which he addressed her. Yon changeful cloud will soon thy aspect wear, so bright it grows, and now, by light winds shaken, O oh, ever seen, yet ne'er to be overtaken, those waving branches seem thy billowy hair, the cypress glades recall thy pensive air, slow rills that wind like snakes amid the grass, Thine eyes mild sparkle, fling me as they pass, yet murmuring cry, this fruitless quest forbear. Nay, e'en amid the cataract's loud storm, where foamy torrents from the crags are leaping, methinks I catch swift glimpses of thy form, thy robe's light folds in airy tumult sweeping, then silent are the falls, mid colors warm, gleams the bright maze beneath their splendors leaping. End of Part 3, Chapter 3《Part 3, Chapter 4 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 4 Phantasmion is detained in Mulderil's cave. Phantasmion pursued the same track which his gentle princess had taken through Tigridia and excited curiosity in all who beheld him by his noble aspect and kingly air. The first discourse of his cottage hosts was ever concerning the fair pilgrim Irene and this tale was sure to be followed by an animated history of Eulander as its counterpart. Phantasmion glowed and trembled when he heard those names wedded in description, and scarce dared inquire about Nemorosa, lest he should hear some unwelcome eulogy on the graces of its youthful chief. Thus he fared, tracing his lady's footsteps to the house of Maldaril, where he learned that the ancient queen had repaired to the forest with a most beautiful maiden. His heart beat higher than ever at this intelligence. A most beautiful maiden could be no other than Irene, and it seemed plain as the sun at noonday 
that Maldaril was bent on securing so rich a prize for her young kinsman Yelander. He wound along the bottom of the mountain and left his horse before nightfall at the cottage of a goat herd, thinking that he could best proceed on foot through the tangled forest to find Maldaril's retreat, provided as he was with good armor and dauntless courage, he feared neither man nor beast, but anxious thoughts and surmises crowded on his mind like swarms of stinging gnats, the pertinacity of which no efforts were sufficient to repel. Just as his mental fever had reached its height and had begun to bring, even before his visual eye, a graceful huntsman kneeling at the feet of Irene, in whose face a smile seemed to dawn, but whether of cold courtesy or nascent love he vainly strove to distinguish. A voice whispered seemingly from underground, Dost thou seek Irene? She dwells with Lulander, and the loveliest of all maidens is in Maldaril's cave. Phantasmion shivered, and an instant afterwards his veins could scarce contain their scalding currents. Irene with Yulander in Mulderil's cave. Surely, thought he, that was not the mere voice of my delirium. Then he began to rave and shout aloud, as if the forest could hear him. Where is the cave? Where is the cave? Oh, these huge trees that stretch their giant arms and point on all sides. How they too madden me. Flinging away his cloak, he rushed on wildly till he was stopped by close underwood, growing over a swamp. Here again a voice rose to his ear, crying, Irene dwells with Yolander. Seek the beauty in Maldaril's cave. Phantasmion now looked down and perceived a strange figure, but could not see either its form or features clearly from the dimness of the place. Do thou show me the way, whoever thou art, cried the youth, frantically waving his sword. At these words, Maldaril's toad-like dwarf leaped from amid the bushes and skipped on before Phantasmion, who followed him till the umbrageous path was faintly illumined by what appeared in the distance like two huge eyes of fire. Those are openings in front of Maldaril's rocky tenement, said the dwarf. Their light will guide thee thither. Phantasmion looked at his good steel blade, then hastened on and entered the cavern by a winding passage. He paused at the threshold and saw no graceful hunter youth, but a wrinkled crone in queenly attire, bending over the flames of a well-heaped hearth and carefully inspecting the contents of a wide vessel which simmered amid the blaze and filled the cave with odorous, inebriating fumes. Beside her stood the glowing and beautiful Zelneth, her glossy raven locks carelessly flung back from her white forehead and her splendid eyes intent upon the work that was going on. She held in both hands a crystal bowl into which Maldaril began to pour some of the rosy liquid scooped from the cauldron, when Phantasmion appeared and caused such alarm in the damsel's mind that the vessel would have fallen to the ground if her companion had not taken it from her. King of Palmland, said the aged queen, thou art welcome. Be seated and take off thy cumbrous armor. Muttering within herself, she touched the head of the youth as he bent forward to look after Zelneth, who had retreated to the inner part of the cave when his crested helmet vanished, and soon the hyacinthine locks and goodly countenance of Phantasmion were revealed by the red light of the flames. Then Zelneth uttered a cry of astonishment and exclaimed, O oh, Maldaril, is this a delusion of magic? Or do I look upon the very face of him I love? Dost thou still love Phantasmion, best and loveliest? cried the youth, 
rushing forward to throw himself on his knees, his whole soul possessed with the image of Irene, but, looking up and beholding Zelneth, her bright face beaming with transport, her fair form almost appearing to expand from the joy of her bosom, he started away with a countenance of deep disappointment. Zelneth, daughter of Magnart, he exclaimed in a sorrowful tone, O oh, tell me, hast thou lately seen thy kinswoman, Irene? The damsel turned away without speaking, and, while tears gushed between the ivory fingers that strove to conceal them, Mulderil, who still bent over the cauldron, answered in her stead. Irene was gaily hunting the deer, said she, by the side of her betrothed, Yolander, when Zelneth came to my house in search of Lukoya, Irene, pretending to serve her parent, deserts him for a lover, while this maiden faces a thousand dangers for her sister's sake and loves with constancy, though hopeless of a return. Zelneth flung her white arms around Mulderil and, hiding her head, she gently cried with half-suppressed sobs, Oh, speak no more! Phantasmion will win back his beauteous bride, and Zelneth would rather die than trouble his happiness. The youth's brain had been half unsettled by feverish suspicions, together with bodily fatigue, and now the steams of the liquor doubled its confusion. He turned away and would have rushed out into the forest, to seek his rival, but the cavern appeared to be full of passages winding in every direction, and he found it impossible to hit upon the one by which he had entered. Take thy rest here tonight, said Mulderil. Thou wilt never find a sylvan palace in the dark, and tomorrow, or a month hence, Irene may still be found at the house of Elander. If thou must indeed go fight for that gathered lily, with tarnished leaf and tainted fragrance. At another time, Phantasmion would have flamed at those words, like a fire fresh fueled. But now, the luscious vapors were stealing over his senses. He was gazing unconsciously upon Zelneth, as she stood a little behind Mulderil, with arms pensively crossed and downcast face, shaded on each side by drooping locks. He retired to a recess in the cavern, and tried to think again his former thoughts and purposes, but insensibly they floated away. His rage against Yolander seemed to dissolve, or turn into its opposite, and he vainly sought to keep firm hold of that or any other feeling. Zelneth approached with the crystal basin in her hands, and said to him, as he sate in the shadow, Mulderil has been preparing a precious liquor for my beloved parents. It takes away all sense of toil and pain. She stood with her face half turned away, yet holding the vessel within Phantasmion's reach. He put out his hand towards it, gazing all the time on the damsel, but with a sudden effort he drew it back again and turned his face to the rocky wall. Zelneth sipped the liquid, then cried to the aged woman who was busy about the fire, stirring and skimming the cauldron. Mulderil, add nothing more. It cannot be better. I will go fetch the jars in which it must stand this night. She left the crystal basin on a table of rock just opposite to Phantasmion. He saw the liquor lie glowing and creaming in the bowl, like melted rubies, frost with pearl. He inhaled its sweet, bewildering odor, and scarce knowing what he did, the youth raised it to his lips and drank deeply. In a moment, he was electrified with delight, a rapturous tranquility pervading his whole frame. He felt intoxicated with pleasure which sprang from no cause and tended to no object, yet was ever ready to be reflected and multiplied from all objects around. 
He seemed incapable of thinking and happier than any thoughts could make him, Zelneth returned from the further part of the cavern, bringing jars in her hand. In the eyes of the spellbound prince, she now appeared to be glorified by a supernatural light of beauty. Joy streamed from every line of her face and form into the joyful heart of the prince. As light shoots from the surface of smooth water back towards its heavenly source. All thought of Zelneth, all thought of Irene, all remembrance of the past, all anticipation of the future were completely suspended. He only knew that he was gazing on a sun of loveliness in which a thousand beauties seemed to converge, while the feelings inspired by his own heavenly maid were mingled with his new sensations though the object of them was veiled in his memory by a dazzling mist. Zelneth retired again into the dark recess to fetch more vessels, while Phantasmion, reclining on a smooth, low rock, with his head sunk into a mossy hollow, beheld fantastic petrifactions which hung from the ceiling, illuminated by the firelight. He gazed upon them in ecstasy and felt as if the transport of his bosom, which invested them with splendor, was derived from those unmeaning forms, till Zelneth, again presenting herself, occupied his whole fancy, and seemed once more to be the fountain of all his glad sensations. The damsel now ventured to cast her eyes upon him, and, seeing the bowl by his side, was sure that he had drunk the charmed liquor, Eagerly, she perused his countenance and, reading the deepest fascination of love in every line of it, she let the jar fall upon the floor. He is mine, she whispered, clasping her hands. O oh, Maldoril, is this all thy work? Have I no part in it? But will not the enchantment fade? Will Phantasmion love Zelneth forever? He heard the words and smiled on her who spoke them, but spoke not himself, his eyes being heavy with sleep, as an infant lies in his cradle, watching every motion of her whom he loves fondly, but unconsciously, free from the burden of esteem and obligation of gratitude. So Phantasmion followed with his eyes the beautiful Selneth and saw her prepare a couch for him on the floor of the cavern. She heaped up sweet-scented withered leaves and strewed over them the skins of wolves and flowing fur of lynxes. Phantasmion sank down upon the soft bed and was speedily wrapped in slumber. Zelneth kneeled beside him, gazing on his gentle and noble countenance as the firelight irradiated his fair brow where all the soft blue veins were traceable under a smooth surface, and his bright, youthful cheek reclining amid the spoils of savage animals, and surrounded by the black walls and shadowy hollows of the cavern. Already she fancied herself the flower-crowned bride of Phantasmion, and breathed in a soft, lulling melody this happy strain. I was a brook in straightest channel pent, forcing mid rocks and stones my toilsome way, a scanty brook in wandering well nigh spent. But now with the rich stream conjoined I stray. Through golden meads the river sweeps along, murmuring its deep full joy in gentlest undersong. I crept through desert moor and gloomy glade, my waters ever vexed, yet sad and slow, my waters ever steeped in baleful shade, but whilst with thee, rich stream, conjoined I flow. E'en in swift course the river seems to rest, blue sky, bright bloom, and verdure imagined on its breast, and whilst with thee I roam through regions bright, Beneath kind love's serene and gladsome sky, A thousand happy things that seek the light, Till now in darkest shadow, forced to lie, 
up through the illumined waters nimbly run to show their forms and hues in the all-revealing sun. Singing thus, she fell asleep, and when her eyes were fast sealed in slumber, Phantasmion heard a shrill voice crying, Awake, young prince of Palmland, awake! He raised his head and saw Maldaril sitting on the floor, an urn by her side, a branch of red berries on her lap, her fingers wet with purple juice. The crown she lately wore was thrown aside. Her eyes shot fire, and Phantasmion knew that the face he now looked upon was the very face of the strange old man who told him of his mother's death. A shadowy form hovers aloft. It is the spirit of the poisoned child. Phantasmion remembers that swollen, spotted cheek as if he had seen it but yesterday. Beware, young prince of Pomland, the one spectre cries, and, unmoved at Maldoril's awful threats, with sullen eye and obstinate finger, keeps pointing to the purple berries that lie beside the urn. Which, murderous, exclaimed Phantasmion, starting up, but, while he strove to free his feet from the coverings of the couch, Maldoril stirred the cauldron till fumes filled the cave and entered every pore and inlet of the youth's body. He sank down again, and scarce had pressed the furry pillow when Zelneth met his eye. Zelneth, smiling in sleep, her head inclined on one ivory shoulder and her soft white arm extended over the skin of a black wolf. The charm resumed its power. The murderess and the ghastly spectre vanished from his sight, and, dreaming only of lilied meads, bright streams, and perfect loveliness, he lay in deep repose within the rugged cavern. End of Part 3 Chapter 4「3 Chapter 5 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 Chapter 5 Phantasmion is Disenchanted by Olula From the witch's cavern, subterranean passages conducted into a delicious garden, embosomed in the forest, and surrounded by a double fence of lofty trees. Here the prince found himself when he awoke in the morning. Bright wreaths of an acacia bower drooped over his head, flowers blushed, and streamlets glittered as far as the eye could reach. A splendid picture was hung out before him, and Zelneth, placed at a coy distance, appeared the very subject of the piece. Phantasmion sprang from his odorous couch, and approaching the damsel seemed to tread on air. No trace of the warning vision remained in his memory, and now that the charm had taken into its alliance the refreshment of sleep, he was transported with a still more exquisite delirium than on the preceding evening. He felt it to be his turn to speak, while Zelneth was speechless with happiness, drinking in his fluent love discourse, as if it were a rill which ever gratified but never removed the pleasurable thirst it excited, while to him this volubility seemed in itself an enjoyment and resembled the soft lapse of the brimming rivulet which wandered past his feet to visit a thousand flowery knots and odorous copses, Phantasmion scarce noticed anything steadfastly, or considered whence it arose, or what it betokened, but, sitting by the side of Zelneth, and pouring himself forth in admiration of her charms, he ever and anon caught glimpses of Fadeline's flower-like face, darting smiles from corners of the bower, dim with the shadow of clustered roses, while now and then her fingers came like a twinkling butterfly, and scattered over the head of the delighted maiden a shower of light petals, 
from the frailest and most transitory blossoms. Zelneth, Zonoth, Vedeline, nor anything but Phantasmion. She rose from her seat to fetch a well-filled urn, which had been placed in the arbor. It was the vessel which contained the poisoned juice, and the moment so long watched for by Maldoril seemed about to arrive. The sorceress leans forward over a leafy bough. Phantasmion's glance for a moment is diverted from the maid, and that prominent eyeball flashing amid the foliage brings dim recollections to his mind. But Maldoril sinks back to her hiding place, and the youth turns to gaze on Zelneth, who stands smiling before him with a crystal goblet in her left hand. Wilt thou drink once more, she said, and promise to be mine forever? Phantasmion threw himself on his knees, ready to utter vows of eternal love and faithfulness, having forgotten those he had made to Irene, as if they had been characters formed in ice, which a hot sun had melted away. At the same moment, his tongue was arrested, and the blood appeared to stagnate in his veins. The air had become piercing cold and filled with white vapor. The brook ceased to murmur and the birds to sing. The waters were congealed, the leaves and flowers wan and drooping, the branches encrusted with a hoary rhyme. But the eyes of Phantasmion were fixed on Zelneth. Motionless she stood, one arm raising aloft the urn from whose lip an icicle depended, the other holding the empty crystal goblet, now no longer grasped but glued to the powerless palm. She was frozen to the ground. The glowing carnation of her cheek had faded to palest lilac. A deathly blueness tinged her brow of pearl and crept over her bosom. Wreaths of frost curled around her stiffened jetty ringlets. Her arms looked brittle and crystalline, while those dark orbs that lately almost eluded the sight by their livesome motion had a dull shine upon them like eyes of glass and seemed fixed in their marble sockets. Phantasmion would have risen and approached the damsel, but strove in vain to move one step nearer to her statue-like form. His heart beat fearfully, but every other part of his frame was beginning to lose power and sensation. His head was fixed on one side, his knee clung to the earth and no longer perceived its coldness. The fingers of his extended hand were cramped into one and felt as if they touched each other through velvet. He seemed to be fast changing into a form of ice. On a sudden, the sky grew black. Showers of stony hail came rushing on between him and his fair companion. He was wrapped round about in a sheet of snow, while blasts, which he found it impossible to resist, carried him to the further end of the garden, prostrated the tall fence of trees with interwoven branches, and continued to impel him onwards for many a mile and many a league, till at length, when the wind lulled, he sank upon the open plain far beyond the forest of Nemorosa, his blood moving rapidly and his limbs stiff with exertion. Phantasmion had fallen under the shelter of massy walls overgrown with ivy. The wreck of a palace where Tigridius monarchs had dwelt from age to age. Here the husband of Maldoril and her son, Silvalad, had been treacherously murdered when Glandreth invaded the land, and Modra and her daughter, becoming enamored of the blood-stained hero, followed him as a voluntary captive. The two sons of Silvalad had been brought up by the widowed queen. One had perished in a far country, the other, whose name was Yolander, bore sway in the woodland fastnesses where his father had ruled before him, but was too wild and careless to attempt the recovery of his whole inheritance. The wind had relented, the sky was disclosing more and more of its blue dome, Snakes and lizards came forth to glitter in the sun, and the solitary bird that hides its nest under grey ruins sought food 
in the moistened herbage, enjoying, amid the desolation of that ancient abode, the pleasures of a dear though transient home. Still, the breeze lingered round Phantasmion, playing with his wet robe and gently shaking the particles of snow from his redundant locks. Plaintive sounds issued from different parts of the building, as if a penitent lover were uttering meek confessions mingled with regret, and from within the pile, some solemn instrument sent forth a deep, slow melody of former days. While it was yet proceeding, the youth heard a voice that seemed to be just above his head. Phantasmion, it whispered, what dost thou hear while faithful Irene wanders in Nemorosa? Soon afterwards, the same voice appeared to come from a higher point. It was accompanied with a noise of light wings fanning the air, and to the youth's anxious ear, it seemed to say, Phantasmion must seek Irene, while Glandreth conquers the land of palms. After these words were spoken, the solemn music swelled into a fuller tone, then sank into silence. Phantasmion started up and saw the pinnacles of the edifice gilded here and there by partial beams which struggled forth from amid disorderly heaps of dark vapor. Just beyond the battlements of a black tower, he beholds transparent pinions spread to their vast extent with the sun glittering through them. A moment afterwards they recede. Olula dives among the clouds on which those golden wings shed radiance. On she goes, sweeping the sky, as a shearer sweeps away the fleeces of the new shorn flock, and now she is indistinguishable from the mass that moves along with her, and now both she and the clouds themselves are gone, leaving the cope of heaven pure and resplendent, as if it were cut out of a single sapphire, through which a powerful sun was pouring its diffusive light. End of Part 3 Chapter 5 Part 3 Chapter 6 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 Chapter 6 Zelneth is carried to the Sylvan Palace, whither Phantasmion goes in search of Irene. The storm which followed that intense frost had beaten on the rigid form of Zelneth, unfelt, unseen. But now the charm was broken, the stony rocks fell loose, all gemmed with dewdrops gleaming in the soft sunlight, and even as thawing streams break forth into sound and motion, so the damsel moved and spoke once more, and sparkled with returning life. She roamed about the garden where Fadeline had revived the drooping flowers and breathed new vigor into their languid stems. The fairy looked at her pitifully from amid the leaves and fondly whispered, Kings shall sue for Zelneth, and Zelneth shall cause the ardent lover to forget his first love. The maiden heard not, heeded not, but continued her weeping, or murmured laments like these. By the storm invaded, ere thy arch was wrought, rainbow, thou hast faded, like a gladsome thought, and ne'er mayst shine aloft, in all earth's colors fraught. Insect tranced forever, in thy pendant bed, which the breezes sever from its fragile thread, thou ne'er shall burst thy cell and crumpled pinion spread. Lily born and nourished, mid the waters cold, where thy green leaves flourished on the sunburnt mould, how canst thou rear thy stem and sallow buds unfold? Snowy clouds suspended o'er the orb of light, with its radiance blended, ne'er to glisten bright, it sinks, and thou growest black beneath the wings of night. Mulderil had been stricken to the earth by the rapid tempest, and there she lay muttering and making hideous faces. The green-vested fairy gleamed past her as a lizard glances past a fallen log. 
then pointing with dewy finger at Zelnef. Maldaril, she said, when wilt thou weep again? Ah, thou art old and sapless, past the luxury of tears. A harsh voice uttering the name of Irene caused Zelnef to raise her head, and looking up she saw the dwarf Herva seated beside the ancient woman, his sharp visage turned towards her, and each flat paddle arm spread out. "'How long since?' cried Maldoril angrily. "'Yes, Termorn,' said he. "'I was about to climb the high wall that girds Yolander's domain when, lo, the damsel Irene, armed with bow and quiver, appeared on the top of it. She saw not me, as I crouched beneath, but leaped over my head on the soft moss, then, swift as a row, she darted through the wood. Zelneth turned away, wringing her hands, for she gathered that Irene had escaped from Yolander, though she could not catch all that the dwarf muttered. "'And where hast thou been loitering?' cried Maldoril fiercely, but the next moment her thoughts were engaged by the other dwarf who came limping in with open mouth to tell his tale. Mistress, he said, she is at the goatherd's cottage, and her father is there also. How? cried Maldoril. The palsied king, Albinian. Even so, replied the dwarf. Strong love, or perhaps the approach of death, counteracted his disease so far that he stole away from the palace, followed Irene's footsteps, and this morning came to thy house on the hill inquiring for his daughter. I guided him to the boiling fount. Right, cried Maldoril. He has cumbered the earth long enough. And how did he escape? He was saved by his daughter, who had got away from the Sylvan Palace, replied Swartho, and took her way across the hill, doubtless because it was the shortest and best known to her. Entering the stony dell, she espied Albinian, lying just under the mound of the well, where he had sunk down exhausted. The maiden rescued him from that dangerous place, dragging him away in her arms. But if the goat herd had not come within call, she would scarce have reached the bottom of the hill by this time. Now both are under his roof, and Albinian seems to be on his deathbed. Didst thou follow them? said the witch. I should have done so, the dwarf answered, but no sooner did the goatherd relieve Irene of Albinian's weight than she took the bow from her shoulder, an arrow from the case, and made this wound in my heel. The body of Swartho puffed up as he spoke, and the flaming circle of his dilated eye appeared to grow wider and redder. Coward! exclaimed Maldoril with a laugh. Thou shalt have a worse wound in thy face presently. Nay, mistress, hear what I did further, replied the dwarf. After a while I repaired to the cottage garden, and there learned from a boy who has lived with the goatherd ever since his wife and child perished together in a burning shower on the mountain, that Irene will be close to the cavern this evening. I know the exact spot, whither she means to repair, a patch of berry-bearing plants just under the hollow sycamore, in which a squirrel has made his nest. She has been once there already, to gather fruit for her father, and ere it is dark, she will come again for a fresh supply. Maldoril arose. Well, get ye both into the cavern, she said, and be ready when I call. The dwarves retired, and their ancient mistress approached Zelneth, who sate upon the ground with her streaming locks around her, silently watering the turf with tears. Olula brought the frost and raised the storm, said Maldaril. She favors Glandreth and hates his enemies. For his sake she persecutes the son of Dorimont, and she will separate him from Irene as well as from thee. Take courage, I will devise a plan. Away, cried the damsel scornfully. Thou hast neither skill nor foresight. Why didst thou bring us into the garden under the open sky? 
Olula could have worked us no ill in the cavern. Maldoril's eye lightened at this taunt, but Zelneth saw not its vengeful flash and relapsed into silence. Imperceptibly, however, as a snow shower changes into rain, her sullen mood relented, and Maldoril found an opportunity to propose her plan. Irene, she said, is at the goat herd's cottage. Where Phantasmion will find her, cried Zelneth impetuously. He shall never find her again, replied the witch, if thou wilt consent to a brief disguise and brave a slight peril. Zelneth fixed her brightening eyes on her evil counsellor. Thou hast some skill, she said, while the last tear fell from her cheek. Tell me what peril, what disguise thou art thinking of. Motherell brought from the cavern a panther's skin. It is but to dress thyself in this gay garb, she said. Then to sit crouching on the bough of a tree hard by here, and when Irene comes under it and is busily engaged in gathering berries, suddenly to show thyself and leap down by her side. When she attempts to fly, thou and the dwarfs shall intercept her return to the cottage, and I, meantime, will beckon her into the cavern, whence she shall not come out, till she consents to marry Yulander. My kinsmen shall meet her here, and thou shalt repair to the Sylvan Palace, where Phantasmion will be sure to go in search of Irene. She sent me to the island, murmured Zelneth, to release one who was standing by her side at that moment. I will take good care that she shall not escape, added Maldoril. Thou shalt see me run out with a chafing dish in my hand to stupefy her senses by the smoke of burning herbs. But come, either reject the scheme or prepare to do thy part in it, for she will be here presently. Zelneth took up the skin without knowing how to put it on, but Maldoril adjusted it so well that the lady's speaking eyes looked through holes which had formerly contained the bestial ones of a panther. Strangely now, indeed, they sparkled under a shaggy brow and upright ears, which the original wearer could move and bend at will. Zelneth in her childish days had been wont to follow the squirrels up many a well-branched tree. She loved to wind her way among the boughs, overcoming a series of delightful dangers, till she could place her fairy foot betwixt the topmost fork, proud to find herself at such a dizzy height, and glad to have in prospect the pleasing adventure of descent. But such sports of the vacant mind and lithe limbs had fallen into disuse, and though the sycamore was easy to climb, slowly and timorously she crept up to her lurking place, and still more violently her heart palpitated when she saw Irene approach with her basket and kneel down to collect the fruit which grew on tiny bushes under the tree. While the eyes of the gentle princess were busily engaged upon the ground, those of Zelneth, anxious and fearful, were gazing at her from above. The boughs shook as with trembling limbs she began to creep forward, after the manner of a wild cat, and all the crisp leaves and branches made a rustling noise. Irene started, and looking up espied the pretended panther peeping down from the bough whence she had scarce summoned resolution to spring. Unhappy Zelneth, she had not reckoned on her cousin's newly acquired skill in archery, nor on that matchless bow, the amorous chieftain's gift, which now hung at her shoulder. On seeing the damsel prepare to shoot, she uttered a loud cry and strove to turn about, but ere she could escape, the arrow was in her side. Irene, hearing Yolander's voice from a distance, stayed not to examine the false panther, which had fallen to the ground, 
but glided swiftly through the wood while the dwarfs, who were stationed to prevent her return, panic-stricken at what they had witnessed, and at the approach of the royal huntsman, crouched among the brushwood, and Mulderil, her form half-hidden by wreaths of smoke from the censer in her hand, stood laughing at the entrance of the cave, till at last she fell upon the ground, overpowered by the fumes she had heedlessly inhaled. Meantime, Yolander, who had been roaming in search of his fair fugitive, drew nigh the patch of berry-bearing plants, and there found Zelneth prostrate on the ground with the skin of a wild beast covering the lower part of her body, for by this time she had freed her head and neck from the cumbrous disguise. Astonished both by her beauty and the strange state in which he found her, the youth alighted from his horse and asked what savage hand had inflicted that wound in her side whence the blood was flowing. Selneth pointed to the panther's skin still hanging about her feet, then sank into a swoon, her disengaged arm falling powerless on the shaggy spoils. The chieftain forgot Irene while he gazed on her fair countenance. He gently removed the skin, placed the fainting damsel on his horse, and conveyed her with all care and tenderness to his princely home. But though the travellers went at so leisurely a pace, that the night was far gone when they arrived there, the motion of the horse inflamed the lady's wound, which would soon have healed but for this aggravation. Fever seized the hapless maid, and Yolander found with sorrow that his love had proved as injurious to Zelneth as it had been irksome and grievous to Irene. Not long after, the chief of Nemorosa reached his mansion, Phantasmion arrived there also. The influence of the magic draught over his spirit had been destroyed by Olula's counteracting spell. The mist dispersed, and Irene's image again shone forth in sunny splendor, while that of Zelneth, late so radiant, showed like the vanishing moon with her weak, superfluous light. But the last words of Olula had cast him into a reverie. Glandreth had fallen by his hand. How then should Glandreth conquer the land of palms? Had the voice a hidden meaning, or no meaning at all? He had heard that Glandreth formerly sued for the hand of Irene's mother, that Olula loved the bold and beautiful chieftain, and made a solemn vow to be his friend and minister till Anthemina's dying day. And now that they too are dead, thought he, perchance Olula befriends Phantasmion, or it may be that, like the winds of heaven, she follows no settled course to sport with human hopes and purposes her only plan. Raising his eyes from the ground, he saw Maldoril's mansion upon the brow of the conical mountain, just visible in the distance and thither he resolved to go and inquire again for Irene. On reaching the gate, Phantasmion made the rocks resound with his loud summons, and ere the echoes had ceased, the porter with his grisly beard stood before him. "'Hast thou seen any other maiden?' cried the youth, "'beside her who went to the woods with thy mistress.' None since she was here, the porter replied. But just before she arrived, there came a shepherdess, in company with a man of high degree. Her face was shaded with a hood, and she went forth alone, having a bucket and a bottle in her hand. Surprised to see the way she took, I watched her while she ascended that steep upward path. And on she went, so wondrous fleet and graceful, that when she gained yon cloudy summit, I thought within myself, is this a shepherdess or an angel going back into the sky? Phantasmion hastened up the steep track to which the servant of Maldoril pointed, and wound along the mountain till he met an old man who was driving on goats before him. He stopped when the youth approached his flock. Thou art a stranger by thy garb, said he, 
Dost thou know of the boiling fount and the volcanic fires which oft break forth on that part of the mountain to which thou art proceeding? Daily I climb this hill. And didst thou lately see a damsel here? The youth inquired, in the habit of a shepherdess. Yes, truly, answered he, and I meant to give her a warning, but she waved me off with her hand and sped along so fast that even my goats could scarce have followed her. She entered the stony dell, which lies beyond the rocks, and there, no doubt, she perished. Phantasmion rushed away, passed the rocks, and entered the dell where the fountain was playing. He stood motionless at the entrance of the hollow till the water subsided, then approached the mound, and an icy chill seized his heart when he beheld a leathern bottle petrified on the edge of the well, with a bucket and chain lying close beside it. Believing that Irene had been overtaken by the force of the waters and had so lost her life, he sought about in desperation, expecting to find her fair body among the other petrifactions, but, seeing no trace of any such thing, he imagined that she had fallen into the well, and lying down on the edge of it, resolved there to remain and await destruction. Many times he was tempted to throw himself into the dark abyss, and, when he called on the name of Irene, he thought that fierce voices answered him. In this condition, he remained till the moon rose and threw her cold beams over the stony dell, when, turning his eye once again toward the bucket, he descried the steel point of a petrified arrow shining a little beyond it. Instantly, it struck him that this shaft had fallen from the quiver of some huntsman, perhaps Eulander himself, and that he might have borne Irene away, either alive or dead. Roused by this thought, he started up, hurried down the hill, and about daybreak knocked at the goatherd's cottage. The host of Albinian and Irene came out with his finger on his lips. There is a dying man in my house, quoth he. I may not ask thee to enter. Thy steed has been taken care of. Thou wilt find him in yonder shed beside the marigolds. The goatherd having re-entered, Phantasmion found his good horse, which recognized him with signs of pleasure, but so greatly exhausted was he that, instead of mounting, he sank down by his side and slept with his feet among the marigolds, and his head on the neck of the gentle beast. Ere he awoke at midday, one of Yolander's train came nigh and stopped his horse in admiration of the young monarch and his goodly steed, whose quick eye seemed to say, Pass on, I pray thee, and disturb him not. The huntsman's cheek was fresh and glowing, while that of the slumberer looked pale amid the sunshine and the gleams of his golden bed. Art thou, Yolander, said Phantasmion, starting up. I would I were, the youth replied with a smile. Not for his crown and palace, but for the sake of a most fair damsel, worthy of both, by whose side he is kneeling. Wilt thou guide me to that palace? cried the young king of Palmland, his burning cheeks and scintillating eyes turned full on the huntsman. It is my home, the youth answered, and I can show thee the shortest road to it. Phantasmion quickly mounted. He and his guide went at full speed, whenever the road permitted, and ere the light began to fade, he entered the abode of Yolander. End of Part 3, Chapter 6《By Sarah Cole Ridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 7 Phantasmion leaves the Sylvan Palace, and Zelneth receives succor from Fadeline. Phantasmion demanded to see the chief of Nemorosa, and was conducted to a spacious apartment 
the couches and seats of which were covered with brindled or spotted skins, the walls with horns of deer and rock goats fancifully arranged. There, under a high canopy adorned with branching antlers, lay the wounded Zelneth, her limbs motionless, her eyes closed in death-like languor, while the young chieftain was raising her from the couch in his arms and trying, by a thousand assiduities, to elicit signs of life and looks of recognition. So a child, grieved to see his rarest flower, the milk-white foxglove, with its whole spire of bells, newly blown, extended on the earth, sets himself to support the crushed stem which his own heedless foot has beaten down. But all in vain, for, leaning on the prop, it hastens to decay, no longer able to imbibe the dews that fall around it, withered by that sun which lately nourished its firm stalk and bursting blossoms. Yolander saw not the young king of Palmland till he had entered the apartment and stood midway between the door and the couch, gazing intently on Zelneth. But when he did at last perceive his presence, the chieftain started, uttering an exclamation, roused by which the damsel opened her eyes and, seeing Phantasmion, leaped wildly from the couch with crimsoning cheek and eyes of delirious brightness, but, her strength soon deserting her, she fell forward, looking still more lifeless than when she lay on the couch. Upreared in the arms of the sylvan chieftain, Yolander looked on with sullen surprise. While Phantasmion carried Zelnes to the couch and laid her on the tiger skins with which it was covered. Who art thou? he said. Art thou the brother of this maiden? I am bound to her by no near ties, replied Phantasmion with haste. She came to greet me as one who had received hospitality at her father's house. Why then hast thou come hither, rejoined the chieftain, breaking in upon my privacy without leave asked? I came in search of another, replied the youth in some confusion. I came to inquire for this fair damsel's kinswoman, the Princess Irene. Irene, exclaimed Yolander, she it was that wounded this lovely maid. I found her bleeding in the midst of the forest, and she accuses Irene of the cruel deed. That name and one other, inarticulately murmured, are the only words she has spoken since she entered here. Irene, accused of a cruel deed, ejaculated Phantasmion. Here is more witchery, more wickedness, and deceit. The chieftain held up his finger, then, pointing to the maid. Look there, he cried, in a low, stifled voice. Vex not her parting spirit by violent words. Phantasmion held his peace, and drawing nigh to look on Zelneth, he felt assured that her soul had abandoned its fair tenement for ever. The crisp and glossy tresses that flowed to her waist seemed yet instinct with life. In all their wonted beauty they curled around the full white arm that lay so dead and motionless by her side. But mournful was the stillness of her long black eyelashes, which seemed now laid to rest for ever on that smooth cheek whence every lifelike tint had vanished, as the warm light of morning fades from a snow-clad hill, leaving it as coldly white as pure and polished marble. Yolander wept aloud. Phantasmion mused in sorrowful silence. Till now he had never looked on Zelneth as on a bright flower, doomed to wither, but had felt as if she were like the glittering stars that shine unaltered, while a thousand roses bloom and perish. At last he recollected what befell him in the house of Magnart. Perchance the damsel is but entranced, he said. I myself once lay thus for many an hour. Yolander raised his head, and starting from his knees, approached Phantasmion. Didst thou lie motionless? he cried. 
Was thy breath suspended? Were thy cheeks as pale as these? Antasman poured balm into the heart of Yolander by the answers he gave to all his eager questions, and soon the chieftain called to mind how his ancient kinswoman Maldaril had cured one of his train who lay insensible after a wound received from a wild boar. The two youths were now standing together by the couch, the hand of Phantasmion locked in that of Yolander who frankly told all he knew of Irene, how he loved and lost her, and how he was on the way to consult Maldaril in the cavern concerning the fair princess, when his thoughts were suddenly absorbed by the distress and beauty of Selneth. But now, says he, I will go forthwith to fetch the queen of Tigridia. She hath great skill in medicine, and in other arts too. Me she loves well, and, at my entreaty, she will restore this maid, and perchance discover to thee the retreat of Irene. Right glad was Phantasmion to accept Elander's intercession, with the one whose evil powers were not to be averted by sword and spear, he zealously offered to keep watch by the body of Selneth, and to defend it, with the danger of his life, against a host of her kinsmen, should they come to take it away. Having accepted his courtesy, Yolander kissed the damsel's cold hand as it lay upon the couch, and sighed to see it no longer withdrawn as heretofore. Then, with looks of deep anxiety, he hastened away. After his departure, Phantasmion read these lines, which he found traced on a tablet, but whether addressed to Zelneth or Irene seemed uncertain. I thought by tears thy soul to move, since smiles had proved in vain, but I from thee nor smiles of love nor tears of pity gain. Now, now I could not smile perforce, a sceptred queen to please, yet tears will take the accustomed course, till time their fountain freeze. My life is dedicate to thee, my service wholly thine. But what fair fruit can grace the tree, till suns vouchsafe to shine? Thou art my sun, thy looks are light, O oh, cast me not in shade. Beam forth, ere summer takes its flight, and all my honours fade. When, torn by sudden gusty flaw, the fragile harp lies mute, its tenderest tones the wind can draw from many another lute. But when this beating heart lies still, each chord relaxed in death, what other shall so deeply thrill, so tremble at thy breath? But the dark hours came on, no lamp shed light on the silent face of Selneth, when a train of damsels entered from the garden, with lighted tapers, and baskets of night-blowing flowers in their hands. They sang a dirge over the maiden, then covered her body with those blossoms of greenish-white or palest yellow, stuck their tapers around the canopy, and slowly departed, leaving the chamber filled with an aromatic fragrance. Phantasmion had retired to the further end of the apartment, where the horns of an elk threw their wide shadow on the marble floor, and from that station he watched the mourners while they performed their gentle rites, then softly stole away. At last the door was closed, but one of the train yet lingered under the canopy, her flower basket resting on the couch. Phantasmion, as he drew forward, beheld her countenance by the light of the tapers, which threw a tender gleam over the pale flowers, the still features of Zelneth, and the bright aerial visage that shone above them. Fadeline, cried the prince, can Zelneth be restored? And oh, where is Irene? Leave Zelneth in my care, she answered, and seek thou the domain of Melodine, there to find and rescue her that is lost for thy sake. Phantasmion was about to reply with eagerness, but the nightly exhalations of so many blossoms overpowered his senses, and he sank on the floor, 
motionless and pale as the fair damsel who lay stretched upon the couch. No sooner had he become thus entranced than his guardian spirit stood beside him. Fadeline, she exclaimed, is it not enough to have deprived Phantasmion of the pitcher? Wherefore hast thou dealt with him thus? The soft fairy smiled on Potentilla, and with words and tones like the warm breeze that unbinds the frozen earth, she persuaded her not only to forgive what was past, but to make a compact with herself, whereby all whom they both loved should in the end be gainers. Potentilla called for her light car, drawn by dragonflies, and having increased both to a convenient size by magic power, conveyed away the fainting prince through the murky air, while Fadeline remained alone by the side of Zelness. As a plant that seems irrecoverably withered revives at the first shower, swells out its flaccid leaves, and stretches them forth to catch the kindly moisture, so was Zelneth restored by the salutary dews and airs which the kind spirit shed around her. Gradually, a tender bloom suffused her cheek. Gentle breathing returned. The damsel raised herself from the couch, holding out her hand as if to welcome someone, while her lids were yet fast sealed, then fell back upon her pillow in deep, refreshing slumber. But when a thousand flowers were opening their soft eyes upon the dawn, those of Zelneth were unclosed, and up she sprang, scattering on the floor the blossoms which had been so plentifully strewed on her seeming corpse, they were now drooping while she was upraised in health and lifesome beauty. Alas, Phantasmion had disappeared, and all the apartment was silent and solitary till a fawn ran in from the open door, through which, ere the cock crew, Potentilla had carried him away. She went forth and caught a glimpse of Fadeline, who was just entering a tufted grove with a chalice in her hand. Zelneth followed, and, kneeling on the ground, under the embowered branches, besought her to declare why Phantasmion had left her side and whither he was gone. A slender voice came from amid the myrtles, and it spoke thus, Phantasmion left Zelneth to seek Irene, and shall I never more regain his heart? The maid exclaimed, again the soft voice, breathing gales of perfume, gently but clearly answered in these words. Henceforth, Phantasmion's heart will never swerve from Irene. Zelneth continued to listen, while tears chased one another down her upraised face, but the only voice she now heard was that of a turtle cooing to his mate, with soft notes long dwelt upon in the depth of the wood. Then she strove to turn her heart against the bright youth of Palmland, and grieved to find how much more love than pride had mastery there. While her mind was full of such thoughts, she heard a slight rustling. Something had fallen from the branches beside the place where she sat, and straight before her she espied the picture of Penzalimer, with its eyes looking at hers, and seeming to convey in their passionate melancholy an expression of reproach. From the hour that it fell from her lap when she first beheld Phantasmion, Zelneth had scarce bestowed a thought on this idol of her childhood, which Anthemina, when her heart was estranged from Penzalimer, had carelessly hung around her baby neck. Now she took it up by the chain of pearls to which it was fastened, and sighed as she gazed on the well-known lineaments for the free heart and enamored fancy of former times, when she rejected many an unpleasing suitor for the sake, as she loved to imagine, of the noble Penzelimer. Zelneth raised her eyes on being accosted in a shrill voice 
and shuddered to behold Motheril approaching her with a cup. Yolander brought me to thy couch, said the ancient queen, where we found plenty of withered flowers, but no entranced maiden, and soon my young kinsman, rushing to the door, beheld thee, bound lightly over the lawn. I could have restored thee to health, had thy malady continued, and even now I would have thee drink this cup, lest it should return with the evening dews. Zelneth suspected that the liquor presented to her was some of that which had been prepared in the cavern, and that Modril's design was to make her return the chieftain's passion. Nevertheless, she took the cup and slowly drank, with her eyes fixed on the features of Penzalimar. Scarce had the magic draught pervaded her frame than the portrait assumed a new aspect. It seemed fairer, nobler than Phantasmion himself. Love for the king of Palmland seemed absorbed into a larger emotion, as the last wave is swelled by those which have gone before. Her visions of childhood rose again in all their keen aerial colors. The realities she had since experienced melted into indistinctness. Their forms were gone, but still their glow remained, and filled the atmosphere of memory with warmth and golden light. Yolander advanced from amid the trees, where he had hitherto been shrouded, and seeing her face bright with smiles, when she returned his salutation, he inwardly rejoiced, vowing eternal gratitude to Maldoril, by whose endeavors he fully believed that Zelneth looked upon him thus. Formerly, his enamored looks and words, which the maid lacked strength to repel, seemed to hasten her spirit's flight. Now they fell upon her occupied mind, like raindrops on marble, which glitters amid the shower and remains unsoftened. Both were equally possessed with gladsome fancies, and confident in the success of their hopes when they rode into the forest ere noonday, followed by a train of huntsmen. Zelneth indulging her steed in all his graceful vagaries, and Yulander fondly hoping that for long years to come she would thus disport herself by his side. Kings shall sue for Zelneth, and for her the ardent lover shall forget his first love. Fadeline breathed this prophecy once more in Zelneth's ear as she passed under the branches. Now it was no longer unheard or unheeded. The damsel applied it to Penzalimer, and joyfully expected that he would soon appear to rescue her from Durance. End of Part 3 Chapter 7Part 3 Chapter 8 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 8 Phantasmion Enters the Sunless Valley. A night and a day had elapsed since Phantasmion left the domain of Yolander when, roused from his trance, he found himself descending through the sky. Then he sat upright and saw right before him, fanning the twilight air, the gauzy wings of dragonflies, while those of Potentilla, who stood upright on the seat of the car, were playing above his head. The moon had not yet risen, but when he came to the ground and leaped upon the turf, he perceived a shining circlet in the sky, and had no sooner looked upon it then it began to descend, widening, swelling, and brightening as it sank. The tract where Phantasmion stood first glimmered, then gleamed, and lastly shone with more than noonday splendor in many-colored light, while gradually the features of the scene stole upon his eye, and soon he recognized the skeleton palace, 
where owls peeped forth from bowers of ivy, the ruined hall with its watery floor and rose-crowned window, and the wild pleasure ground in all its flush of blossoms. The deserted palace and the space in front of it were encircled by a vast hoop of cold flame produced by innumerable fireflies. Phantasmion turned to Potentilla, who was leaning back in the car, over which her wings reclined, and smiling at his looks of wonder. "'Wilt thou go with me?' she said, "'to rescue a lost maiden from the sunless valley?' "'Instantly,' cried Phantasmion. "'Wherefore do we tarry?' "'Recruit thy strength,' replied the fairy, "'with what is provided in the car. "'Then drink from this vial which Fadeline gave me for thy use.' It will ward off the drowsy influences of Melodine's abode. Phantasmion obeyed, and while his eyes were brightening with the effect of the flower fairy's gift, Potentilla from the seat of the car touched his head and shoulders with her wand, then waved him after her as she soared aloft. The next moment, he was flying through the air, his head surrounded with a halo of intense light his dragonfly wings and whole body beaming with a keen luster which varied from chrysolite to vivid green, passing off into the deepest azure and thence into amethystine purple. Potentilla flew on before, with the wings and radiant head of a lantern fly, and the clouds of luminous insects followed. As the whole mass went undulating along, they looked like a fiery river, flowing athwart the sky, and so proceeded till, just as the moon rose, they overpassed the wall of rock which bounded Melodine's domain. This region, said Potentilla, by the spells of the enchantress who dwells here, is perpetually hidden from the sun's light. The whole valley is girt on every side by rugged mountains, and during the day it is shrouded by an opaque fog. Phantasmion followed his guide above the black vapors, to a point right over the center of the valley, while the fireflies high overhead appeared once more like a circular constellation. Thence he saw the pitchy cloud splitting in the middle, and shrinking more and more on every side, till at last it was heaped in huge scrolls on the mountain tops. While the moon and stars in full splendor were thus revealed to waking eyes below, Phantasmion beheld their beams reflected from the enlightened veil, from lily fields and groves of gleaming foliage, pastures whitened with straying flocks, and one wide sheet of water. As he descended he heard no sound but that of the owls, hooting to one another from yew trees and ivy-mantled rocks, the sonorous notes of those at hand receiving clear but slender responses from others at a distance. Coming yet lower, he began to catch the nightingale's upper notes, and next the sound of flowing waters and the gurgling of brooks. Potentilla waved her wand, and the luminous procession, which was now following in the form of a serpent, quenched its radiance, and became suddenly as black as ink. Phantasmion underwent the same change, and followed his guide, who alone retained her light to the abode of Melodine. The enchantress was busily employed in gathering herbs, on which the moonbeams rested, seeking them by the side of a rivulet which wandered through a meadow silvered with white flowers. A damsel, delicately fair and slender, with flaxen locks that floated to her taper waist, was following Melodine, and leading by a silver chain, a milk-white stag, the hoofs and horns of which appeared to be also of silver. On his back, the deer carried a pannier, filled with flowers and herbs, which the damsel received from the enchantress and deposited there. Thus they proceeded, moving contrary to the course of the brook, till they arrived at a rocky knoll, where the same rivulet formed a little cataract, splitting like a raveled skein, into diverse shining threads, here gliding in clear laps over a smooth-faced stone, there skipping from rock to rock enveloped in foam, here narrow as a spindle, 
there spreading like a garment puffed out by the wind. Melodine was stooping over the united streams when Potentilla ranged her regions right above the meadow and watery knoll. The head of the enchantress was crowned with white poppies, and a shining veil thrown back from her face covered her kneeling form. Surprised at the shade which darkened the rivulet and its flowery banks, she looked straight up to the sky, disclosing a face of goodly features but black as ebony. Gazing thus, she beheld Phantasmion all irradiated with purple light descending under the cloud, and in an instant afterwards, the pitchy mass became a flaming pavilion. Then, blinded and amazed, she fell upon the ground, covering her face with her veil and muttering disjointed spells. Without power to repeat any at full length, Phantasmion alighted on the hillock, and Potentilla, hovering over his head, called on Melodine to deliver up the damsel whom she kept a captive in her sunless domain. She, meantime, was hasting away with a white stag, and soon entered a cypress grove, through which the rivulet held its way. Melodine hesitated to promise obedience, but when the air blackened with swarms of stinging insects and the ground with locusts, she consented to yield up the captive maid, and to conduct her to the deserted palace through the pass whereby she entered the valley. No sooner was this promise given than the locusts rose into the air. Potentilla secured Melodine by chains which were hidden under her glittering raiment, and with which she was wont to bind her victims. This being done, the whole swarm flew away along with the other insects, till they disappeared in the distance. Phantasmion had no sooner witnessed the submission of Melodine than he pursued the damsel into the dark wood. As he rushed along, casting phosphoric splendor on the somber foliage around, the nightingales hushed their songs, and the owls shrank away, letting down the curtains of their prominent eyes. At last he obtained sight of the damsel. She, after flitting on before him for some time, being now unable to go any further, stood in the pathway, leaning on the white stag who had suited his space to that of the lady, and restrained his steps when he saw that her powers of flight were exhausted. The damsel clung to her mild companion, hiding her face against his neck, till the pursuer, having arrived where she stood, took her hand and gently cried, Look up, my fair one, it is Phantasmion. At these words, he withdrew the dazzling radiance which streamed from his whole person, leaving his head only encircled with a diadem of softened rays. Then the lady raised her face, and Phantasmion saw that it was Lukoya, the sister of Zelneth. Ill-fated maid, she had drunk the oblivious draught of Melodine, had not only forgotten her parents and pleasant home, but ceased to pine for the noble stranger whose image had occupied her soul, a beautiful poison tree that spread abroad its glistering boughs and blighted every other growth. But now Phantasmion's illumined face, radiant with love and beauty, suddenly cast a flood of light on forms and hues of memory which magic power had obscured, but never obliterated. Again she loves. Again her stilled bosom is roused to emotion, and, full of tears and blushes, she once more hides her face on the stag's neck. Phantasmion himself was overwhelmed with trouble and perplexity. Lukoya's heart he had never cared to fathom, but he now suspected that she, and not Irene, was the lost maiden whom he had been sent to deliver. "'Hast thou not found the daughter of Albinian?' he cried, turning to Potentilla, as she came through the grove, leading the sullen Melodine by her chain. Oh, tell me whither to go in search of her. Seek not here for the lovely princess, she replied, but free Lukoya from captivity, and Fadeline will lend her aid to make Irene thine. What power has Fadeline? cried Phantasmion, and why must I do her behest? Hast thou forgotten the silver pitcher? Potentilla replied, Without Fadeline's good will, thou canst never obtain the hand of her whom thou lovest. 
doubtless Yulander will be sent to rescue my lost maiden, exclaimed the youth. Nay, replied the fairy, Yulander cares for no one now but dark-eyed Zelneth. Lukoya had been weeping silently while the stag looked in her face with eyes full of tenderness. Phantasmion even fancied he saw a tear glisten there, and that he had seen that countenance before, if these were not illusions of his dazzled sight. But, at Zelneth's name, the maid looked up with an inquiring glance. "'Knowest thou aught of my sister?' she said. "'Zelneth went to seek for thee in the forest of Nemorosa,' the youth replied. "'There she was wounded by an arrow, and now lies, I fear, in evil plight at the house of the young chief Yolander. When Lukoya heard this, her heart was oppressed by a crowd of sad emotions, and throwing herself on her knees before Phantasmion. "'Take me hence, I beseech thee,' she cried. "'I will not keep thee long upon the road, but travel night and day to reach my home.' Phantasmion declared that he was ready to conduct the damsel whither she desired to go. He raised her from the earth and placed her on the back of the stag. Melodine showed the way to the borders of a lake, and Phantasmion followed, leading Lukoya's gentle steed by the silver chain. End of Part 3, Chapter 8、three, chapter nine of Phantasmion By Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 9 Phantasmion Rescues Lukoya from Captivity. Having reached the banks of the wide sheet of water which Phantasmion had seen from on high, the company entered a mother of pearl boat which was drawn by a team of swans, a full-grown pair in front of the vessel, then three yokes of younger ones, each couple being smaller than that behind, while a single tiny signet floated on before. Doves fastened to the stern by silken cords and studs of diamonds fluttered round the gleaming skiff and hastened its progress while they lulled the air with their downy pinions. The firefly constellation was reflected, together with the moon, on the calm waters, forming now a belt across her disk, now a ring, which enclosed and shone beyond it. White peacocks spread their snowy trains over the dark foliage that overhung the lake, white cormorants occupied the rocks, and alabaster images of herons cast their still reflections on the pool. A tiger emerging from the recesses of the wood came to drink the cool wave, after sleeping in his lair during the close heat of the darksome day, and he too was colorless and gleaming as a ghost. Anon, a white bird of paradise rose from the trees and flew with slow undulating motion over the lake, first crossing the moon's bright image, then sinking amid blossoms downy and drooping as her own light plumage, like a snowflake descending into a wreath of snow. The tiger was drinking at the end of a little promontory as the skiff passed by. A reflection on the water made him look up, when beholding the youth's illumined visage, he suddenly rushed back again into the depths of the grove. The company in the vessel were all silent and thoughtful. Lukoya's fair stag lay beside her feet. Potentilla sate at the helm with Melodine's chain in her hand, while the captive crouched beneath her ebon face bowed forward, Phantasmion leaning over the prow, cast such bright gleams upon the waters that the silver-scaled fishes leaped up, attracted by a stronger light than had ever penetrated their liquid haunts before. The pensive eyes of Lukoya were bent upon the youth's averted face. She longed not for green fields and sunshine, but would fain have dwelt with him in that gleaming vale for ever. Melodine drew nigh the stag and would have rested her head upon his lily side, 
but when he shrank away, she leaned against the edge of the boat and began to murmur a soft melody. The tone of her voice was inexpressibly sweet, and such was her power that it seemed to proceed from the woods and waters and all places except from the skiff. For a time her words were inaudible, but at last Phantasmion ceased to watch the leaping fishes and listened unconsciously to these numbers. Blessed is the tarn, which towering cliffs o'er shade, which, cradled deep within the mountain's breast, nor voices loud, nor dashing oars invade, yet e'en the tarn enjoys no perfect rest, for oft the angry skies her peace molest, with them she frowns, gives back the lightning's glare, then rages wildly in the troubled air. This calmer lake, which potent spells protect, lies dimly slumbering through the fires of day, and when yon skies, with chaste resplendence decked, shine forth in all their stateliest array, oh, then she wakes to glitter bright as they, and view the face of heaven's benignant queen, still looking down on hers with a smile serene. What cruel cares the maiden's heart assail, who loves but fears no deep-felt love to gain, or, having gained it, fears that love will fail. My power can soothe to rest her wakeful pain, till none but calm delicious dreams remain, and, while sweet tears her easy pillow steep, she yields that dream of bliss to ever welcome sleep. While the strain proceeded, a pleasing stupor stole over Phantasmion, in spite of the antidote supplied by Fadeline, he began to dream with his eyes open and beheld the face of Irene in that of Lucoya. He fancied himself on the black lake and the radiance of the moon seemed to his eyes the same soft sunlight which had shone upon his last interview with the island princess. Potentilla had been busily plying her pinions and broke the silence of night with a continuous hum which seemed to tell of open flowers and glancing sunbeams. Now her wings of gauze hung sleepily down, her lamp languished, one hand dropped the helm, the other resigned the chain, and bending forward she nodded over the stern. Then Melodine raised her head, and fixing her eyes upon Phantasmion's face, continued her melodious incantations accompanied by the noise of downy wings and of the gliding vessel. Meanwhile, as she waved her hand, a mist gradually rose all around the skiff, and on its silvery tissue the rays of the moon painted a vivid rainbow, which rested on either side among the darksome groves and shady waters, while, betwixt the arch, an island, and the great towers of an ancient castle appeared to loom through the vapory veil. Then, Phantasmion dreamed that all which had passed, since he plighted his faith to Irene under the sunny rainbow, was but a dream. He took from his bosom her glossy ringlet, which had been twined with rubies, to form a crown for his brow. And placing it on Lucoya's head, while he whispered vows of changeless love, he bade her wear it for his sake till she was queen of Palmland. Melodine looked earnestly at Lucoya, with her finger on her lips, and entreated her, in low-breathed strains of melody, to bear at least a silent part in this deception. And, if the maiden loved Phantasmion while his countenance was unimpassioned, how still more lovable did he now appear, when his looks and tones expressed the deepest tenderness. But her spirit was free from magic influence, and, Having just recovered from the treacherous spell, she was less subject to its power. Never, she said, shall Phantasmion, for my unworthy sake, be hidden from the sun's light. False Melodine's subtle slights shall all prove vain. The enchantress by this time turned the skiff. The doves fanned the air with redoubled vigor and the swans rowed swiftly on toward the head of the lake. Lucoya took a loosened peg, 
which had fastened one of the dove cords into the skiff, and was about to prick the relaxed palm of Potentilla, which lay half open beside her lap, when the vigilant fairy, who had only been feigning slumber, quickly rose, her flames all rekindled, and snatching the peg from Lucoya, plunged it up to the diamond head in the arm of Melodine, which was guiding the rudder. Stung with pain, the enchantress uttered one loud, piercing shriek. Such a sound had never escaped her lips till then. Such a sound had never before been heard in the gleaming valley. The peacocks, which sate in multitudes on the trees around the lake, unfurling their eyeless trains to the moonbeams, echoed that scream, till the mountains rang again, and instantly afterwards the fiery constellation descended from on high to hang over Melodine's head in the guise of a comet that flamed and quivered just aloft with painful splendor. Dazzled and stunned, she sank to the bottom of the skiff, veiling her head and pressing her palms closely over her muffled ears, while Potentilla resumed the rudder and put the vessel back into its former course, Phantasmion, now thoroughly awakened, looked in confusion at the chaplet of Irene's hair, which twined the flaxen locks of Lucoya. The damsel took it from her head and, with a gentle smile and glistening eye, restored it to him. That done, the stag, which had been standing by her side with wild looks ever since Melodine turned the skiff, lay down at her feet and rested peacefully as before. After a while the boat entered a river, by which the waters of the lake partly flowed off. The swans held on their course till they arrived at a steep wall of cliff, against the lower part of which a cloud was resting. Here they stopped, and Potentilla, having pulled Melodine by the chain, she rose, and waving her hand, caused the cloud to soar from the base to the middle of the rock, discovering an archway, through which the stream flowed and disappeared amid the windings of the passage. Lucoya embraced her gentle stag as they entered the gloomy vault. Phantasmion covered himself with redoubled brightness and cast his many-colored radiance on the expanded wings and arched necks of the swans, while on before and around the gliding boat all was black shadow save where the fireflies made a golden line in the dark wave, or, soaring up, illumined the roof of the vault, enkindling many a sparry rock, which never reflected one bright ray before. At last, the damsel's now unwanted eyes were smitten by a faint sunbeam. The birds moved with renewed vigor, hastening toward the genial light, and soon a picture, delicate and minute from distance, presented itself to the eyes of the voyagers, who once more beheld the varied green of trees opposed to the deep blue of the sky, and all the landscape bathed in golden radiance. Melodine seemed blasted by the sight, and crouched with her face to the stern, closely wrapped in her veil. Meantime, the halo which surrounded Phantasmion faded away, and his wings disappeared, but heedless of the change he sate, gazing into the stream while the swans lowered their expanded sails, and Lukoya leaped ashore with a white stag. For once more he beheld his watery image with that of a damsel holding up a pitcher before her face, and now, for the first time, he observed, in the faint background of the picture, a prostrate form with the aspect of one dying or dead. Why renew this vision? said he to the enchantress, pulling her chain. Whom wouldst thou now delude? The prisoner replied that what had deceived Anthemina was no work of hers, but produced by the spirit of the waters, who had the faculty of foreshowing future scenes. While she yet spoke it faded away, all quitted the skiff, and at a signal from Melodine, the swans disappeared under the darksome vault. End of Part 3 Chapter 9
by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 10 Phantasmion hears the second part of Penzelimer's story. Potentilla bade Phantasmion follow the stream that flowed from Melodine's domain till it entered a large river. There, said she, thou shalt find one who will convey thee and thy company to Adele, not far from Lucoya's home. Offer the gem that clasps thy sleeve to the boatman, and he will receive you all without delay. Then her form changed, and he knew not if she were gone, or still flitted around him among the gilded flies and feathery nets that hummed in the sunshine. As they proceeded, Phantasmion heard the rocks resound from a distance, above the murmur of the brook, the course of which they were following. Sometimes he thought they rang Anthemina's knell with melancholy falls, and then again their merry tinkling chime seemed fitter to express the happiest espousals. Soon after, those sounds ceased to be audible, having arrived where the waters met, and espied an old man in a boat. He plucked the jewel from his sleeve and ran toward him, holding it up to sparkle in the rays of the sun. On a nearer view, he saw that the conductor provided by his guardian fairy was no other than the ancient fisherman of the Black Lake, who clasped his hands for joy as soon as he knew the prince. The messenger might have told thy name, he cried, instead of offering hire. What messenger? inquired the youth. She with bright wings, he answered, who met me in the watery dell and bade me hasten hither with this boat. Was it not on thy account she promised that I should win by the journey more than my fish had ever earned in Polyanthida, or was it all a dream? Phantasmion replied that, if it were, he had dreamed to good purpose, and having placed his companions in the vessel, he took an oar and seated himself beside the fisherman who felt right glad to see him turn the boat and begin rowing down the stream. They made great way with little effort, the full tide bearing them so rapidly forward that the rich meads of Almaterra flew by like dreams while each new scene had carried its colors into the next, ere the eye had time to distinguish it. Now and then they came to land for refreshment, and added the juicy fruits of the riverside to their other provisions. Such delays Phantasmion yielded to courtesy, though but ill-pleased to see the stream run by his idle boat. Nor did Lukoya wish to linger long upon the way, for she had now resolved on following her sister to the chieftain's palace. If her mother's consent could be gained, and the more her heart reproached her with Zelneth's wound and Arzine's anguish, the less she felt the pangs of unrequited love. It was now the end of the third day, and night hung over the voyagers, while moths flitting by reflected feeble gleams of light at intervals and once the eyes of the wild cat glared amid branches that deepened the darkness of the waters by their shade. Lukoya slept with a tear on her cheek, lulled by the chant of nightingales. Melodine lay still and heaved no breath. Phantasmion rode on in silence, while the old man, from whose failing hand he had taken the oar, slumbered heavily at his feet. He was thinking whether Potentilla still watched over him, when a ring of fireflies suddenly encircled the black visage of the enchantress and revealed the workings of her sullen face. In a few moments they rose with shrouded light, and a well-known voice was heard to sing thus. What means that darkly working brow, Melodina? Whose heartstrings art thou resting now, Melodina? The dearest pleasure follows pain, but thou with grief shalt I remain, and for thyself hast forged 
to chain Melidina. Those gauzy wings, muttered the fisherman, disturbed but not awakened by the fairy's shrill pipe. He slept in peace while she thus proceeded in a softer tone. Ah, dream of sullen skies no more, sad Lukoya. The roughest ocean hath a shore, sweet Lukoya, a steadfast shore the billows kiss, and oft some fancied joy to miss prepares the heart for higher bliss, young Lukoya. By daybreak the vessel was gliding near a field, which the river all but surrounded. Bright green was that field, sunbright its liquid fence, and brightly shone its groups of giant lilies, their glossy leaves full fed with moisture, their painted petals vying with the painted insect, which seemed in rivalry to rest its wing beside them. Round this fair semi-isle Phantasmion steered his boat, and saw that just beyond its farthest angle a narrower stream which flowed beneath high woody banks joined company with the river, losing itself in the stronger current, as childhood steals imperceptibly into vigorous youth. Guessing that this newcomer issued from the lake near Manyard's mansion, he concluded that here was the place to which the fairy had directed him, and was preparing to land on the meadow when his ear caught the melody of a harp floating along the hidden course of the tributary stream. The sounds approached quickly from a distance, and now were interpreted by the varying tones of a voice which it seemed to him that he had formerly heard with the same accompaniment. He fixed his eye on the spot where the rivers met, and soon beheld a skiff with silken streamer glide from among the trees. It made for the meadow, and, when he had ascertained by whom it was occupied, he took up the oars, and having awakened the fishermen, began to look about for a landing place. Lukoya still lay fast asleep, with her head toward the prow. She had been dreaming of Zelneth, and seemed to roam in search of her through tangled wilds, but when the sounds of the harp came thrilling across the waters, they wrought new images into the dream. That kingly portrait, once her sister's idol, appeared to gleam upon her lonesome path, but when she stooped towards it, the picture had become a living shape. While the frame rose into high trees, between the golden shafts of which the monarch sate before her, singing and playing on his harp, this vision was dissolved by the slight shock of the boat coming to shore, and no sooner were her eyes opened than they discerned the very object of her dream, Penzelimer himself, with his hand upon the strings of the harp, which he had just ceased to sound, while on he came betwixt the drooping trees that overhung the river, and Zelneth stands beside him. Zelneth herself, with outstretched arms and eager look, and face not pale and languishing, but full of bloom and triumph, as before the days of her unprosperous love, and who is she that bends towards the long-lost maid with deeper and more melancholy fondness? Is it Arzine? Ah, oh, yes, that mild maternal brow is none but hers. Lukoya is soon folded in her mother's arms, and feels that now, indeed, she has attained a peaceful haven. When the happy tears and embraces of this meeting were over, Arzine retired with her daughters to another part of the dell, where a tent had been pitched among the trees for their reception, and harnessed steeds were in readiness to carry them home by land. Then Penzelimer, finding himself alone with Phantasmion in the island meadow, for the old man was a little way off with his vessel, accosted him in the friendliest manner, smiling and saying with a perfectly rational air, I owe thee many thanks, young king of Palmland. By thy hand, I have been restored to reason. The youth looked astonished at these words. That thou art a changed man, he answered, I see plainly. But how can I have wrought the change 
I see not, and were thy looks no less wild than thy speech, I should hold thee as far from reason as ever. Hear the second part of my story, said Benzelimer, as thou hast formerly heard the first, I will soon show what part thou hast played in my adventures unknown to thyself. Phantasmion delivered Melodine to the attendants, and heard the king of Almaterra relate how the ebon-faced enchantress had tempted him to seek the house of Maldoril, what had befallen him there, how he personated his enemy, fought with him in that disguise, and was wounded by the magic weapon, but not mortally as all supposed. And whither went Glendreth? exclaimed Phantasmion, Olula's prophecy rushing into his mind. Did he invade the land of palms? I thought not of him, replied the monarch. For days, indeed, I lay incapable of thought, and, when my senses returned, was racked with grievous pangs, but this bodily suffering proved the cure of my better part, which, like the dyer's tincture, underwent the fire till it became clear, glowing, and resplendent. Reason rose, as it were, from the dead, and now, in my true being, I began to live once more. Again, the stars shone forth in their own brightness, again the breezes blew with their own freshness, Self shrinking within its natural limits, no longer sicklied the whole face of outward things, as vapors veil with one same lurid hue, earth, sky, and water, my spirit ceased to multiply itself by a thousand vain reflections, but grew and spread through nourishment from without. While I was in this happy state, feeling as if my soul were a thing apart from its mortal frame, yet, with my head sunken among the pillows from utter weakness, Albinian's queen drew near. Weeping bitterly, and calling me by the name of Glendreth, while, at the same time, methought there was a soft, bright face on the other side of the bed, which peeped from behind the curtains, and seemed to be smiling at her in derision, wondering if these were but spectres of delirium, I raised myself up a little, when Modra, beholding my face, cried aloud, and hurried from the apartment, then that other bright visitant, growing more distinct, showed herself to be the fairy Fadeline, and bade me hasten to Nemorosa, where a lady of the house of Thalimer was detained against her will. As she gave me the command, the flower spirit imparted the power of obeying it. Such enlivening odors and salutary dews she scattered round me ere she disappeared. I arose, feeling that my wounds were healed, and took my way, sane in body and mind, through the country of Maldoril, entering Nemorosa during the heat of the day, I was allured to a shady covert by the sound of falling waters, and there I spied a dark and slender youth holding a silver vessel underneath a scanty rill which spouted over the rocks. At the first glance I felt assured that this vessel was Anthemina's picture, but... Before I had resolved whether to claim it or no, the dark youth mounted his horse and rode away. Anthemina is dead, thought I, and if any malignant power imagines that by this sight he may lure me back again to my former dreams, he has missed his purpose. But for the sake of Anthemina's lovely child, I will see into what hands the charm has fallen." Phantasmion was now listening with a fixed eye and troubled heart, for he doubted not that Caradan was the youth with the pitcher, and 
that he had gone in search of Irene to Nemorosa. I followed him, pursued Penselimer, but he had ridden out of sight, and while I was considering which way to take, a strange object arrested my attention. Below the green oaks of the forest grew the stump of a black thorn, which seemed to have been blighted, for not a single leaf remained upon its uncouth boughs. The tree was split into a double trunk, one portion of which reclined upon the ground, while the other stood upright, and toward the top shot forth a solitary pair of branches. Casting my eyes adown the forest, I beheld the branches change into the horns of a stag. The upright stem put on the appearance of a deer's head and towering neck, while that which lay upon the ground swelled out into a body covered with a spotted hide. I rushed forward to examine this marvel when the creature started up on legs newly formed, perhaps from the roots of the thorn bush, and flew before me while I eagerly followed, spurring the sides of my fleet horse to overtake him. Bounding on with huge leaps, he came at last upon a company of hunters, the most noticeable of whom was one that wore a panther skin around his loins and on his yellow hair a crown of golden oak leaves. No sooner had this goodly youth espied the giant stag than off he flew, followed by all his train with whoop and hollow. One fair huntress alone remained, gazing bashfully at me, with such looks as might have made me pause on the road to paradise. And this fair huntress, cried Phantasmion, was Zelneth, daughter of Magnart, she whom Phaedeline sent thee to deliver, she who was destined to replace all that thou hast lost in Anthemina. Even so, rejoined Pensalimer, at first I thought she was Anthemina herself, restored in all her bloom and beauty, and thus we stood silent and motionless till the shouts of the distant huntsmen began to die upon the ear. Then she fled with me, and, on better knowledge of the sweet lady's features, I found they had an expression all their own, and one for its own sake, most worthy to be loved. Fair indeed were the still eyes of Anthemina, gleaming amid cloudy tresses, seen in the light, they showed as many exquisite shades of color as a mountain pool, but those of Zelneth sparkle so with life and meaning that we think less of them than of the eloquent tales they tell. How her love was bestowed on me, I marvel. She was but a laughing babe. Think me no babe now, cried Zelneth, softly approaching and smiling away some little confusion at sight of the younger prince. Sooth to say, I have not yet found thee much older and wiser than myself. I should scarce quarrel with these few grey hairs, she added in a lower tone, if they did not remind me of the years that I have missed thy love. With a brightened countenance, Penzelimer finished his story. It was dusk, he cried, when we entered Magnard's garden. Our zine ran from the threshold to welcome us, but Zelneth greeted her with tears. Think not that I bring Lucoya, she cried. I hoped to find her with thee, but the tone of thy voice tells me thou art still bereaved. While the sad mother wept on Zelneth's bosom, Fedeline gleamed upon my sight. Just under those moonshiny blossoms that droop over the porch. Weep no more, she cried in soothing accents, but seek the long-lost maiden in the watery dell. Didst thou see her? asked Zelneth. As plainly as I see thee now, replied the king, fixing his pensive eyes on the sprightly maid, and methought she drew a white violet from her bosom. Ah, 
my sister's flower, the lady cried. Mine eyes must have been dimmed with tears. I only heard her voice, and said she, not that a spirit of the wood protects Lucoya, and that this same spirit lent her power to raise the sylvan phantom that brought thee to my aid? Methought so, the king replied, but, lady, let me place thee on thy steed, or the sun will reach this journey's end, while we are delaying ours. Then they all rose to depart, and after bidding farewell to the friendly fisherman, Phantasmion rode with Zelneth and Penzelimer toward the mansion of Magnart, relating his adventures in the Sunless Valley by the way. End of Part 3, Chapter 10「Three, Chapter Eleven of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter Eleven. Phantasmion meets a numerous company at the mansion of Magnart. Meanwhile, Arzine and her train were hastening homewards with fair Lucoya whose snow-white stag tripped on in front of the company, as if delighted to carry a rider that so befitted his own graceful form. At times, the maid turned to exchange smiles with Arzine and see what watchful eyes were ever bent on her. Then she flew forward again, surveying with new delight the veil of Polyanthida and every object brightened by the beams of day. At last, her father's mansion came in sight, and the damsel bounded on, waving aloft a white mantle and casting up her eyes to a little mount within the walls, where her young brothers and sisters were assembled to watch the advancing company. Thus, as she approached the principal entrance, while the children were skipping down the hill, and beheld, not far from the gateway, an ancient woman seated in a car to which leopards were harnessed. The heads of the beasts were held by a youth who had himself somewhat of a wild and sylvan air, but not unmixed with gentleness and lofty grace. He was listening to the words of a dwarf who stood in front of the car and grasped the reins with his left hand while... With his right, he pointed at Lucoya. But when the damsel's fair stag came nigh the leopards, he started and rushed through the open gate by which the children had passed to meet Arzine. The youth stepped forward, but could not overtake the fugitive till he had reached the top of that woody hillock which overlooked the road. There, holding the reins of her sylvan steed, he told the lady that his name was Yolander, that he had come to Polyanthida under the guidance of his sage kinswoman Mulderil in search of her lovely sister Zelneth, whom he sought in marriage, and who had been carried away from his forest realm just when he hoped she would become his bride. "'Tell me now,' cried he, looking out over the road with glowing cheek, is not that my betrothed lady who comes in front of the troop? A betrothed lady comes there, but not thine, I think, replied Lucoya with a pitying smile. Oh no, I cannot be deceived, exclaimed the lover. What damsel rides with such youthful spirit, such queenly grace as my fair Zelneth? Oh yes. And surely that is Phantasmion of Palmland, who comes on before? Yolander cast his sparkling eyes upon Lucoya's face, and marked its pensive air. But who is he that keeps by the side of Zelneth? The chieftain next inquired. That is the king of this country, she answered. And wherefore comes he to Polyanthida? 
asked the youth. To celebrate his nuptials, as I guess, Lukoya made reply. Yolander smiled when he beheld her blushing cheek and asked in a courteous whisper if she were to be the bride. Oh no, she answered. Panzalimer seeks the hand of Zelneth, who had indeed betrothed herself to him as I can witness before she went to seek for me in thy far country. Struck by these unexpected tidings, Yulander dropped the reins and sank upon the ground, but soon recovering, he saw the gentle eyes of the stag and of Lukoya fixed upon his face. The one was standing near him while the other kneeled by his side. The lady's gentle countenance tempted Yulander to pour forth all his sorrow to her, and, even while he spoke, her looks of pity stole into his heart and softened the bitterness of that grief which he described so eloquently. But now Arzine appeared, climbing the hill with young Hermilian and all her blooming train. The chieftain was still telling his tale with passionate gestures to Lukoya, who leaned upon her stag and felt her own griefs assuaged by the tears that flowed for Yolander. Arzine accosted the youth and made him the same courteous proffer of hospitality which had been already accepted by his ancient kinswoman. He gladly consented to be her guest and accompany the wife and daughter of Magnart to a pleasant bank shaded by trees and spread with wines and fruits and dainty viands by Arzine's command. Yolander kept by the side of Lukoya, continuing his discourse as much for the sake of the listener as the subject, for while he beheld her gentle smiles and soft retreating eyes, new thoughts and wishes began to arise in his bosom. Insensibly he ceased to think of Zelneth, but, caressing Lukoya's silver-coated stag, observed how fair he would look among the glades of Nemorosa. "'Wilt thou go to that far land?' quoth the damsel playfully to her favorite. "'Fair mistress,' replied the chieftain, answering for him, "'without thee I should pine and perish. Let us both dwell there together.' At that moment the stag raised his soft, bright eye and looked at Lukoya as if he adopted what was said in his name. Arzine and the ancient queen were now sitting on a bank, the white deer came to browse beside them, ever and anon looking up in the face of Maldoril, who scowled and shuddered as she met his gentle gaze. Yulander among the trees at a little distance was teaching Lukoya how to shoot when Zelneth, followed by her noble companions, entered the grove. With light steps she approached her sister, but on a sudden beheld the chieftain of Nemorosa, bending his bow under a laurel. At that sight, she uttered an exclamation of surprise and drew back hastily to the side of Penzelimer. Then she approached the bank to salute young Hermilian, who was twining his mother's hair with honeysuckle and started when the face of Maldoril presented itself to her view. Soon afterwards, the whole company assembled in Magnard's princely hall, but while the guests were gaily entertained, their gentle hostess sighed for one that was absent and wondered whether Caradan had joined his father in Rockland. Yulander had ceased to sigh and appeared so all intent on winning Lukoya's grace that Zelneth addressed him with one of her archest smiles and inquired what had become of the panther's skin which he used to wear for her sake. She blushed, when the youth whispered that he did but follow her example. Had not she too forgotten for whose sake she once wore it? Afterwards, however, he drew a remnant of the hide from beneath his vest to spread it under Lukoya's feet, then cast upon the spotty carpet his crown of golden oak leaves, which Zelneth took up and twined among her sister's ringlets. Amid these and other such pleasantries, the evening shades stole on, when Melodine dismissed her gloom 
and joined insensibly in the general mirth. Next, Maldoril arose, and with meaning glances besought the lady of the sunless veil for that oblivious charm which her kinsman stood in need of. At the same time she placed a chalice in her hand, and Melodine, taking forth a vial, poured the contents therein, and delivered the cup to Yolander. But he fixed his eyes on Lucoya, as she sate considering the coronal which now she held in her hand, and declaring that he had no flames in his bosom which he desired to extinguish, poured out the liquor on the marble floor. Then Maldoril complimented the bashful maid on having gained a most experienced suitor, one so well seasoned to love's variable climb that he might now endure its worst vicissitudes, and flinging stones that rebounded from one point to another, annoyed all present by hints at Eulander's passion for Zelneth and his worship of Irene. While the youth himself maintained a blushing silence, Melodine pretended to take his part. Methinks I can spy good reasons for his last change, said she. I know of a song which fits this case well. A song, cried Maldoril. Let us hear it. Thy voice may have more persuasion than thy words. Phantasmion was absorbed in thought of Irene, and Lucoya engaged by the silent courtship of her sylvan lover when this wily proposal was made. So, without opposition from them, the veiled lady held up her fettered arms, where she stood in the midst of the hall, and, with expressive gestures, began to sing thus in the person of Eulander. Methought I wandered dimly on, but few faint stars above me shone. When love drew near, the night, said he, is dark and damp, to guide thy steps receive this lamp of crystal clear. Love lent his torch with ready hand, the splendid lamp by his command. I strove to light, but strove in vain, no flame arose, unchanged, unfired, as moonlit snows, it sparkled bright. Again on wings as swift as thought, the boy, a glittering crescent brought of sunny gold, full sure twas worth a monarch's gaze, and how I toiled to make it blaze can scarce be told. Deprived of hope I stood perplexed, and through my tears what offered next obscurely floated. One other lamp love bade me take, mine eye its color, size, or make, but little noted. Till soon, what joys my soul inspire, from far within a steady fire, soft upward steals, and oh, how many a tender hue, what lines to loveliest nature true, that beam reveals. Now what reck I of burnished gold, or crystal cast in statelier mould, this lamp be mine, which makes my path where'er I go, with warm reflected colours glow, and light divine. Gradually, Melodine's voice, together with the fumes of the liquor which had been spilt upon the floor, infected the hearers with drowsiness, and as the song proceeded, the scenes it pictured stole upon their misted eyes. First dim starlight, then love, with torch and lamp and beamy smile, emerging from a wood, till at last a crowd of witching faces and bright torches, and lamps of a thousand shapes and colors, lit and unlit, waved along before them in endless succession. Even the enamored chief could no longer look upon the very face of Lucoya, but beheld a lucid image of it with closed lids. The maid herself scarce inquired whether she were indeed the lamp that was kindling at Eulander's touch, and though lately proof against Melodine's charm, now nodded under the influence of this doubly potent spell. Phantasmion kept his eyes open longer than the rest, and perceived that Maldoril was loosing the fetters from his captive's feet and hands. 
but was too fast held in drowsy bands to prevent her liberation, and, ere it was fully effected, he too lay slumbering on the floor. A new sun had just dawned when he started up and saw its rays brightening the crimson cushions around and the fair faces which reclined on them. But the enchantresses were gone. With small hope of recovering his prisoner, he rushed into the garden and, passing toward the chief entrance through a shady avenue, beheld the traces of panther's feet on the humid soil, but beyond the trees and the gate in open sunshine not a footmark was to be seen upon the firm dry earth, and when he looked at the contracted shadows of cattle on the verdurous plain and saw the broad blue sky where a caroling bird was the only speck of darkness, he felt as if drowsy charms and sunless veils and sable visages were but dreams of a long dim night. End of Part 3, Chapter 11「3 Chapter 12 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 Chapter 12 Yolander Conducts Lucoya to the Forest There was something in the face of the huntsman chief which brought to Lucoya's mind young Dariel of Tigridia. The maid had loved and suffered silently so that, when she listened to the suit of Yolander, Arzine thought she gave her hand to him who had first touched her heart. The nuptials of Zelneth and Lucoya were celebrated in their native vale, and Sanio, Penzelimer's trusty minister being present at the festivities, was the first to inform the king of Palmland that Glandreth had invaded his dominions and was now occupying them with a powerful army. Forthwith, a league was struck betwixt the three sovereigns, who resolved to unite hand and heart against the common enemy, to drive the invaders from Palmland, to free Almatera from dependence on the land of rocks, to protect the right of Albinian's son, and to place Yolander on the throne of his ancestors. Phantasmion resolved on secretly entering Gemaura, that district which had been annexed to Palmland by the union of Zalia with Dorimont, for the sake of raising the spirits of the inhabitants by his presence and stirring them up against the foe. It was settled that Penzelimer, meantime, should divide his forces, that one part in company with the foresters of Nemorosa should fall upon Rockland, while the other, having joined Phantasmion in Gemaura, which was yet free from the foreign troops, should unite with such an army as he could muster to drive the invaders from the land of palms. With these allies, Phantasmion would have felt sure to triumph, but for the lack of metal armor, which damped his subjects' martial prowess. Neither could the king of Almutera supply the deficiency, for all the steel and brass which his people had in use, they derived from Rockland, having neither mines nor skillful smiths among themselves. Magnart could not be called upon to fulfill his big promises, for he had entered Rockland with all the men he had at command, under pretense of securing Albinian's throne against his brother's selfish schemes for the boy Albinet. He desired to have his eldest son with him in this expedition, and to bring about his marriage with Irene, but the youth and the maid were both missing, and no one could inform him where to seek for either. Panzelimer's queen was eager to raise a powerful army in behalf of Phantasmion, not from any lingering remnant of love for him, but that her kingly spouse might appear important in the eyes of all men, 
Lukoya dreaded warfare, but from gratitude to her deliverer, she felt anxious that he should be enabled to regain his kingdom. While Phantasmion journeyed toward his mother's country, which lay betwixt Almaterra and Palmland, full of grief to think that he must again travel away from Irene, Panzelimer conducted Zelneth to his castle with regal pomp, and Eulander's gentle bride accompanied her spouse to Nemorosa. The wife of Magnart went with Lukoya on her journey, for having heard Panzelimer's tale, she could not doubt that the youth who carried a silver pitcher was her beloved son, and purposed to make inquiry in every house on the borders of the forest till she traced him out. After many disappointments in this quest, she entered the goatherd's cottage, and there heard tidings which made her resolve to shape her course towards the sea. Arzine had left home with no attendance of her own, and now that she was to part company with her son and daughter, Lukoya bade the chieftain guard her through the dangerous forest. Yolander, though somewhat loath, obeyed his bride's behest, and to show his zeal and devotion, attended her mother, leaving Lukoya at the goatherd's cottage. The lady asked many questions of her host concerning his late guests. She had already heard him relate to Arzine how a beautiful young maid and her aged sire abode under his roof, how the old man died, and the damsel departed with a tall dark youth who bore a silver pitcher. Now he spoke more minutely of these matters, and showed the jewels which his guests had given him. Lukoya felt certain that the decrepit man of whom he spake must have been Irene's father, and full of tender thoughts, she wandered forth alone to view the hollow in the rocks where his coffin had been deposited. Passing through a part of the wood she espied the fair white stag browsing among the trees a little way off, and fearing that he might stray too far, she went to lead him back toward the cottage. On she tripped, calling him by his name in silver tones, but, ere she reached his side, two dwarfs rushed out upon her from behind some bushes, and while one pinioned her arms, the other bound them with cords, then both together placed her at the bottom of a car drawn by leopards, wherein the ancient queen of Tigridia was seated. Swar, though, said Maldoril to one of these monsters, putting the reins into his hand. Dost thou see how yon white deer stands terror-stricken? Drive up to him. If he awaits our approach, I will throw this noose around his neck and take him to the gardens of the cavern. Swarthos toad eyes gleamed strangely while his mistress spoke, and as he stared in affright, the scarlet ring flamed out all around, but without answering a word, he shook the reins and drove up to the stag. Lukoya was lying stupefied at Maldoril's feet. The witch stood erect. The object of attack appeared as motionless as if it were a marble effigy placed there to decorate the glade. But no sooner had Maldoril cast her loop round his neck than she dropped the cord and shrieked aloud. It was no stag, but a tiger with glaring eyeballs and terrific jaws, around which her noose was hanging. With a roar that shook the forest, he sprang upon the leopards, and at that moment, Newlander appeared in sight. Perceiving the jeopardy of his kinswoman, he rushed on with his javelin uplifted. But no sooner had he approached the car than the tiger vanished. Yolander beheld his own Lukoya lying bound at the feet of Maldoril, and the hideous dwarf crouching like a nightmare on her breast. In a moment he had severed the cords that bound her arms, and would have spitted the monster with his spear. But a voice that seemed to be made up of many sweet voices, so powerful and mellow it sounded, was heard to speak thus. Take home thy gentle bride, Yolander, and let the dwarf and Maldoril go unhurt. 
Fear nothing for Lukoya. She may wander securely, by day or night, amid the loneliest recesses of this forest. The spirit of the woods protects her, and destined the maid from childhood for thy bride. Go, Modril, in vain wouldst thou seek to overthrow my plans. Fly to thy mountain abode, and lurk no longer in the shadow of these boughs, weaving deceits and treacheries. While the voice continued, every bird was silent, every leaf motionless on the spray, but when it ceased, a murmur ran through the forest, as if the whole expanse of foliage were swept by one strong, transient gale, and all the feathered inmates of the wood burst forth at once into a choral melody. Lukoya leaped upon the turf, then Maldoril drove her leopards through an opposite quarter of the forest, and soon was hidden from the view amid leafy oaks and beeches. The lady by Yolander's side pursued a different course. Wherever she passed, the birds crowded to the boughs, even the trees themselves appeared to be saluting her with lowered branches, and a troop of white fawns like snowdrops, such as had never been seen in that region before, skipped around and preceded her steps. But when the wedded pair arrived at the Sylvan Palace, Yolander saw to his astonishment that its precincts were enlarged, that a fence of tall trees which formerly bounded one end of it was now removed, and a delicious pleasure ground watered by a clear stream laid open to the view. This was Maldrill's garden, which the spirit of the wood had thus added to the domain of Eulander, having taken off the spells which had hitherto hedged it round. The witch's cavern was yet standing, but soon afterwards an earthquake laid it in ruins, and the place it had occupied became a rocky channel, where the river, diverted from its ancient bed, flowed roughly, flashing and raving in its broken course, as if indignant at the remembrance of deeds once perpetrated there. End of Part 3 Chapter 12「Phantasmion」by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 Chapter 13 After the death of Albinian, Irene leaves the goatherd's cottage. While the daughters of Magnart were surrounded with festal pomp and pleasure, Irene watched her father's dying bed, and so deeply was her heart engaged by his wants and sufferings, that the season of Albinian's mortal sickness, with its slightly varied stages, its melancholy hopes, and transient restorations, remained imprinted on her mind like a vivid chart, which the eye surveys at once, all equally distinct and clear from the beginning to the end. Just before his death, Albinian spoke of Modra and Anthemina, for in this time of natural decay, his speech was wholly restored. It was a fearful retribution, he said, that she, to whom I denied my hand and heart, alas, too hastily promised, should be enabled to bewitch my spirit with an amorous infatuation, and afterwards my body with unnatural weakness. But, oh, the beauty of Anthemina might have done away stronger traces from the heart than Modra ever left on mine. Irene sighed, and still more sadly she felt when Albinian spoke further. Weakly and wrongfully, he said, I accepted the fair hand which a father offered me, and that gift brought after it 
a train of evils which clung to the receiver even after the gift itself had been taken away. Dorimont was in all her thoughts. Dorimont was in her nightly dreams when, wrapped in slumber, she uttered the name of Dorimont. Sleep deserted my pillow. One fatal image haunted the unloved husband and the regretful wife. But thou, Irene, wast the child of that marriage. Thy beauty brings only blessing and happiness. Thou hast loved me here, and where I go, thy love will follow me. While he spoke thus, the old man's withered face appeared to expand and brighten, his mind being filled with the one only thought on which it could dwell with perfect complacency. He imagined blissful regions where Madra and Anthemina could wreck his peace no more, where Irene with brave Caradan, who from boyhood had shown him reverence, might dwell forever in his sight. But soon that vision faded, while sad remembrances and anticipations cast their deep shadows over his soul. Irene saw that his countenance was disturbed, though no new words had been spoken, as a lake appears ruffled on the surface while not a breath of air is stirring abroad, and the veilsmen imagine a wind under the waters. Albinian was thinking of Albinet, left in Glandreth's power, of his infant boy in the palace of Palmland, and worse than all, of Irene, plighted to the son of Dorimont. Father, said the maid, reading part of his thoughts, thy children have noble and brave defenders. Me they may survive as well as thee, but while I tarry here below I will watch those children with a mother's care, and rich indeed will be my reward when I receive thy thanks hereafter, and hear thy sons declare that I faithfully discharged my trust. These soothing images found no entrance to the spirit of Albinian. Dorimant and Anthemina, Irene and Phantasmion, linked together in eternal bliss. Alas, alas! Earth had been a scene of sorrow to the dying man, and heaven, he feared, would be no heaven for him. He pressed the hand of his daughter, and even while the dews of death stood on his forehead, his sunken eyes appeared to glow and be projected by the force of passion. Promise to marry Caradan, thy dear mother's kinsman, he cried with struggling utterance. Then I shall die in peace. At that moment, the unhappy maiden longed to die too and dwell with both her parents in the realms above. She remained silent, while tears flooded her cheeks, and her whole frame trembled. With a faint groan, Albinian abandoned her gentle hand, and instantly afterwards he ceased to breathe. Irene closed his eyes, and kneeled beside the bed with her face bowed down in sorrow. She had remained for some time in this posture, lost to all outward sights and sounds, when a well-known voice roused her from abstraction. Irene lifted up her eyes dim with tears, and beheld the silver pitcher of Anthemina gleaming in the light, admitted by a narrow casement at one end of the rustic chamber. He who held it now advanced from the door, and she saw the dark face and slim figure of Caradan. "'Is he dead?' cried the youth, gazing sorrowfully on the couch. "'Oh, say not that he is gone forever. I have here a blessed medicine, which the kind spirit has given me at my earnest prayer. I myself have felt its wondrous potency.' "'It comes too late,' replied the maid with fresh flowing tears." Charms and witcheries can have no power upon him now, for good or evil. Woe is me, exclaimed the youth. 
It would have restored him to health and vigor. How long have I been wandering, bewildered in this land of trees? Oh, would that Fadeline had shown me thy abode before! Many thanks to thee, Caradan, exclaimed the damsel fervently. Thou hast ever loved and honored my father. Caradan wept and stood looking with a countenance of grief on the face of Albinian. At last he said in a low voice, Thy father loved me too, and fain would have had me for a son. Were thou and I united in marriage, his spirit would be ever nigh to bless and to protect us. O oh, Caradan, replied Irene, with his dying voice he urged that suit, yet even now could I restore him to life by granting it? The little word might not be spoken. Caradan remained silent for some time after Irene had uttered these words, kneeling by the side of the bed. Then he clasped his hands and looking up with a face of deep anguish. Yes, yes, he exclaimed. It was fated long ago. I see that thou art never to be mine. Thou couldst not consent even to bring back Anthemina from exile. Irene gazed on Caradan as if to read his meaning in his eyes, but soon the youth declared that meaning with solemn words and oaths. Anthemina yet lives, he cried. Blame me not that I have concealed this truth till now. Hereafter thou shalt know that I am blameless. Anthemina did not sink beneath the waves, and I can guide thee to the coast where Fadeline last night shed balm upon her lonely pillow. Irene stood rapt, with face upturned and arms outstretched but motionless. Her heart and brain seemed overborne by a multitude of thoughts and feelings which crowded on them at once. A thousand dreams were suddenly realized and started up from the depths of memory into brilliant light. At last, she clasped her hands and rushing to her father's side. Oh, wake again, she wildly cried, to hear that my mother lives. The eyes of him who lay on the couch were open, and he returned her eager gaze. Albinian was not dead. Sense and breathing had feebly returned, and he had heard that she whom he had never ceased to love was yet among the living. He beckoned to Caradan, who stood with eyes fixed on his in amazement. Caradan approached and kneeled by his side. Albinian looked at the maid, then at the youth, and pointed to the silver pitcher now standing on the floor. His lips moved, and Irene knew as she bent over her father that he was entreating her to be the wife of Caradan, and to seek with him for Anthemina. "'Give me thy hand,' cried the youth, rising. Then he whispered in Irene's ear, "'Satisfy the soul of Albinian,' and thou shalt be free from this tie by the time that thou beholdest Anthemina. The maid no longer held back, but placed her hand in the hand of Caradan, and the youth, firmly grasping it, said aloud, Thy daughter has betrothed herself to me, and death only can separate us. Irene marked not the import of these words her mind being wholly occupied with the change that came over her father's countenance immediately after they were spoken. For his face, though it wore a happy smile, was now again like the face of the dead. Caradan took the pitcher and bedewed his body with the charmed liquor supplied by Fadeline. The effect was marvelous. Every wrinkle was removed. Soft bloom overspread the cheek and that body so miserably wasted by sorrow and sickness showed like the corpse of some fair and youthful person whose thread of life had been snapped by sudden accident. 
but this adorning was only for the tomb. Albinian's spirit had fled a moment after Irene placed her hand in that of Caradan. The empty tenement looked meet to be inhabited, but the soul returned to it no more. Long did Irene linger over the corpse of Albinian, but when all hope was gone, having placed her father's remains in a coffin, she went with Caradan to lay them in a hollow among the rocks, where the goatherd promised they should remain in safety till they could be removed to a more august receptacle. The service performed, Irene besought Caradan to fulfill his promise of conducting her to the abode of Anthemina, and having mounted a mule, she bade her sorrowful host farewell with many tears, declaring that even when he should cease to be the guardian of her father's body, every link would not be severed which bound her to him. End of Part 3, Chapter 13Part 4, Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 1 Phantasmion vainly attempts the destruction of Glandreth, but, entering the bowels of the earth, he meets with one who assures him of victory and vengeance. Phantasmion had hardly set foot in Gemmaura when his guardian spirit appeared before him. Beware, she cried, how thou proceedest in this district. The foe has been here before thee. Hast thou no remembrance of the country around? Phantasmion replied that it scarcely seemed new to his eyes. Not far from hence, rejoined Potentilla is the mansion where thy mother used to dwell with Cyrides, her guardian. After marriage, Zalia loved to revisit the spot and see her little son gambol in those green haunts where she herself had sported when a child. And here, in her death sickness, she desired to be buried, feeling like one who longs to lie down in the old accustomed chamber. Her ancient friend survived till an hour ago, but Glandreth and his savage band have murdered him. Then Phantasmion cried aloud, and flinging himself upon the ground, began to tear his bossy ringlets. It was rumored, said the fairy, that he possessed a treasure and was acquainted with rich mines, and so they pierced him with spears on the tomb of his beloved pupil, which he daily visited. Then, digging into the ground, discovered no precious stones or metals, but thy mother's coffin, which they are even now carrying away into palm land. For Glandreth declares that he will hold a solemn feast and burn the relics of Dorimont and Zalia before all the people as a sign that the old race of the palmland kings is utterly abolished. Phantasmion now sprang from the earth, and grasping Potentilla's robe, implored her either to end his life at once, or to give him the means of sudden vengeance. The fairy made answer that she could devise but one way of helping him to that, for which his soul thirsted, and this was a plan fraught with toil, hazard, and even abasement. Phantasmion exclaimed that he would do and be and suffer anything if he might but stop his enemies in their outrageous career. Then, listen, she replied, among the innumerable subjects of my insect realm is one which digs a pitfall in the sand. For nature has so constructed its unwieldy form that it walks backward and has no other means of catching the nimble creatures which it preys upon. At the farther end of Gemmaura is a wide, sandy plain. This thy enemies have to traverse 
ere they reach the luxuriant valley of palms, where their armed comrades are to meet them, and the festival is to be celebrated on the morrow. Thither thou shalt go, and, in the guise of that crafty insect, prepare a gulf large enough to swallow up Glandreth and all his murderous band when they arrive there. The youth embraced this offer, and, having received wings from Potentilla, rapidly followed her through the air, and alighted on a spot suitable for the undertaking, just before the entrance to the Vale of Palms. At a touch of the fairy's wand, his wings vanished, and in the same point of time, every vestige of his human form disappeared. Led by a natural instinct, he forthwith set to work, and traced out circle within circle in the sand, his new body and limbs being his only instruments. Laboring without stop, he at length scooped out a deep cavity of size proportioned to the gigantic form that wrought it. At the bottom of the snare, the metamorphosed prince now took his seat, covering himself with sand, so that, the upper part of his head with the points of his horrid fangs, which were like two reaping hooks crossed, alone remained visible. And over the hollow Potentilla wove a gummy web, on which, when finished, she strewed a light covering of dust and common soil. By this time the sun was sinking in the west, and the last clump of spiral trees, which Glandreth's company passed on the margin of the desert, cast their lengthened shadows on the yellow sand. The leader had fallen back to the rear, and was deep in discourse with a chieftain, richly apparelled, to whom he was vaunting his triumphs, and describing how he meant to rule the state of Palmland. Some way in advance were those that bore the remains of Zalia, and the younger men went riding on before. No sooner had these youthful warriors, who were mounted on prancing steeds, arrived at the sandy plain then, for their own sport and that of their horses, they resolved on running a race. Their friends behind warned them to beware of the old quarries which lay to the right, but, confident and careless, off they started, avoiding those excavations only to fall into an equally destructive gulf. Within a few seconds of each other, all arrived at the abyss which gaped to receive them. At the edge of it they rushed upon a loose bank of pebbles and sand, thrown up by the fabricator. Against this the horses stumbled and, losing their balance, fell headlong into the trap. The men behind wondered to see them suddenly disappear in the distance and strained their eyes to look after them. It was quite dark, ere the company that brought the coffin reached the pitfall so that, leisurely as they came, all rolled over the shelf and joined their comrades in the hollow. There the mingled crowd were lying, crushed and mangled with broken arms, legs, ribs, and skulls, some over their steeds and some under them, while those horses which still had power to move kicked and plunged and trod their masters to atoms. He who had dug the huge pit kept quietly at his post, somewhat oppressed by the weight of one man's body, nigh the centre of the gulf, but eagerly expecting the arrival of Glandreth. Glandreth, however, was destined to escape that snare. The moon is not yet up, he cried to his men, and we shall have a stream to cross in the valley of palms. Kindle the torches that we may see our way. The conqueror was obeyed, and by the light which the flaming pine branches cast around them, he and his companions descried the heaped sand and the gaping pitfall. Seized with alarm and astonishment, Glandreth snatched one of the brands and went with the rest to look down into the gulf, where he beheld a crowd of mangled bodies and heard the groans of the dying. Phantasmion plainly discerned his enemy, on whose horror-stricken visage the torchlight cast a fierce glare, gazing into the pit and narrowly eyeing the scythe-formed weapons of his head 
which stood out from the center of it. Another face gleamed beside his, beneath a jeweled headdress. It was that of treacherous Magnart, whom the indignant youth immediately recognized. After a while, the two brothers and their attendants drew off toward the Vale of Palms. When, with some difficulty, Phantasmian dragged himself out of his den, bringing up his mother's coffin along with him. He had been miserably bruised, and now, feeling all eagerness to be divested of his hideous mask, would have cried aloud for the insect fairy, but found himself unable to utter any articulate sound. He looked about and saw her whom he sought in woman's form, yet surmised that she must still be near him, because a large moth having the figure of a skull depicted on the upper part of its body, kept flitting around his head, ever and anon uttering a shrill, piteous cry, then sinking down beside him. She deserted Dorimont, thought he. Perhaps she will leave me also to my fate. But soon he keenly felt the wretchedness of being disabled either from facing his enemies or escaping from them by fleetness, when a band of soldiers armed with arrows and javelins and lighted by torches came to take the bodies of their companions out of the pit. One of them, looking over the plain, espied the monstrous form under which Phantasmian was disguised, lying stretched upon the sand. He pointed it out to the rest, who feared to approach, but from a distance discharged their missiles, many of which stuck like porcupine quills about the ungainly carcass and caused the youth such anguish that he believed he should expire that night. Miserable man that I am, he exclaimed, or rather, miserable spirit of a man, imprisoned in a frightful crust, to what dire extremity have I been driven by mad rage? I have cast away my human form and faculties, only to perish, unavenged by arrows from my enemy's quiver. Still dragging his mother's coffin, he crawled along in hopes to gain the shelter of some rocks, and there to find at once a deathbed and a sepulchre. The moon had now risen, and cast her light upon those rocks by the time that Phantasmian reached them. But, exhausted with fatigue and pain, he was unable to command the motions of his monstrous body. His eyes grew dim, he came unawares to the verge of a stone quarry, and, moving backwards, lost his balance so that he tumbled to the bottom. Here, when he recovered sense and motion, which his fall at first suspended, he found himself lying under a vault of stone, with large fragments of rock scattered on all sides. The moon cast her beams wherever they could find entrance amid the lumber of the quarry, and all around was an interchange of blackest shade and soft silver reflections. But the attention of the miserable transformed youth was drawn toward a darksome hollow, whence he heard low sounds proceed, and after listening a little while, he distinguished two voices, one deep and sepulchral, the other slender and sweet as that of a solitary wren, which pipes a faint strain when the blast is silent, and the sun shines on its cushion of snow. Nevertheless, oh, save my son, exclaimed that softer voice. It seemed as if the tones of the second speaker came from underground, while those of the first descended through the air. What have I to do with the son of Dorimont? was the reply. I have expiated my disobedience, great spirit of the earth, rejoined the voice from above. I perished through that marriage against which Thou didst warn me. What is Phantasmion to me? Again the earth spirit replied. He hath a helper of his own, 
and even here in my domain, she hath presumed to practice her witcheries. But thou hast triumphed over Orga, the second speaker replied. Now, therefore, I beseech thee, suffer Potentilla to restore my son. While Phantasmion listened to this colloquy, his soul was filled with indescribable tumults, and the silence that succeeded to the last words caused him the most agonizing suspense. He felt as if his strong emotions must rend and break to shivers that disproportioned case which lay on the earth, lumpish and uncouth, as the half-hewn stones around it. But now the hideous dream had vanished, and once more, Phantasmion stands erect in his own noble form, splendid as the palm trees, with their leaf-crowned heads and gorgeous clusters, graceful and majestic as the darker cypress. The first object that met his eye was Potentilla, whose want had just wrought the change. Flitting away in the air, her wings growing transparent, her head triagonal, and her whole body more and more minute, till she had changed into a dragonfly, the gay colors of which twinkled for a moment in the moonlight. She is gone, but what pale shadowy form is that which occupies her place and gazes with such melancholy tenderness on the renovated youth. Phantasmion, looking intensely before him, remembers the fair and gentle countenance of his mother. An hour ago, how ill could he have brought to mind the face of Zalia, the face which, ever beaming in his presence with maternal love, had been to his young mind the very symbol of maternity. Now he not only recognized her features, but saw his childish self placed outwardly before him, the time when he lay in sickness on his little couch, and saw that soft, mild countenance still shining in betwixt delirious dreams, now occupied his mind with such intensity that all which had since occurred seemed dim and faint in comparison. As when a distant moonlit building attracts the eye, all the intervening space looks indistinct and shadowy because that has been rendered so conspicuous. Filled with inexpressible yearning, Phantasmion leaned forward to embrace the form of Zalia. But ah, uh, no living mother watches over him now, and she who has done him this maternal service is but an impalpable phantom. Blessings on thee, my son, whispered the spirit. Restore my bones to their resting place and lay those of my ancient guardian in the same grave. Phantasmion eagerly promised to obey, and then she related that Volorgo once made her mistress of those precious mines, the report of which induced Dorimond to marry her that no sooner had she accepted his hand than the gift was withdrawn. While Phantasmion listened, darkness fell upon an opposite rock which had reflected the full light of the moon from its humid front. He looked and saw what seemed the shadow of a giant leaning forward from a recess hard by. Dorimond could never find those mines, Zalia continued. Alas, it was but iron and gold that he sought in seeking me. The earth spirit knew this and frustrated his purpose. I too need metals, exclaimed Phantasmion. Come then, his mother cried, and I will show thee where the veins of iron have lurked for ages undisturbed by the hand of man. Phantasmion rejoiced at these words, but now he bethought him of Irene, and, hoping that he might learn where she abode from the kind spirit, he kneeled down and, looking earnestly in her face, Mother, he said, knowest thou her, to whom I have given thy coronal, the daughter of Anthemina? 
As he uttered that name, a mournful displeasure darkened Zalia's countenance, and her face, which hitherto had shone in the moonlight, pure as a fleecy cloud, now appeared to be flecked with purple. "'What means this fearful change, my mother?' exclaimed Phantasmion. "'And oh, why dost thou look so mournfully?' The shade of Zalia was silent. Phantasmion held up his hands in earnest supplication, but now his mother's form gleamed upon him no longer, and the moonbeams enlightened only the solid walls of the quarry. A dawning sun tinged the landscape with its first pale beam, when Phantasmion heard the voice of the earth spirit calling him from underground. Son of Zalia, follow me, it cried. And thou shalt be avenged on Glandreth. Shall I leave the light of day, thought the youth, and venture below with one who may keep me there forever? While Phantasmion hesitated, he heard a thundering sound, and at the same time the masses of rock and walls of stone began to quiver, as if seized with an egg, the tumult having subsided, he beheld an opening in the earth, and from that passage the voice of the earth spirit issued and spoke thus, If thou wilt be avenged on Glandreth, follow me. Then Phantasmia thought that if Balhorka willed his destruction, he had but to shake the earth a little more forcibly, and straight away he must lie defaced and mangled among the fragments of the quarry. No sooner had he taken his resolve than hope led him onward, and all the dark images which fear had summoned were dissipated in the brightening atmosphere of his soul, like smoky fumes in the transparent ether. He entered the hollow way, and groped along, till the last faint glimmering of light had disappeared, and he stumbled in utter darkness. Awful noises now assailed his ears, and, as he proceeded, they grew louder and louder, but his courage never deserting him, he went right on, till the passage widened, and brought him to an open space with a firm but glassy footing. Here he groped a little way, then stopped, overcome by the seeming weight of darkness, and the utter vacancy on every side. When, all at once, his eyes were attracted by sparks of light, kindling in the blackness above, and soon myriads of fresh stars shone out. In another moment, these fiery points shot upward and swelled into volumes of flame, which disclosed the ruby lamps that held them, and a new heaven of gems with numberless constellations glittering over his head. Below that sapphirine dome, the ground was of jasper, embossed with a thousand flower-like jewels, and full in view were lakes of crystal, emerald groves, and towers and spires of diamond, which rose from a golden city, built on many hills, and stretched away in the distance, far as the eye could reach, over against where he stood, at the entrance of this gemmy vale, which, by its over-brightness, caused the eye to ache for milder daylight, Phantasmion beheld a swarthy and gigantic figure leaning on an implement of iron. His limbs were muscular, his cheeks ploughed with furrows, and his eyes deep sunk beneath black, beetling brows. Valhorga! exclaimed the youth. It is not gold and jewels that I seek from thee, but brass and iron. Give me sharp swords to pierce the impious hearts of my enemies, and let all thy brilliant possessions reflect no other light than that of these subterranean fires. Valhorga's stern brow relaxed, and he smiled upon Phantasmion. Thou shalt have iron and brass enough, said he to make thy armies glitter in the sun like glaciers on the bosom of the mountain. 
conduct them to the volcano behind the house of Maldaril, and there they shall be fitted out to encounter the troops of Glandereth. Phantasmian's heart exulted in this promise, but casting his eyes around the sparkling scene, he beheld that stony likeness of a pomegranate tree whence his mother's coronal had been taken. It grew beside a crystal lake which reflected the sapphire vault, and stars of carbuncle and ruby, their flames appearing to quiver on its firm smooth face. Then Zalia's mournful image came back into his mind, and he besought Valhorga to explain the meaning of her sudden change. The earth spirit made reply, Maldaril persuaded thy mother to taste poisonous berries, averring that they were sent by the flower spirit, and would render her beloved in the eyes of her neglectful spouse. Zalia clings to the error which haunted her dying bed, and believes that Fadeline sought her life for the sake of Anthemina. Then Falhorka disclosed the ancient feud which had rendered Maldaril and Melodine bitter enemies, both to the house of Thalimer and the race of Palmland, and Phantasmion found that Dariel, whose scarf he still wore across his bosom, was the brother of Eulander, and had been sent by the Tigridian queen to work his ruin. This discourse inspired him with fresh desire to encounter his foes, and fresh hope that he should prevail against them ere long by Valhorga's aid, the spirit of the storm he feared not. And the meanest dying day, thought he, is long since past, and her vow to serve Glandreth must have expired. With a joyful heart he quitted the sapphirine sky, and pursued another dark winding passage, till it led him up into the light of day. When he emerged, the sun was shining in meridian splendor, and he found himself in the midst of Penzelimer's army. With the numerous bands of Gemarians and fugitives from Palmland who had flocked around him, they had assembled on the sandy tract, and were greatly at a loss to know what had become of the young monarch, scouts having been sent on all sides to look for him in vain. Great was the astonishment of Penzelimer when he beheld the earth gape a little way from the place where he stood, and Phantasmion came forth in helmet, shield, and breastplate of diamonds, which sparkled like icicles in the sunshine though not to be melted by the hottest ray. This jeweled armor, cried the king of Palmland, is a pledge from Valhorga, the spirit of the earth. Soon it shall be exchanged for a more serviceable suit, and every soldier of our numerous host shall receive the same harness as myself. Let us march to the volcanic mountain of Tigridia, there to be equipped for battle and victory. Acclamations rent the sky, after the silence of amazement which his first reappearance occasioned. Phantasmion showed himself to the whole army in his brilliant array, so that all were inspired with confidence, and eager to start for the mountain of Maldaril. Phantasmion delayed their march while he interred his mother's remains, and the body of her faithful guardian in a secret but honored grave. Those rites performed, the united armies set forth on their distant expedition. End of Part 4, Chapter 1「
Arzin wanders in search of Caradan to obey, whence he has just set sail with Irene. The spring returns, and balmy budding flowers revive in memory all my childish hours, when pleasures were as bright and fresh, though brief, as petals of the may or silken leaf. But now, when king cups open their golden eyes, I see my darlings brighten with surprise, and rival tints that little cheek illume, when eglantine displays her richest bloom. Dear boy, thou art thy mother's vernal flower, sweeter than those she loved in childhood's hour, and spring renews my earliest ecstasy by bringing buds and fresh delights for thee. With tearful eyes, Arzin murmured this song, and seemed to see the childish form of Caradan sporting before her, as when she sang it first. No one gave tidings of her son at the hamlet where she had spent the night, but the goatherd had expressed a belief from inquiries which the youth made that he and his fair companion were bound for the Tigridian coast, and thither she directed her steps. At midday, she entered a sunny field, where the reapers were busy at work, and women were binding sheaves. There she sate below the shady fence to rest, and saw a little boy collecting corn poppies, which the sickle had cut down, while his sister was busy in gathering the scattered ears. "'Idle child!' cried the laden girl. "'What hast thou gleaned, I pray? Will those gaudy flowers make bread?' Bread for bees, replied the urchin. If thou art a busy bee, thou canst make bread of flowers. So saying, with a laugh, he flung his posy at the chider's face, and a shower of the profitless blossoms fell down into her armful of corn. Arzine thought of her own playful Hermelian and young Arimel, who loved to forestall womanhood, and step into her mother's place, till the golden crop and the bending groups swam through her tears, and starting from her seat, she resolved forthwith to seek no more for him who scorned her anxious love, but return to her other children. In this mind, she turned her face from the village, whither she had intended to proceed, and, having partaken of the reaper's fare, which they charitably offered, she travelled on in another direction till the day was far spent. Then, sitting down again to rest, she heard the wind sigh dolefully and saw the black shadow of a tree on a smooth green slope wave slowly up and down. Arzin was thinking with deep sorrow of her truant son, and now she seemed to hear his voice and to see his image reproaching her change of purpose. She arose, and again resolved to seek along the coast for Caradan. Scarce hoping to reach the sea that night, she journeyed, however, towards it, till she entered a field that was bathed in the clear melancholy sunshine, and contained a clump of dark home oaks, about which a rivulet was wound, like a silver chain. Just across that brook, a shepherdess was sitting, while her flocks nibbled the green grass on its margin. Arzine would scarce have seen her among the trees, but the notes of her song, while the words were inaudible, came across the field to her ear, and she went up to the place where the maiden sate, with the intention of begging a shelter for that night. "'Go on with thy sweet song,' said Arzine courteously, when the damsel rose at her approach. I will sit beside thee on this fallen log. The shepherdess renewed her melody, and these were the words of her song. Full oft before some gorgeous vein, the youngling heifer bleeds and dies, her lifeblood issuing forth amain, while wreaths of incense climb the skies. 
the mother wanders all around. Through shadowy grove and lightsome glade, her footmarks on the yielding ground will prove what anxious quest she made. The stall where late her darling lay, she visits oft with eager look, in restless movements wastes the day, and fills with cries each neighboring nook. She roams along the willowy copse, where purest waters softly gleam, but ne'er a leaf or blade she crops, nor couches by the gliding stream. No youthful kind, though fresh and fair, her vainly searching eyes engage, no pleasant fields relieve her care, no murmuring streams her grief assuage. The words of this song struck painfully on the sad mother's heart. Her face was bathed in tears, and while she drooped forward, absorbed in bitter thought, the light-hearted shepherdess gathered her flock and went away. After a while, Arzine remembered that she had not where to take her rest that night, and strove to overtake the damsel, but having followed her for some time, she became exhausted, and laid her down to sleep in a waste field. The sun had just risen, and turned the dewdrops around Arzine's bed into diamonds, when Caradan entered the field where his mother slept. From the top of a lofty mullein, a goldfinch piped beside her, and soon his new-fledged offspring, led by their other parent, alighted on tall plants around, buoyantly swaying back and forward as they pecked the winged seeds. Arzine saw not the gleeful group. In dreams, she had wandered back to her own deserted little ones, and knew not that he for whose sake she had left them was weeping over her. While the youth still gazed on his mother's face, Irene came beside him. He started and would have drawn her away. Come, he said in a low voice. Our path lies yonder. I bade thee wait till I had explored this field. But Irene had recognized the features of her who slept, and wondering much at the behavior of Caradan. Wilt thou leave thy mother alone in this strange land? she said. Anguish was depicted on his face, but he answered firmly. We must leave Arzine, or thou mayest forego all hope of beholding Anthemina. She came in search of thee from her distant home, said the maid. Wilt thou not stay till she wakes, and tell her thy purpose? Then it would never be effected, Caradan replied. Take thy choice, return with Arzine, or seek Anthemina. Irene looked at the youth's countenance of woe, and guessed that if the mother beheld her son, she would never suffer him to pursue his journey. With a sorrowful heart, she quitted the field, accompanied Caradan to the seashore, and there remained in a fisherman's hut while he went in quest of a vessel. But Irene knew only that she was to await the youth's return, for so strict a silence had he kept, and enjoined on her, concerning their errand, that she knew not whether her mother's abode were to be approached by sea or land. After some hours he returned, placed her on the mule, and, holding the reins, led it by rugged paths over a ridge of rocks, from the top of which Irene beheld a skiff anchored in a little bay. Still carefully guiding the mule, Caradan descended, and soon he had entered the vessel with his companion. "'Does the wind blow favorably?' inquired the maid, as she helped him to unfurl the sails." She heard not the reply, but a gurgling sound of laughter issued from under the waves, circling all round the vessel, and prolonged by a succession of fainter and fainter echoes. As a pebble thrown by a dexterous hand repeatedly touches the water, then sinks out of sight, even so the sounds were many times renewed, till they died into silence. Irene looked aghast, 
but heard no comment on that ill-boding mirth from her companion whose countenance did not regain its gloomy composure ere the skiff had cleared the bay. Smoothly then it sailed, till land was again in sight, and Irene's countenance glowed, while that of Caradan became livid as a corpse. On a sudden, however, an impetuous gale arose, and drove back the vessel from the point toward which the melancholy helmsman was steering. Having impelled it far into mid-ocean, the wind relented, but rose again as often as the skiff approached the shore. Caradan knew what power was frustrating his efforts, and in a presentiment of this delay, had stored the ship with provisions. The damsel prayed that the elemental strife might cease, but Caradan would have rejoiced could this state of things have lasted for ever. Meantime, Arzine tarried in the creek whence her son had sailed, vainly expecting his return. Scarce had the youth and maiden left the field where she lay, then the deserted mother awoke and saw Fadeline weeping by her side. Why weepest thou, fair one? Arzine cried. Shall I never again behold his face? Thou shalt behold his face again, the mild spirit answered. But still the tears were chuckling from her soft blue eyes upon the flowery sod. Where shall I find him? exclaimed Arzine. Fadeline replied, Not far from hence there is a narrow bay, encircled by rocks, where a hermit dwells nigh the seashore. There, after some days, thou shalt behold thy son. When that time comes, I will again be with thee, and will bring my choicest gifts to preserve him from all future harm. The spirit vanished, and Arzine, going to the seashore, learned from an old man who dwelt in a cave of the rock that a youth and damsel had lately sailed from the narrow bay in a skiff brought from another part of the coast. Confiding in Vedeline's assurance, she took up her abode with the hermit, and from morn till eve continued to watch the restless ocean, oft reverting in thought to this strain, which had been sung in happier days amid the blooming bowers of Polyanthida. See yon blithe child that dances in our sight, can gloomy shadows fall from one so bright? Fond mother, whence these fears? While buoyantly he rushes o'er the lawn, dream not of clouds to strain his manhood's dawn, nor dim that sight with tears. No cloud he spies in brightly glowing hours, but feels as if the newly vested bowers for him could never fade. Too well we know that vernal pleasures fleet, but having him so gladsome, fair and sweet, our loss is overpaid. Amid the balmiest flowers that earth can give, some bitter drops distill, and all that live a mingled portion share. But while he learns these truths which we lament, such fortitude as ours will sure be sent such solace to his care. End of Part 4 Chapter 2Part 4, Chapter 3 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 3 The Allied forces are equipped with armor in the heart of the volcanic mountain. While Phantasmion was conducting his forces through Tigridia, Maldoril sate in her ancient tower full of angry thoughts. After the murder of Dorimont's queen, as she traversed Gemmaura in her chariot, she had fallen into the power of the earth spirit. But Valhorga, who hated Dorimont, released the witch that she might accomplish her projects against him. At the same time, he gave her two dwarfs, endowed with wondrous powers, intending, on a future occasion, to fetch both her and them into slavery. 
Maldaril dispatched an emissary to Palmland, who planted so many sweet but baleful herbs in Dorimont's domain, that the honey of the bees was infected with it, and the king, regaling himself thereon, was poisoned. But Phantasmion was now beyond the reach of her vengeful arm, while Zalneth and Lukoya, whom she once hoped to enslave, had both escaped her snares. Swardo crouched at the queen's feet, grinning maliciously as he viewed her knitted brows, for he knew that Valhorga had espoused the cause of Zalia's son, and that soon he should return to serve his ancient master. That evening, Maldaril went forth to visit the ancient castle where Phantasmion last beheld Olula. Gloomy thoughts possessed her soul as she ascended the tower whence her husband and her son, by Glendreth's command, had been cast upon the flagstones below. There she stood, while the twilight was deepening into darkness, and saw the ghosts of Helmio and Silvalad fluttering about the parapet and beckoning with earnest gesticulations, as if they invited her to throw herself down. She watched them till her head grew dizzy, and she almost felt tempted to obey the summons. Their motions were like those of swallows, teaching their young to fly. One after another, each gleaming ghost would perch on the battlements, a little way off, look eagerly towards her, then plunge into the court beneath. As they flitted away in a curving line, both swept by Maldaril, looked in her face reproachfully, and pointed to the horizon, just as the moon emerging from clouds cast a clearer light upon the landscape and enable her to descry an army encamped upon the plain. Then back she hied to her house upon the hill and commanded Swartho to raise pictures on the wall and show her what was coming. He obeyed, but when she looked to have seen chariots and horses and men in armor, mockery flames quivered around and she stood in the midst of a seeming furnace. Maldaril shrieked and, rushing forth, beheld the mountain crested with fire. Twice did a pyramid of flame burst forth from a lofty eminence above the mansion. Twice it sank back, as if sucked in by a mighty force. The third time it remained a steady blaze, which made the moon and stars appear to shine in vain. As fast as her tottering limbs could carry her, she descended the skirt of the hill and would have made her way through a plantation of firs and pines, but started when suddenly she beheld all the trees before her glowing with fire, the trunks and branches, and every needle leaf appearing red hot. Meantime, with a crash like thunder, the ancient mansion was leveled with the ground. Torrents of fire gushed down the ravines above, and Maldaril saw that she must soon be overtaken by the flames. Again she looked at the plantation of firs, thinking to rush through the midst of it, but in front of that fiery grove stood the towering form of Falhorga, whose wild locks and rugged cheeks looked awful in the glare of the conflagration. Fear not the flames, small Daryl, he said with a grim smile. Thou shalt ply thy burning tasks unhurt. So saying, he touched her with his iron mace. When she became fireproof, and seeing that she was now condemned to endless toil in the bowels of the earth, she repented, not having thrown herself down from the tower, that her spirit might wander at large with the ghosts of Helmio and Silvalad. She followed Valhorga through the glowing pine grove, and at the other end of it beheld the army, which she had seen at a distance approaching the volcano, while Phantasmion, radiant with diamonds, led them on. They had described the conflagration, and believing it to be a signal from Valhorga, resumed their march at midnight, and this was not the only host which the light of those flames had attracted. From the woods of Nemorosa came Eulander, conducting his troops of tiger hunters, clad in shaggy skins and armed with bows, arrows, and javelins. 
Valhorga waved his hand, and the flames, which looked like a billowy sea, now rolled away, curling upwards to the top of the mountain, and there forming a fiery coronal. By the light of that blaze, Phantasmion beheld a vaulted passage, occupying the place where Maldoril's mansion had stood. He beckoned to Phantasmion, and as the youth followed him through the avenue, which received light from within, he heard a chaos of sounds, and soon entered a vast cavern hollowed out in the heart of the mountain. At the farther end was a huge hill of fire, whence smoke and flame rose up through a chimney that formed the crater of the volcano. Innumerable swarthy laborers were ranged in this vast smithy, row within row. One company softened the blocks of metal, then quenched them in the vessels of water, another fashioned them on the anvil. Every process in the formation of armor was going on, and everything used in war was made in this workshop. The roaring of the flames and bellows, the hissing of the metal when plunged in water, the clattering and jingling of hammer and anvil produced a din which almost deafened the ears of Phantasmion. Maldoril took her place among the toiling crew and helped to make the shield which was afterwards worn by the son of Torimont. As fast as the suits were made ready, the bands of warriors entered to fit them on, and ere the morning dawned, they were all equipped except Yulander, for he had espied Maldoril, and she followed her master into the cavern, and, guessing that her time of punishment was come, felt loath to witness it. The whole throng of artificers had withdrawn to the haunts, whence the earth spirit had summoned them, and Phantasmion was the only warrior that remained in the mighty dome. At one end of the cavern, Valhorga leaned against a rock, resembling the gigantic effigies which some nations carve in the sides of mountains. "'Why does Yulander tarry?' cried the king of Palmland as he looked at the shield of one last suit which Maldoril was polishing. Hi. Why does Yulander tarry? repeated Valhorga with a stern voice. Tell him that his armor is finished, and that he must fetch it ere it be too late. But now the Nemorosan chief appeared entering the cavern, and soon began to doff the tiger's hide which he wore on his shoulders. The ancient queen arose when she saw her kinsman, and laying hold of his garment besought him for his father's sake to procure a mitigation of her doom. Then Phantasmion at Yulander's entreaty besought Valhorga that Maldoril might be permitted to die and join the shades of Helmio and Silvalad. The earth spirit smiled carelessly and answered, Be it as thou wilt. Maldoril, having heard these words, sprang into the midst of the blazing fire when the flames rose up around her and she looked like an image of bronze which they blackened but vainly attempted to destroy. Valhorga touched her with his mace, then down she sank upon her fiery bed and was consumed in an instant. While they yet gazed on the flames, the warriors heard a strange, unnatural sound that seemed to express pain or grief, and, looking about, they espied Swartho in a corner of the cavern, his bright eyes gleaming like jewels set in rusty iron. Though sorely oppressed by the heat, he had lingered behind all the other slaves to see what would be done with Maldoril, and was grieved to the heart that she should escape the insults by which he had hoped to repay her former tyranny. Yulander, recollecting his treatment of Lukoya, was about to pierce the livid breast of the dwarf with the spear he had just received. But Phantasmion, laying hold of his arm, bade him beware how he touched a servant of Valhorga, whose mighty form was yet visible in a recess of the cavern. Then the two chiefs issued forth into the daylight, and beheld the united armies ranged upon the plain, their burnished armor shining coldly in the light of the newly risen sun. 
End of Part 4 Chapter 3Part 4, Chapter 4 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 4 Irene finds her mother in the sequestered peninsula. While Phantasmion and his allies were conducting their armed force to Rockland, driving along with them troops of sheep and kine formerly plundered from the land of palms, and followed at a distance by a train of wolves and tigers, which seemed ready to brave any danger for the sake of obtaining a share in the booty. Caradan still contended with the impetuous gale. At length it sank and was no more renewed. The voyagers gained the coast, and silence reigned on sea and land, while the dark youth placed Irene on the beach. He told her how she was to find the dwelling of Anthemina, and tears streamed from the maiden's eyes when he declared that she must seek it alone. Farewell, cried Caradan passionately, a ray of joy at sight of those tears brightening his sad face. More than betrothed thou canst not be to any one but him who owns this charmed vessel, and thou hast been betrothed to me. Alas, that wreath upon thy brow. When next we meet, may it be there no longer. Then thou wilt know that I have ventured for thy sake, as he who gave that pledge will never dare to do. Sorrowful indeed was the parting of Irene and Caradan, while each had a heart full of the gloomiest forebodings. But little did either suspect what worse calamity awaited the other. Caradan stood at the vessel's prow and watched the maiden hurrying with tremulous feet along the rocky coast. Again and again she turned to wave her hand and beheld him still keeping his station. At last, she disappeared and her garment, fluttering behind her, vanished out of sight. Then Caradan fastened the pitcher securely to his body, steered away his skiff into the deep water, and looking to the sky beheld, just dawning into view, a winged form which, since he first beheld it, had a thousand times been present to his nightly slumbers. He waited not to see the dreaded shape more fully revealed, but plunged into the waves and perished, the charmed vessel remaining still bound to a heart which fear and love could agitate no longer. Unconscious of his miserable fate, Irene pursued her way to Anthemina's abode. No living creature met her eye as she hastened on amid sickly herbage or blighted bushes, and the sky wore a leaden hue even more melancholy than that of the plain. Once she looked up and beheld a flight of swallows which soon descended like a shower of dappled stones and lay dead on the ground before her. The farther she advanced, the more pining and desolate the face of nature appeared. Beyond the cliffs of the shore, she journeyed over a perfectly level plain, and after a time the turrets of a solitary dwelling came within view amid the tops of spiral cypresses. Just such a landscape Irene had beheld in mournful dreams, and she hurried on, hoping by quick motion to escape the sad feelings which the scene reawakened. After passing a collection of low mounds like graves, she gained the cypress wood, and advancing through it, soon found herself in front of that mansion which she had seen at a distance. The door stood open, and Irene entered, but no one greeted her at the threshold. She traversed many empty apartments, all such as would have befitted a palace. They were decorated with black marble and costly hangings, but the colors of the drapery had fled, while the ornaments and utensils around were tarnished and rusty. She visited a small chamber, 
which contained a bed, hoping to find some tokens of living inhabitants. The bed was occupied, the body of an old man being laid out there, and branches of cypress mixed with yew arranged over the head of the corpse. This solemn sight assured Irene that someone yet survived in the house or its neighborhood. She retraced her steps, quitted the mansion, and having crossed the grove that extended behind it, descried two figures standing beside a boundless sheet of sluggish, lurid water. On she went and beheld a stately lady, all hung over with the blue garlands of star-shaped blossoms, her long black tresses floating wide, and her head and neck adorned with strings of pearl. An aged woman who held a basket seemed to be contending with her, while she persisted in throwing cakes of bread afar into the marsh with an air of sullen fierceness. Her companion, having tried in vain to stop her hand, let fall the empty basket and crossed her arms in all the tranquility of settled despair. On Irene's approach, the woman in humble apparel turned about and looked at her in astonishment, but the majestic lady continued to gaze upon the march. The maiden felt unable to speak, but, perusing her face with deep anxiety, felt assured that she beheld her mother. The outline of her form and features was grandly beautiful, but her cheeks were white as wax, her blue eyes spectrally bright, and her delicate arms and fingers wasted to the bone. There was something wild and ghastly in her countenance, and strangely, it was contrasted with that of her companion, who seemed benumbed by misery but not bewildered. Who art thou? said the feeble creature. And why hast thou come hither to see us perish, and to perish thyself when we are gone? Art thou not Dorna, my mother's nurse? replied the damsel. And is not this Anthemina, the wife of Albinian? Woe is me, thou sayest true, replied the aged woman, and surely thou art the sweet Irene, whom this wretched lady left in the palace of Rockland, when she quitted it never to return. All this time Anthemina remained with her eyes fixed upon the stagnant water, speechless and motionless. The damsel related who she was, and how she had come to that coast, tenderly addressing her mother, but obtaining not a word, nor even a single glance in return, till at last she took her hand and implored her to break this fearful silence. Then she, who was so gaily bedecked, looked up, and beholding the wreath of jeweled flowers, gazed at it with astonished countenance. Zalia, she cried at length, her eyes kindling with frenzy, art thou come instead of Dorimont? Then, with a wild shriek, she snatched the chaplet from the maiden's brow and trampled it under her feet. Heart-stricken and overpowered, Irene sank upon the ground at the feet of the once gentle and captivating Anthemina. She had found her mother, but alas, in what state? Here was the goodly fabric, to outward view still perfect. All the wondrous materials were yet in being, but the springs within had failed, and the whole was a wreck. We are starving, Dorna cried. No fresh provisions have been sent for us for many months, and our last remnant of food now lies in yonder marsh. Alas, my mistress feels no trouble concerning things like these. Sorrow and the noxious vapors of this pool have turned her brain, and daily she decks herself, as when she first came hither, still expecting to be visited by Dorimond, king of Pomland. How came she hither? Irene exclaimed. By the arts of Glandreth. Dorna answered, A storm, 
drove our vessel to this desolate coast. But that storm was raised by Glendreth's power. In those days, the wicked chief was enamored of my mistress, and I doubt not beguiled her with feigned tales, saying that Queen Zalia was near her end, and that when she died, Dorimont would carry her into Palmland. So she trusted herself with him, and never consenting to become his wife has remained his wretched captive. I will tell thee more while we repair to the beach. Let us go in haste, lest thy conductor should sail away. He bade me return to my own country by land, replied the maiden, saying that this peninsula could scarce be a day's journey from the chief palace of Rockland. If he is gone, we must all perish, Dorna replied. There is no passage hence by land. The place is separated from Rockland and Tigridia by this vast marsh. The exhalations whereof are so baleful that any birds which attempt to wing their way high in the air above it are sure to perish. All our household have died, one after another, of lingering maladies. The last survivor expired yesterday, and strength will fail me, I fear, to dig his grave. During this discourse, Anthemina sate upon the ground, weaving a fresh garland, and sometimes raising her head to cast sullen glances at the unhappy maid. Dorna hied away to the seashore, hoping yet to hail Caradan's vessel, while Irene stood beside her mother, absorbed in silent grief. End of Part 4 Chapter 4Part 4, Chapter 5 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 5 Phantasmion and his allies join battle with Glendreth in the valley of the Black Lake. Struck with consternation at sight of the united army, the people of Rockland had offered no resistance, but had forthwith dispatched messengers to Glendreth, and while Phantasmion was gazing on the island where Irene used to dwell, it was announced that the conqueror was about to enter the valley of the Black Lake with his victorious forces. Soon afterwards, the foremost bands of the enemy were descried at a distance, and were hailed by the men of Palmland with this chant. Their armor is flashing and ringing and clashing, their looks are wild and savage. With deeds of night they have darkened the light, they are come from reckless ravage. O bountiful earth, with famine and dearth, with plague and fires around them, thy womb they have torn with impious scorn. Let its tremblings now confound them, our cause maintain, for as dew to the plain, or wind to the slumbering sea, or sunny sheen to woodlands green, so dear have we been to thee. To newborn flowers, from thy fairest bowers, their rifling hands have taken, and the tree's last crop, that was ready to drop, from the boughs have rudely shaken, through deep green dells, where the bright stream wells, like a diamond with emerald blending. Through sheltered vales, where the light wind sails, high cedars scarcely bending. Through lawn and grove, where the wild deer rove, they have rushed like a burning flood. For morning's beam, or the starry gleam, came fire and sword and blood. Then... 
Lend us thy might, great earth for the fight, O oh, help us to quell their pride. Make our sinews and bones as firm as the stones and metals that gird thy side. May the smoldering mountains and fiery fountains inflame our vengeful ire, and beasts that lurk in thy forests murk their tameless rage inspire. While from caves of death let a sluggish breath o'er the spoiler's spirits creep, O oh, send to their veins the chill that reigns in thy channels dark and deep. But if those we abhor must triumph in war, let us sink to thy inmost center, where the trump's loud sound, nor the tramp and the bound, nor the conqueror's shout can enter. Let mountainous rocks, by earthquake shocks, high o'er our bones be lifted, and piles of snow, where we sleep below, to the plains above be drifted, if the murderous band must dwell in the land, and the fields we loved to cherish from the land of balm, let cedar and palm with those that reared them perish. Pantasmion knew so well how the land lay in this mountain region that Penzelimer desired him to take the lead in all orders and dispositions of war. He had already shown the herdsmen how they might drive their bleating and lowing troops across the hills into Palmland, and he now joyfully proceeded to marshal the allied armies and conduct them to the most advantageous post. Flanked by the lake and its steep banks on one side, and on the other by a woody brow, they were soon drawn out in order of battle. The long winding files were quickly transformed to squares, clothing every inch of green turf and purple heather with brass and steel as fast as a painter's brush invests a panel with new colors. The ground covered by the front line rose gradually at either end, toward the lake and toward the mountain, so that the troops were ranged in form of a semicircle. The center of the van was occupied by Phantasmion, with his light Gemmarian cavalry, whose helmets were surmounted with carbuncles representing ruddy flames, but the young monarch's own crest was of diamonds, and displayed the figure of a damsel holding a pitcher. The Nemorosan spearmen were placed on either wing, Yolander commanding the division flanked by the hill. His foresters wore casks, crested with the grim visage of a gaping tiger. The king of Almaterra divided his large force into two squadrons, taking charge himself of that which held the middle ground, while Del Morin, son of Sanio, commanded the rear. Some companies of archers wearing stag's horns on their helmets were posted by Phantasmion among fir trees on the slope of the hill where fan-shaped branches, growing close to the ground, kept them in ambush, though now and then their sylvan crests peeped out amid the leaves. Meantime, Glandreth was rapidly advancing and filling the plain opposite to that narrower space which Phantasmion's front line occupied and which looked like the contracted girth of the valley. His force appeared innumerable and had been swollen by accessions from Palmland together with certain well-ordered battalions brought by traitorous Magnart, whom the mighty promises and mysterious hints of Glandreth had persuaded to strengthen the strong cause and desert that of Albinet. The chief now sate beside his brother in a stately car which preceded the army and listened to his talk with deep attention, Glandreth pointed to the sky, and Manyard seemed more bent on watching the appearances there than on surveying the ground in the enemy's array of battle. The aspect of that well accoutred host, reflecting a bright sun from burnished armor, was indeed an unwelcome surprise to the mighty general, and though his own was still more numerous, he could not hope to surround and overpower his opponents with multitudes of horse, by reason of their having secured so advantageous a position. Nevertheless, Glandreth was free from even a shadow of dread, and beheld the furious onset of his foes, when the battle began without concern, for it was not in sword or buckler, nor in stout hands and hearts, that he reposed his trust. He had summoned other powers to his aid and the dark, massy cloud which followed his course 
or paused with him right over his head, while the cope of heaven around was crystal clear, assured him of victory. Phantasmion saw that cloud and his heart was troubled. Seen indeed, it must needs have been by every one present, but he of all the assembled multitude surmised that it was aught more than a collection of vapors. He alone imagined that it contained such an ally of Glandreth as no mortal power might withstand. Perplexing conjectures engrossed his mind. He thought of Olula's doubtful conduct at former junctures. He strove to think that she was no real enemy to his cause. He believed that Antemina's dying day was long since past. Yet why did that black cloud continue to hover above the head of Glandreth, and what did it portend? While the other chiefs, animated with the most confident hopes, were performing feats of valor, Phantasmion's brow was overcast, and for a little while, the buoyancy and ardor of his temperament appeared to have forsaken him. Soon, however, the young monarch roused himself from anxious speculation and led on the troops with all his wonted energy. Phantasmion eagerly desired to encounter Glandreth, but lo, the chieftain, conspicuous by his long white plume and lofty stature, resigns the command to Magnard, who leads the vanguard, and retiring from the fight, ascends a bare rock just apart from the conflict, whence he obtains a full view of the hills above and of the plain beneath. Triumphantly, from that eminence he casts his eyes around, having reason to believe that, in a few moments, every object he beheld would be absolutely subjected to his power. Below where he stood were the contending armies, the flashing of armor, the tramp of horses, the clang of sword and shield. On the green hillside he observed the numerous sheep and herds which now belonged to his adversaries. With scarce perceptible motion, they were stealing onward, while ever and anon their conductors turned about to look upon the field of combat. Part of the flocks had already disappeared, having wound their way into a rocky gorge, while the rest were following. Glandreth's heart swelled with scornful exultation as he looked upon them. Now, thought he, ere those flocks are out of sight, the plunderers shall have felt my power. At one stroke, I will change the scene, and my enemies shall be crushed forever. At this moment, success appeared, inclining toward the less numerous army. Magnard had fallen by the hand of Phantasmion, and his body was trampled underfoot by the throng. Penzelimer, with his heavy-armed troops, powerfully supported the Jamarian cavalry, and the archers placed behind the fir trees, like a herd of armed deer, came rushing down to attack the enemy in flank. Glandreth beheld Phantasmion, after he had given Magnard his death blow, pressing onwards and striving to win his way to the place where he stood. Then he lifted up his glittering blade and shouted, Come on, Phantasmion! The rocks were still resounding that cry when a far different echo came from the cloud over his head. Phantasmion! Phantasmion! Come on, Phantasmion! was uttered from above in a tone more shrill and piercing than that of the chieftain, more like the sound of the wind than that of any human voice. It prevailed over the din of battle. Every ear heard it, every eye was fixed on the black mass, and every weapon was suspended. But the dense pitchy cloud remained unchanged and motionless, and had a preternatural appearance alone in the pure blue sky. Phantasmion gazed at it, as he listened with awe, but not with terror, to that aerial challenge. An eye of intense light now became visible in the center of the darkness. It grew and spread, till he seemed for a moment to perceive the indistinct lineaments of a dazzling face. And, at the same time, a hand glanced forth and beckoned him. Feelings akin to frenzy possessed the young warrior at that sight. He resolved to know his fate, 
and not to die without having essayed at least to punish the iniquitous aggressor. He spurred his horse and began to drive right onward through the ranks, which made way before him. Then once more Glandreth raised his sword and pointed to Phantasmion, while he cast up his face to the sky and called upon Olula. The call was heard. A gush of lightning burst from the cloud, quivered adown the uplifted blade, and clothed as with a robe of fire the mailed body of Glandreth. A moment he stood enveloped in flames, the blasted corpse then trembled from the rock, and just as Phantasmion arrived, rolled down at the feet of his courser. No noisy peal followed this vengeful lightning, no cry was uttered at the fall of Glandreth. Silence was in the sky, amid the mountains, and on the motionless lake, and the armed multitudes, lately engaged in the turmoil of conflict, were still as the stones and rocks. Arrow-shaped particles of innocuous flame were diffused around. Each combatant beheld them gliding over the polished helm and breastplate of his neighbor, and all fell, terror-stricken, with their faces to the earth. Phantasmion alone was exempted from the blinding glare, silent yet calm. He sate on his unmoving steed, which hung his head, and, like all living things around, seemed stupefied with amazement. Unappalled he sate, his head thrown back, to gaze on the dark cloud, which slowly ascended and gradually brightened, as if some luminous body within were eating away its coal-black shroud. That shroud became thinner and thinner, revealing more and more of a winged form, till at last, when it was perfectly transparent, the floating locks and outspread pinions of Olula, ere she disappeared in the upper sky, were dimly visible. End of Part 4 Chapter 5《Part Four, Chapter Six of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four, Chapter Six. Anthemina dies in the presence of Irene and Phantasmion. Phantasmion was still gazing upward when he discerned in the sky that angelic vision which first made him long to soar aloft. At the same time, a well-known voice whispered in his ear, Come and find Irene. Then, he felt himself enabled to quit the earth, and, rising buoyantly into the air, pursued Irene's image over hill and dale. But when at last the apparition melted away, he saw his guardian fairy flitting on before him, Swiftly they traversed the land of rocks, past the diamantine palace, and flew above the waves, till they descried an empty vessel drifting about at random. Phantasmion followed Potentilla when she entered the skiff, and no sooner had they alighted on the deck than the pinions of both disappeared, and the fairy sitting at the helm appeared like some ancient pilot. In this boat she said. Caradan conducted Irene to the place of her mother's exile. In this boat, thou shalt bear Irene away, but death alone can release Anthemina. The fairy then disclosed that Olula's power had long forced her to conceal how Albinian's first queen had been tempted by Glandreth, how she came to the lost land which was cut off from the neighbor countries by an impassable marsh, and shunned by seafarers on account of fearful traditions and predictions connected with its name. On that dreary coast she roamed, continued Potentilla, till at length every cloud which hung about the sun's globe and steeped its fleece in splendor seemed growing into the likeness of Dorimont. Every changeful mist that rose from the wave seemed about to take his form. Thus she fared, till not a vestige of her former being remained, 
but that one miserable dream. Glendreth meant to have sailed with fresh provisions the day after the battle, but Anthemina, in frenzy, had cast the scanty remnant into the water, and by hastening the day of her death released Olula from a vow long repented of. Thus was she enabled to punish the wickedness of Glendreth, and thus hath his cruelty recoiled on his own head. But Caradan, inquired the youth, while the skiff went forward with a favorable breeze, how knew he where to find Irene's mother? Caradan, she replied, was visiting his fair young cousin in the land of rocks when Glandreth laid his plan for carrying off the queen. By way of a childish frolic, he hid himself in the lower part of the ship and remained unseen by the chieftain till he was about to sail away from the peninsula. Then coming forward, he fearfully exclaimed, Where is the queen? Oh, where is all the crew? Thou wilt not leave them on this barren coast. While he spoke thus, Olula made herself manifest in thunder and lightning. His young spirit was filled with terror, and he took solemn oaths never to reveal Anthemina's abode. The day that anyone through thee finds this peninsula, said Glendreth, that day will be the last of thy life. Caradan knew not that at the very hour when he brought Irene thither, Olula was released from her vow to Glendreth, and free to serve him whom she had ever loved, since first she saw him on the mountain's top. And the silver pitcher, exclaimed Phantasmion, that was stolen from the hapless queen by Sishelma, replied the fairy, and afterwards transferred to Caradan, who knew that Irene's fate depended on it, and was beguiled by the water which to hope that she might in the end be his. But oh, where is it now? the youth eagerly demanded. Potentilla replied not, but pointed to the coast of the peninsula where Dorna was joyfully hailing the vessel. Phantasmion gained the shore, and, guided by the aged woman, crossed the bleak waste to which his betrothed maiden had lately traversed. Then, hurrying through the cypress grove, he came in sight of the marsh, just as the sun was throwing a red gleam over that livid pool in which, on the far horizon, he seemed ready to sink and quench his flaming tiara. When he had passed the wood, Phantasmion stopped and beheld Irene kneeling beside her mother, who lay on the margin of the lake and seemed nigh unto death. Now that life was waning, her senses had fully returned. She had recognized her sweet Irene, and they had wept together. Could such tears have rained upon her blighted cheek before they might have kept away a fatal malady. Dear child, she said, thou wast a glimpse of soft blue sky between the clouds of my tempestuous life. Now that it beams forth once again, my day is closed. Just as Anthemina had spoken thus, and had begun to lament over the wretched past to which Irene was brought, she heard approaching footsteps, and casting up her death-stricken eyes, beheld Phantasmion. Dorimont, she faintly exclaimed, and Irene, clasping her hands, cried, Yes, the son of Dorimont, Phantasmion, he is come to save and to protect us. Then, while the youth kneeled by her side and told his tale, Anthemina saw how she had been deceived by the watery vision, and whom the figures there portrayed did truly represent. She was glad to depart herself, and thankful to find that her child was destined for happiness, which had ever been a mere vision to her. But the silver pitcher given me by the guardian spirit of our race, that is still wanting. So thought Anthemina when she joined the hands of the youthful pair and blessed their union. The mists of death 
had now begun to darken her eyes, but ere they were closed forever she caught a glimpse of the charmed vessel, gleaming amid the cypress trees, and just discerned a train of aerial figures which had glided thither from the sea, and were now pausing in silence amid the shadows of the grove. Her head then sank upon its earthy pillow, and, with a smile on her countenance, the mother of Irene expired. The maiden closed her eyes, kissed her wan cheeks, and sank in a swoon upon her bosom. Phantasmion goes to raise her in his arms, but pauses on seeing another mourner come to weep for Antimina. It is Fedeline, the spirit of the flowers. Softly she rises from amid the lilies of the pool, her head wrapped in a hood, white as those lovely blossoms, while the ends of her shiny green mantle float away on either side of her bending form and rest upon the surface of the water. And now she droops in sorrow over Anthemina and the fainting maid. Tears drop from her fair eyes on the faces of both, and her yellow locks, light as gossamer, fall down and mingle with the dark tresses of Anthemina. At length she raised her head, and, throwing back the snowy hood which had concealed her face, disclosed her bloomy cheeks and golden tendrils to Phantasmion. Fadeline pointed to the silver pitcher, then to Irene, and softly smiling whispered, She is thine! Hues of life were dawning on the maiden's cheek, while Fadeline retired among the white and azure blossoms. She veiled her head and bowed it on the surface of the pool, as a water lily closes her cup and lowers her flexile stem when the sun is on his downward path. In a few moments, none but the heads of the lilies glimmered on the darkening waters of the marsh. As Fadeline disappeared, Irene rose from the earth, supported in the arms of Phantasmion, and then the train of sea nymphs, with feet glancing in the twilight, fair as foam that twinkles on the crest of a billow, poured forward like a soft advancing tide. The foremost of them brought the charmed vessel and placed it in the maiden's hand. They who came last bore the corpse of Caradan. They paused among the cypresses, and Irene held up the silver pitcher to hide the tears which flooded her drooping face. But ere those tears had ceased to flow, Phantasmion received it from the willing hand of his gentle-hearted maid. The nymphs now surrounded Anthemina's body, taking the weedy coronals from their heads to scatter them on that fair corpse. Those who formed the outer circle blew melancholy notes through many a wreathed shell, attuning them to this farewell strain which their sisters chanted. Ah, where lie now those locks that lately streamed, mid gales that fanned in vain the fevered cheek? Lo, let them rest, ye winds, the heart now rests in peace. How vainly, while the tortured bosom heaved, restless as waves that lashed her sea-beat haunt, we strove to cool that cheek, which death too quickly chilled. Like wreaths of mist that some lone rock o'erhang, and seemed intent to melt the crags away, while with soft veil they hide its tempest-driven head. We hovered round thee on the lonesome beach, and sought to calm thy brow with dewy hand, thy wild and quiet eye with pitying glances met. Oh, fly with us, we whispered, from glad hearts, from mirthful bands that meet on moonlight shores. We came to watch thee pace this melancholy strand. A captive thou, an exile here confined, but fatal passion to more galling chains, to exile more unblessed, thy blinded spirit dooms. Oh, fly with us, no dangerous choice we know, Mild heavenly influence guides our gentle lives, obedient as yon tide swayed by the circling moon. Oh, fly with us, 
free, free as ocean gale, to roam at large, released from sorrow's power, ah no, far happier scenes, more blissful change be thine. Through fields of radiance let thy spirit stray, while these fair relics, shrined in ocean's depth, shall gleam like purest pearl, caressed by winds and waves. End of Part 4 Chapter 6Part 4, Chapter 7 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 7 Phantasmion and Irene are wafted to the narrow bay, whence they sail with Zelneth and Lukoya to Rockland. While the procession moved along the wood with Anthemina's body, one of the many garlands that hung about it fell to the ground, which Irene took up and fondly twined amid her own tresses. Phantasmion observed the pomegranate wreath at a little distance glittering on the borders of the marsh. He went to fetch the relic and placed it in his bosom, resolving to keep the memorial for his mother's sake. In the stillness of the air, as he stooped beside the pool, a mournful sound, like the boom of some distant bittern, came to his ear across the waters. It was the voice of Sishelma. Just as Caradan expired, the witch was about to seize on his corpse and a pitcher along with it. But Olula had descended in a whirlwind, and bearing her aloft, had plunged her in that pestiferous bog which bounded the lost land. Thence she dared not return into the sea, but ever after, continued slowly roaming from one part of the fen to the other, while her moans and wailings, heard sometimes on the side of Tigridia, sometimes toward the land of rocks, augmented the horror with which the people of those countries regarded the marsh and the peninsula beyond it. The moon was up, when Phantasmion and his fair princess gained the beach and espied Dorna sitting in the vessel with the seeming pilot. They entered it, and when they had put out into the deep, no cloudlet was ever driven along the sky by the keen winds of March more swiftly than that skiff was made to fly over the ocean plain. After a while, Phantasmion discerned before the vessel's prow a shadowy form, which seemed to be guiding it on its way. Irene saw not what he saw, for her eyes, from which the tears had scarcely ceased to flow, were now heavy with sleep, and at last she lay in slumber on Phantasmion's cloak upon the deck. Then the phantom rose up from the waves, and turning about revealed to him that still watched the face of Zalia. While she murmured blessings on his head, he pointed to the sleeping maid. Oh, bless her too, he cried, who makes me blessed. The shade of Zalia bent toward Irene, but soon recoiled, gazing with a sad look on the blue lilies which now lay withering on the damsel's stainless brow. But when Phantasmion removed Anthemina's garland, and placed the jeweled wreath upon the maiden's head. Again the face of Zalia grew softly bright, and bending over Irene's tearful cheek to breathe a benison, she seemed like the moon shedding benign influence on some dewy flower. When the stars faded in heaven, Zalia too disappeared, but first she pointed to a group of figures now in sight upon the margin of the narrow bay, and sighing she said, Awake, Irene, thou hast fellow mourners. Lo, Zelneth and Lukoya, weeping for their mother, and for Caradan. With that voice sounding in her ear, Irene awoke. The shade of Zalia had vanished, but she beheld the daughters of Magnart kneeling on the beach beside two prostrate forms. Nigh them a fair shape was pouring liquid on those lifeless bodies, but when Irene approached the mourners, it disappeared. 
leaving behind a fragrant atmosphere. Fadeline had been performing the last kind office for the mother and the son. Arzine had watched and waited for Caradan in the bay till those same sea nymphs who bore his pale corpse to the peninsula transported it thence to her feet. Then, falling senseless over it, she was drowned by the advancing tide. The same vessel in which the son of Magnart sailed from these shores received his embalmed body with that of his mother. Irene, Zelneth, and Lukoya, closely united in sorrow, entered the skiff with Phantasmion and were driven by steady gales to the rockland coast not far from the Diamanthine Palace. Leaving the fellow mourners at the royal abode, Phantasmion rejoined his kingly allies at the capital city of Rockland and learned that Glandreth's army had submitted to their united forces without striking another blow, so that the whole country was subdued. Albinet, with his mother, Maldra, had disappeared, for no sooner was the fatal end of Glandreth generally known than the principal men of Rockland had revolted against the widowed queen, declaring that they would neither endure her sway nor that of her sickly child. To escape their hands, she had fled with young Albinet. No one knew whither, and the chiefs placed their crown at the disposal of the allied monarchs, signifying a desire that he who should espouse the daughter of Albinian might reign over them. Phantasmion was not eager to embrace this proposal, but caused diligent search to be made for Irene's brother, whose rights he resolved to uphold. At this time it was announced that mines of iron as well as copper had been discovered in Gemmaura and in part of Palmland adjoining that district. While Yulander was restored to his ancestral throne, the blooming Hermelian inherited Polyanthida. Meantime, Penzalimer and the Sylvan chief found their fair consorts at the Diamanthine Palace and heard how, in obedience to the voice of Fadeline, they had followed their mother to the narrow bay, where they found her corpse on the beach beside the body of Caradan. Afterwards, Lukoya made known to Yolander that the witch's cavern was destroyed on the night when the volcanic mountain filled the heavens with smoke and Selneth told her kingly spouse that the bleak waste around his castle had begun to smile with verdure, while the black cloud no longer rested on the horizon. It is reported, said she, that the dim veil has been freed from its diurnal canopy by the spirit of the blast, and that Melodine has drowned herself in a mountain pool which lies in deep shadow. Phantasmion caused the remains of Albinian to be brought from Nemorosa under the care of the fateful goat herd, and to be interred in Rockland with fitting pomp. Magnart's body could never be certified among the heaps of slain which had been defaced by the trampling throng. But the obsequies of Arzine and Caradan were solemnly performed, and splendid monuments were raised to their memory. Anthemina had no share in these funeral honors. Her relics could not be entombed beneath a solid marble pile, but the face of the deep, with its changeful hues and motions, for the mind of Irene was her mother's monument. And strains like these she dedicated to her memory. Poor is the portrait that one look portrays. It mocks the face on which we loved to gaze. A thousand past expressions all combined, the mind itself depictured by the mind. That face contains which in the heart is shrined. Yet, dearest mother, if on lasting brass thy very self to future times might pass, ill could I bear such monument to build, for future times with dearer memories filled. Ah, oh, no, thy fadeless portrait in my breast from earth shall vanish when I sink to rest. But, ere to join thee on glad wings I go, 
thy sun-like influence beaming here below in sorrow's hour when earthly hope betrays me to heaven above my hope's best aim shall raise me in hours of bliss when heaven almost seems here for thy sweet memory claim the tribute tear so yon bright orb doth tearful incense gain from glittering lake swift rill and humid plain yet dries the spray that trembled in the shower and shines reflected from each dripping flower End of Part 4, Chapter 7Part 4, Chapter 8 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 8 Irene finds her brothers in the grove where Phantasmion first saw Potentilla. When the days of mourning had expired, all the children of Magnart, with the kings who had espoused Zelneth and Lucoya, accompanied Phantasmion and his betrothed princess to Palmland, that they might be present at their nuptials. The country palace where the young monarch had always resided lay in their way, being at no great distance from the confines of Rockland, and here it was resolved that the company should sojourn while preparations were made for the wedding in the principal city. There was a strange look on earth and sky when Irene entered that regal domain, a hot sun being veiled by bluish mist. Her cheeks glowed and her breath labored with a stifled heat and with eager anticipation, for she expected shortly to behold her long-lost infant brother, Eurelio was to be lord of Gemaura, so Phantasmion had declared. But how could she rejoice over him without grieving for Albinet? And, alas, where was Albinet to be found? Or how could she discharge toward that beloved boy her promises to his father? With beating bosom she hastened onward and entered the grove where Potentilla first showed herself to Phantasmion. There she espied a child, just old enough to run alone, caressing a poor boy in tattered clothes and presenting him with fruits, toys, and fragments of cake from a basket where all were mingled together. Close by was a woman who wore a beggar's garb and seemed in woeful plight. She sat upon the ground, her head inclined against a tree, watching that fair child and his pale comrade, who ate the dainties given him by the rosy little one as if he were well nigh famished. Her looks were full of misery, but not a teardrop trickled down her ghastly cheek. Irene knew at once that the younger child was Eurelio, and flew to embrace her darling charge, twice lost and now twice found. While she held him in her arms the sickly boy wept, and catching her robe exclaimed, Oh, sister, wilt thou not speak to me? Art thou too turned against me? Startled by the sound of a well-known voice, the lady looked at him steadfastly, and saw that he was her father's heir, the poor rejected Albinet. Then she gave Eurelio to his nurse, who had come up in breathless haste, and tenderly caressed her weeping brother, shedding tears herself while she wiped the big drops which fell from his eyes. But soon his face beamed with happiness, though wan as frosted roses, and turning to the wretched woman who vainly strove to rise. Mother, he cried, our griefs are ended now. Here is Irene. Sister, didst thou find that healing well? If thou hast any of the water left, I pray thee, give it to my mother. By this time the gentle princess had recognized Madra's altered face, and kneeling beside her whispered words of consolation, declaring that she herself would be protected and Albinet restored to his rights by the generous king of Palmland. Tears now gushed in torrents from the eyes of Madra, but still she could make no reply. 
her evil counsellor, whom she had met on the seashore after the destruction of Glandreth, and frantically strove to punish, had stricken a deadly chill into her frame, and rendered her speechless. And now Phantasmion was seen holding up the charmed vessel among the boughs of the pomegranate tree, which stood a little way back within the grove. Potentilla sate in the shadow, while Fadeline, less hidden by the foliage, was pouring a fragrant liquid from her chalice into the pitcher. And just as Zelneth and Lukoya, with the rest of the company, arrived, he shed the flower spirit's balmy gift on the head of Albinet, whose body gradually changed as the precious drops trickled over it, till, by the time they reached the ground, he stood erect in blooming health and vigor, his limbs, on which the ragged garments had before hung loose, now muscular and shapely, filled them out to their full stretch. His form was upright, and his cheeks, though not so round and soft, were blooming as those of Eurelio. Modra had witnessed the change with flushed cheek and gleaming eye, but could not utter a word of joy or thankfulness. Albinet flung his arms around her neck. "'Oh, mother!' he said. Why art thou not healed of this dire malady? But Modra scarcely thought of him or that, for now again her eye was fastened on Eurelio. Irene observed that look, and blamed herself that she had so long delayed to place the lost one in his mother's arms. In haste she brought him to her side, and gently whispered, This is thy rescued babe, thy sweet Eurelio. Joy lighted up the face of the dying woman at those words. She strove to clasp the smiling child to her bosom, but, ere she reached him, her sight failed, and, sinking backwards, she expired in the arms of Albinet. A little while afterwards, Phantasmion looked down into the grove, and saw the heir of Rockland, leaning against a tree with his weeping eyes fixed upon the ground. The flower spirits gleamed beside him in the hazy light, and seemed to smile as she bent forward, like a sapling swayed by a gentle breeze, to crown his drooping brow with thornless roses. Eurelio was too young to weep the death of Modra. He thought she slumbered when silently and softly she was borne away. With Potentilla's wand, he struck a hollow trunk of sycamore and sweetly his childish laughter rang through the grove. When myriads of bees came crowding forth, and shone with all the dyes of the opal as they hung from a branch above his head, Phantasmion felt as if he had dreamed of years, not lived them. The fairy looked as old and upright as when she first appeared to him. The trees around all seemed as green and flourishing. The grove was filled with just the same soft insect murmur, and that bright swarm hung dazzling as of yore. But lo, the sun has broken through its hazy veil, and Fadeline's soft cheek, as if it faded in the brilliant light, is seen no more among the blossoms. Albinet raises his head, from which the airy chaplet melts away, and with wonder-stricken eyes, Eurelio gazes upward, for Potentilla has risen from his side. A moment yet the wings of her insect's steeds are painted against the background of one lingering cloudlet, but now they disappear, while earth below, suffused to its splendor, becomes a softened image of the heavens themselves. Phantasmion looked round in momentary dread, lest Irene should have proved a spirit, and vanished like the rest. But there she stood, her face beaming bright as ever in full sunshine. The earnest that all he remembered and all he hoped for was not to fade like a dream. End of Part 4 Chapter 8 End of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge Recording by Maricel Cui Thank you for listening.